Section 17 of Germinal by Emile Zola. Translation by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part 4. Chapter 1. On that Monday, the Ambos had invited the Gregoires and their daughter Cecile to lunch. They had formed their plans. On rising from table, Paul Negrel was to take the ladies to a mine, St. Thomas, which had been luxuriously reinstalled, but this was only an amiable pretext. This party was an invention of Madame Ambos to hasten the marriage of Cecile and Paul. Suddenly, on this very Monday, at four o'clock in the morning, the strike broke out when on the first of december the company had adopted the new wage system the miners remained calm at the end of the fortnight not one made the least protest on payday everybody from the manager down to the last overseer considered the tariff as accepted and great was their surprise in the morning at this declaration of war made with a tactical unity which seemed to indicate energetic leadership at five o'clock Dancer woke M. Rambeau to inform him that not a single man had gone down at the Voreau. The settlement of the Deux Cent Quarant, which he had passed through, was sleeping deeply, with closed windows and doors, and as soon as the manager had jumped out of bed, his eyes still swollen with sleep, he was overwhelmed. Every quarter of an hour messengers came in, and dispatches fell on his desk as thick as hail at first he hoped that the revolt was limited to the Voreux, but the news became more serious every minute there was the Miraux, the crevecour the madeleine where only the grooms had appeared the victoire and foutre cantel the two best discipline pits where the men had been reduced by a third st thomas alone numbered all its people and seemed to be outside the movement up to nine o'clock he dictated dispatches telegraphing in all directions to the prefect of lille to the directors of the company warning the authorities and asking for orders he had sent negrel to go round the neighboring pits to obtain precise information suddenly m hombeau recollected the lunch and he was about to send the coachman to tell the gregoires that the party had been put off when a certain hesitation and lack of will stopped him the man who in a few brief phrases had just made military preparations for a field of battle he went up to madame Hombeau, whose hair had just been done by her lady's maid in her dressing-room ah they are on strike she said quietly when he had told her well what has that to do with us we are not going to leave off eating i suppose and she was obstinate it was vain to tell her that the lunch would be disturbed and that the visit to st thomas could not take place she found an answer to everything why lose a lunch that was already cooking and as to visiting the pit they could give that up afterwards if the walk was really imprudent besides she added when the maid had gone out you know that i am anxious to receive these good people this marriage ought to affect you more than the follies of your men i want to have it don't contradict me he looked at her agitated by a slight trembling and the hard firm face of the man of discipline expressed the secret grief of a wounded heart she had remained with naked shoulders already over mature but still imposing and desirable with a broad bust of a series gilded by the autumn for a moment he felt a brutal desire to seize her and to roll his head between the breasts she was exposing in this warm room which exhibited the private luxury of a sensual woman and had about it an irritating perfume of musk but he recoiled for ten years they had occupied separate rooms good he said leaving her do not make any alterations m hennebeau had been born in the ardennes in his early life he had undergone the hardships of a poor boy thrown as an orphan on the paris streets after having painfully followed the courses of the ecole des mines at the age of twenty-four he had gone to the grand com as engineer to the saint barbe mine 
three years later he became divisional engineer of the pas de calais at the marle mines it was there that he married wedding by one of those strokes of fortune which are the rule among the corps de mines the daughter of the rich owner of a spinning factory at arras for fifteen years they lived in the same small provincial town and no event broke the monotony of existence not even the birth of a child an increasing irritation detached madame hennebeau who had been brought up to respect money and was disdainful of this husband who gained a small salary with such difficulty and who enabled her to gratify none of the satisfactions of vanity which she had dreamed of at school he was a man of strict honesty who never speculated but stood at his post like a soldier the lack of harmony had only increased aggravated by one of those curious misunderstandings of the flesh which freezes the most ardent he adored his wife she had the sensuality of a greedy blonde and already they slept apart ill at ease and wounded from that time she had a lover of whom he was ignorant at last he left the pas de calais to occupy a situation in an office at paris with the idea that she would be grateful to him but paris only completed their separation that paris which she had desired since her first doll and where she washed away her provincialism in a week becoming a woman of fashion at once and throwing herself into all the luxurious follies of the period the ten years which she spent there were filled by a great passion a public intrigue with a man whose desertion nearly killed her this time the husband had not been able to keep his ignorance and after some abominable scenes he resigned himself disarmed by the quiet unconscious of this woman who took her happiness where she found it it was after the rupture and when he saw that she was ill with grief that he had accepted the management of the monceau mines still hoping also that she would reform down there in that desolate black country the Ambos, since they had lived at monceau returned to the irritated boredom of their early married days at first she seemed consoled by the great quiet soothed by the flat monotony of the immense plain she buried herself in it as a woman who has done with the world she affected a dead heart so detached from life that she did not even mind growing stout then beneath this indifference a final fever declared itself the need to live once more and she deluded herself for six months by organizing and furnishing to her taste the little villa belonging to the management she said it was frightful and filled it with upholstery bric-a-brac and all sorts of artistic luxuries which were talked of as far as little now the country exasperated her those stupid fields spread out to infinity those eternal black roads without a tree swarming with a horrid population which disgusted and frightened her complaints of exile began she accused her husband of having sacrificed her to a salary of forty thousand francs a trifle which hardly sufficed to keep the house up why could he not imitate others demand a part for himself obtain shares succeed in something at last and she insisted with the cruelty of an heiress who had brought her own fortune he always restrained and taking refuge in the deceptive coldness of a man of business was torn by desire for this creature one of those late desires which are so violent and which increase with age he had never possessed her as a lover he was haunted by a continual image to have her once to himself as she had given herself to another every morning he dreamed of winning her in the evening then when she looked at him with her cold eyes and when he felt that everything within her denied itself to him he avoided touching her hand it was a suffering without possible cure hidden beneath the stiffness of his attitude the suffering of a tender nature in secret anguish at the lack of domestic happiness at the end of six months when the house being definitely furnished no longer occupied madame hennebeau she fell into the languor of boredom a victim who was being killed by exile and who said that she was glad to die of it just then paul Negrel arrived at monceau his mother the widow of a provence captain living at avignon on a slender income 
had had to content herself with bread and water to enable him to reach the ecole polytechnique he had come out low in rank and his uncle m hennebeau had enabled him to leave by offering to take him as engineer at the Voreux. from that time he was treated as one of the family he even had his room there his meals there lived there and was thus enabled to send to his mother half his salary of three thousand francs to disguise this kindness m hennebeau spoke of the embarrassment to a young man of setting up a household in one of those little villas reserved for the mine engineers madame hennebeau had at once taken the part of a good aunt treating her nephew with familiarity and watching over his comfort during the first months especially she exhibited an overwhelming maternity with her advice regarding the smallest subjects but she remained a woman however and slid into personal confidences this lad so young and so practical with his unscrupulous intelligence professing a philosopher's theory of love amused her with the vivacity of the pessimism which had sharpened his thin face and pointed nose one evening he naturally found himself in her arms and she seemed to give herself up out of kindness while saying to him that she had no heart left and wished only to be his friend in fact she was not jealous she joked him about the putters whom he declared to be abominable and she almost sulked because he had no young man's pranks to narrate to her then she was carried away by the idea of getting him married she dreamed of sacrificing herself and of finding a rich girl for him their relations continued a plaything a recreation in which she felt the last tenderness of a lazy woman who had done with the world two years had passed by one night m hennebeau had a suspicion when he heard naked feet passing his door but this new adventure revolted him in his own house between this mother and this son and besides on the following day his wife spoke to him about the choice of cecile gregoire which she had made for her nephew she occupied herself over this marriage with such ardour that he blushed at his own monstrous imagination he only felt gratitude towards the young man who since his arrival had made the house less melancholy as he came down from the dressing-room m hennebeau found that paul who had just returned was in the vestibule he seemed to be quite amused by the story of this strike well asked his uncle well i've been round the settlements they seem to be quite sensible in there i think they will first send you a deputation but at that moment madame hennebeau's voice called from the first story is that you paul come up then and tell me the news how queer they are to make such a fuss these people who are so happy and the manager had to renounce further information since his wife had taken his messenger he returned and sat before his desk on which a new packet of dispatches was placed at eleven o'clock the grégoires arrived and were astonished when hippolyte the footman who was placed as sentinel hustled them in after an anxious glance at the two ends of the road the drawing-room curtains were drawn and they were taken at once into the study where m hennebeau apologized for their reception but the drawing-room looked over the street and it was undesirable to seem to offer provocations what you don't know he went on seeing their surprise m grégoire when he heard that the strike had at last broken out shrugged his shoulders in his placid way bah it would be nothing the people were honest with a movement of her chin madame grégoire approved his confidence and the everlasting resignation of the colliers while cecile who was very cheerful that day feeling that she looked well in her capuchin cloth costume smiled at the word strike which reminded her of visits to the settlements and the distribution of charities madame hennebeau now appeared in black silk followed by negrel ah isn't it annoying she said at the door as if they couldn't wait those men you know that paul refuses to take us to a st thomas we can stay here said m grégoire obligingly we shall be quite pleased paul had contented himself with formally saluting cecile and her mother 
angry at this lack of demonstrativeness his aunt sent him with a look to the young girl and when she heard them laughing together she enveloped them in a maternal glance m hennebeau however finished reading his dispatches and prepared a few replies they talked near him the wife explained that she had not done anything to this study which in fact retained its faded old red paper its heavy mahogany furniture its cardboard files scratched by use three-quarters of an hour passed and they were about to seat themselves at table when the footman announced m Danalon. he entered in an excited way and bowed to madame Hennebeau. ah you here he said seeing the gregoires and he quickly spoke to the manager it has come then i've just heard of it through my engineer with me all the men went down this morning but the thing may spread i'm not at all at ease how is it with you he had arrived on horseback and his anxiety betrayed itself in his loud speech and abrupt gestures which made him resemble a retired cavalry officer m hennebeau was beginning to inform him regarding the precise situation when hippolyte opened the dining-room door then he interrupted himself to say lunch with us i will tell you more to dessert yes as you please replied Danilin, so full of his thoughts that he accepted without ceremony he was however conscious of his impoliteness and turned towards madame Monbeau with apologies she was very charming however when she had had a seventh plate laid she placed her guests madame grégoire and cecile by her husband then m grégoire and deneulin at her own right and left then paul whom she put between the young girl and her father as they attacked the hors d'oeuvres she said with a smile you must excuse me i wanted to give you oysters on monday you know there was an arrival of austin oysters at marchand's and i meant to send the cook with the carriage but she was afraid of being stoned they all interrupted her with a great burst of gaiety they thought the story very funny hush said m hennebeau vexed looking at the window through which the road could be seen we need not tell the whole country that we have company this morning well here is a slice of sausage which they shan't have m grégoire declared the laughter began again but with greater restraint each guest made himself comfortable in this room upholstered with flemish tapestry and furnished with old oak chests the silver shone behind the panes of the sideboards and there was a large hanging lamp of red copper whose polished surfaces reflected a palm and an aspidistra growing in majolica pots outside the december day was frozen by a keen northeast wind but not a breath of it entered a greenhouse warmth developed the delicate odor of the pineapple sliced in a crystal bowl suppose we were to draw the curtains proposed negrel who was amused at the idea of frightening the grégoires the housemaid who was helping the footman treated this as an order and went and closed one of the curtains this led to interminable jokes not a glass or a plate could be put down without precaution every dish was hailed as a waif escaped from the pillage in a conquered town and behind this forced gaiety there was a certain fear which betrayed itself in involuntary glances towards the road as though a band of starvelings were watching the table from outside after the scrambled eggs with truffles trout came on the conversation then turned to the industrial crisis which had become aggravated during the last eighteen months it was inevitable said Denelon. the excessive prosperity of recent years was bound to bring us to it think of the enormous capital which has been sunk the railways harbors and canals all the money buried in the maddest speculations among us alone sugar works have been set up as if the department could furnish three beetroot harvests good heavens and to-day money is scarce and we have to wait to catch up the interests of the expended millions so there is a mortal congestion and a final stagnation of business m hennebeau disputed this theory but he agreed that the fortunate years had spoilt the men when i think 
he exclaimed that these chaps in our pits used to gain six francs a day double what they gain now and they lived well too and acquired luxurious tastes to-day naturally it seems hard to them to go back to their old frugality monsieur grégoire interrupted madame hennebeau let me persuade you a little more trout they are delicious are they not the manager went on but as a matter of fact is it our fault we too are cruelly struck since the factories have closed one by one we have had a deuce of a difficulty in getting rid of our stock and in face of the growing reduction in demand we have been forced to lower our net prices it is just this that the men won't understand there was silence the footman presented roast partridge while the housemaid began to pour out chamotin for the guests there has been a famine in india said deneron in a low voice as though he were speaking to himself america by ceasing to order iron has struck a heavy blow at our furnaces everything holds together a distant shock is enough to disturb the world and the empire which was so proud of this hot fever of industry he attacked his partridge wing then raising his voice the worst is that to lower the net prices we ought logically to produce more otherwise the reduction bears on wages and the worker is right in saying that he has to pay the damage this confession the outcome of his frankness raised a discussion the ladies were not at all interested besides all were occupied with their plates in the first zest of appetite when the footman came back he seemed about to speak then he hesitated what is it asked m hennebeau if there are letters give them to me i am expecting replies no sir it is m dansard who is in the hall but he doesn't wish to disturb you the manager excused himself and had the head captain brought in the latter stood upright a few paces from the table while all turned to look at him huge out of breath with the news he was bringing the settlements were quiet only it had now been decided to send a deputation it would perhaps be there in a few minutes very well thank you said m hennebeau i want a report morning and evening you understand and as soon as dansard had gone they began to joke again and hastened to attack the russian salad declaring that not a moment was to be lost if they wished to finish it the mirth was unbounded when negrel having asked the housemaid for bread she replied yes sir in a voice as low and terrified as if she had behind her a troop ready for murder and rape you may speak said madame hennebeau complacently they are not here yet the manager who now received a packet of letters and dispatches wished to read one of his letters aloud it was from Piron who in respectful phrases gave notice that he was obliged to go out on strike with his comrades in order to avoid ill-treatment and he added that he had not even been able to avoid taking part in the deputation although he blamed that step so much for liberty of work exclaimed m hennebeau then they returned to the strike and asked him his opinion oh he replied we have had them before it will be a week or at most a fortnight of idleness as it was last time they will go and wallow in the public houses and then when they are hungry they will go back to the pits deneulin shook his head i am not so satisfied this time they appear to be better organized have they not a provident fund yes scarcely three thousand francs what do you think they can do with that i suspect a man called etienne lantier of being their leader he is a good workman it would vex me to have to give him his certificate back as we did of old to the famous rasseneur who still poisons the voreau with his ideas and his beer no matter in a week half the men will have gone down and in a fortnight the ten thousand will be below he was convinced his only anxiety was concerning his own possible disgrace should the directors put the responsibility of the strike on him for some time he had felt that he was diminishing in favour 
so leaving the spoonful of russian salad which he had taken he read over again the dispatches received from paris endeavoring to penetrate every word his guests excused him the meal was becoming a military lunch eaten on the field of battle before the first shots were fired the ladies then joined in the conversation madame gregoire expressed pity for the poor people who would suffer from hunger and cecile was already making plans for distributing gifts of bread and meat but madame hennebeau was astonished at hearing of the wretchedness of the Monceau's colliers were they not very fortunate people who were lodged and warmed and cared for at the expense of the company in her indifference for the herd she only knew the lesson she had learnt and with which she had surprised the parisians who came on a visit she believed them at last and was indignant at the ingratitude of the people Negrel, meanwhile continued to frighten monsieur grégoire cecile did not displease him and he was quite willing to marry her to be agreeable to his aunt but he showed no amorous fever like a youth of experience who he said was not easily carried away now he professed to be a republican which did not prevent him from treating his men with extreme severity or from making fun of them in the company of the ladies nor have i my uncle's optimism either he continued i fear there will be serious disturbances so i should advise you monsieur grégoire to lock up piolaine they may pillage you just then still retaining the smile which illuminated his good-natured face m grégoire was going beyond his wife in paternal sentiments with regard to the miners pillage me he cried stupefied and why pillage me are you not a shareholder in monceau you do nothing you live on the work of others in fact you are an infamous capitalist and that is enough you may be sure that if the revolution triumphs it will force you to restore your fortune as stolen money at once he lost his childlike tranquillity his serene unconsciousness he stammered stolen money my fortune did not my great-grandfather gain and hardly too the sum originally invested have we not run all the risks of the enterprise and do i to-day make a bad use of my income madame hennebeau alarmed at seeing the mother and daughter also white with fear hastened to intervene saying paul is joking my dear sir but m grégoire was carried out of himself as the servant was passing round the crayfish he took three of them without knowing what he was doing and began to break their claws with his teeth ah i don't say but what there are shareholders who abuse their position for instance i have been told that ministers have received shares in monceau for services rendered to the company it is like a nobleman whom i will not name a duke the biggest of our shareholders whose life is a scandal of prodigality millions thrown into the street on women feasting and useless luxury but we who live quietly like good citizens as we are who do not speculate who are content to live wholesomely on what we have giving a part to the poor come now your men must be mere brigands if they came and stole a pin from us negrel himself had to calm him though amused at his anger the crayfish were still going round the little crackling sound of their carapaces could be heard while the conversation turned to politics m grégoire in spite of everything and though still trembling called himself a liberal and regretted louis philippe as for Denalon, he was for a strong government he declared that the emperor was gliding down the slope of dangerous concessions remember eighty nine he said it was the nobility who made the revolution possible by their complicity and taste for philosophic novelties very well the middle class to-day are playing the same silly game with their furious liberalism their rage for destruction their flattery of the people yes yes you are sharpening the teeth of the monster that will devour us it will devour us rest assured the ladies bade him be silent and tried to change the conversation by asking him news of his daughters lucy was at marchand where she was singing with a friend 
john was painting an old beggar's head but he said these things in a distracted way he constantly looked at the manager who was absorbed in the reading of his dispatches and forgetful of his guests behind those thin leaves he felt paris and the director's orders which would decide the strike at last he could not help yielding to his preoccupation well what are you going to do he asked suddenly m hennebeau started then turned off the question with a vague phrase we shall see no doubt you are solidly placed you can wait deneland began to think aloud but as for me i shall be done for it if the strike reaches vandame i shall have reinstated jean bart in vain with a single pit i can only get along by constant production ah i am not in a very pleasant situation i can assure you this involuntary confession seemed to strike m hennebeau he listened and a plan formed within him in case the strike turned out badly why not utilize it by letting things run down until his neighbor was ruined and then buy up his concession at a low price that would be the surest way of regaining the good graces of the directors who for years had dreamed of possessing van damme if jean bart bothers you as much as that said he laughing why don't you give it up to us but deneland was already regretting his complaints he exclaimed never never they were amused at his vigor and had already forgotten the strike by the time the dessert appeared an apple charlotte meringue was overwhelmed with praise afterwards the ladies discussed a recipe with respect to the pineapple which was declared equally exquisite the grapes and pears completed their happy abandonment at the end of this copious lunch all talked excitedly at the same time while the servant poured out rhine wine in place of champagne which was looked upon as commonplace and the marriage of paul and cecile certainly made a forward step in the sympathy produced by the dessert his aunt had thrown such urgent looks in his direction that the young man showed himself very amiable and in his wheedling way reconquered the grégoires who had been cast down by his stories of pillage for a moment m hennebeau seeing the close understanding between his wife and his nephew felt that abominable suspicion again revive as if in this exchange of looks he had surprised a physical contact but again the idea of the marriage made here before his face reassured him hippolyte was serving the coffee when the housemaid entered in a fright sir sir they are here it was the delegates doors banged a breath of terror was passing through the neighboring rooms around the table the guests were looking at one another with uneasy indecision there was silence then they tried to resume their jokes they pretended to put the rest of the sugar in their pockets and talked of hiding the plate but the manager remained grave and the laughter fell and their voices sank to a whisper while the heavy feet of the delegates who were being shown in tramped over the carpet of the next room madame hennebeau said to her husband lowering her voice i hope you will drink your coffee certainly he replied let them wait he was nervous listening to every sound though apparently occupied with his cup paul and cecile got up and he made her venture an eye to the keyhole they were stifling their laughter and talking in a low voice do you see them yes i see a big man and two small ones behind haven't they ugly faces not at all they are very nice suddenly m hennebeau left his chair saying the coffee was too hot and he would drink it afterwards as he went out he put a finger to his lips to recommend prudence they all sat down again and remained at the table in silence no longer daring to move listening from afar with intent ears jarred by these coarse male voices End of section seventeen Section 18 of Germanon by Emile Zola. Translation by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part 4. Chapter 2. The previous day, at a meeting held at Rasseneur's, 
etienne and some comrades had chosen the delegates who were to proceed on the following day to the manager's house when in the evening maheude learned that her man was one of them she was in despair and asked him if he wanted them to be thrown on the street maheu himself had agreed with reluctance both of them when the moment of action came in spite of the injustice of their wretchedness fell back on the resignation of their race trembling before the morrow preferring still to bend their backs to the yoke in the management of affairs he usually gave way to his wife whose advice was sound this time however he grew angry at last all the more so since he secretly shared her fears just leave me alone will you he said going to bed and turning his back a fine thing to leave the mates now i'm doing my duty she went to bed in her turn neither of them spoke then after a long silence she replied you're right go only poor old man we are done for midday struck while they were at lunch for the rendezvous was at one o'clock at the advantage from which they were to go together to m hambo's they were eating potatoes as there was only a small morsel of butter left no one touched it they would have bread and butter in the evening you know that we reckon on you to speak said etienne suddenly to maheu the latter was so overcome that he was silent from emotion no no that's too much cried maheude i am quite willing he should go there but i don't allow him to go at the head why him more than any one else then etienne with his fiery eloquence began to explain maheu was the best worker in the pit the most liked and the most respected whose good sense was always spoken of in his mouth the miners claims would carry decisive weight at first etienne had arranged to speak but he had been at montsou for too short a time one who belonged to the country would be better listened to in fact the comrades were confiding their interests to the most worthy he could not refuse it would be cowardly maheude made a gesture of despair go go my man go and be killed for the others i'm willing after all but i could never do it stammered maheu i should say something stupid etienne glad to have persuaded him struck him on the shoulder say what you feel and you won't go wrong father bonnemort whose legs were now less swollen was listening with his mouth full shaking his head there was silence when potatoes were being eaten the children were subdued and behaved well then having swallowed his mouthful the old man muttered slowly you can say what you like and it will be all the same as if you said nothing ah i've seen these affairs i've seen them forty years ago they drove us out of the manager's house and with sabres too now they may receive you perhaps but they won't answer you any more than that wall lord they have money why should they care there was silence again maheu and etienne rose and left the family in gloom before the empty plates on going out they called for perron and levaque and then all four went to rosseneur's where the delegates from the neighbouring settlements were arriving in little groups when the twenty members of the deputation had assembled there they settled on the terms to be opposed to the companies and then set out for Monceau. the keen northeast wind was sweeping the street as they arrived it struck two at first the servant told them to wait and shut the door on them then when he came back he introduced them into the drawing-room and opened the curtains a soft daylight entered sifted through the lace and the miners when left alone in their embarrassment did not care to sit all of them very clean dressed in cloth shaven that morning with their yellow hair and moustaches they twisted their caps between their fingers and looked sideways at the furniture which was in every variety of style as a result of the taste for the old-fashioned henry the second easy chairs louis fifteenth chairs an italian cabinet of the seventeenth century a spanish contador of the fifteenth century with an altar front serving as a chimney-piece and ancient chasuble trimming reapplied to the curtains 
this old gold and these old silks with their tawny tones all this luxurious church furniture had overwhelmed them with respectful discomfort the eastern carpets with their long wool seemed to bind their feet but what especially suffocated them was the heat heat like that of a hot air stove which surprised them as they felt it with cheeks frozen from the wind of the road five minutes passed by and their awkwardness increased in the comfort of this rich room so pleasantly warm at last m hennebeau entered buttoned up in a military manner and wearing on his frock coat the correct little bow of his decoration he spoke first ah here you are you are in rebellion it seems he interrupted himself to add with polite stiffness sit down i desire nothing better than to talk things over the miners turned round looking for seats a few of them ventured to place themselves in chairs while the others disturbed by the embroidered silks preferred to remain standing there was a period of silence m hombeau who had drawn his easy-chair up to the fireplace was rapidly looking them over and endeavouring to recall their faces he had recognised perron it was hidden in the last row and his eyes rested on etienne who was seated in front of him well he asked what have you to say to me he had expected to hear the young man speak and he was so surprised to see maheu come forward that he could not avoid adding what you a good workman who have always been so sensible one of the old Monsieur people whose family has worked in the mine since the first stroke of the axe ah it's a pity i'm sorry that you are at the head of the discontented maheu listened with his eyes down then he began at first in a low and hesitating voice it is just because i am a quiet man sir whom no one has anything against that my mates have chosen me that ought to show you that it isn't just a rebellion of blusterers badly disposed men who want to create disorder we only want justice we are tired of starving and it seems to us that the time has come when things ought to be arranged so that we can at least have bread every day his voice grew stronger he lifted his eyes and went on while looking at the manager you know quite well that we cannot agree to your new system they accuse us of bad timbering it's true we don't give the necessary time to the work but if we gave it our day's work would be still smaller and as it doesn't give us enough food at present that would mean the end of everything the sweep of the clout that would wipe off all your men pay us more and we will timber better we will give the necessary hours to the timbering instead of putting all our strength into the picking which is the only work that pays there is no other arrangement possible if the work is to be done it must be paid for and what have you invented instead a thing which we can't get into our heads don't you see you lower the price of the tram and then you pretend to make up for it by paying for all timbering separately if that was true we should be robbed all the same for the timbering would still take us more time but what makes us mad is that it isn't even true the company compensates for nothing at all it simply puts two centimes a tram into its pocket that's all yes yes that's it murmured the other deputies noticing m hennebeau make a violent movement as if to interrupt but maheu cut the manager short now that he had set out his words came by themselves at times he listened to himself with surprise as though a stranger were speaking within him it was the things amassed within his breast things he did not even know were there and which came out in an expansion of his heart he described the wretchedness that was common to all of them the hard toil the brutal life the wife and little ones crying from hunger in the house he quoted the recent disastrous payments the absurd fortnightly wages eaten up by fines and rest days and brought back to their families in tears was it resolved to destroy them then sir he concluded we have come to tell you that if we've got to starve we would rather starve doing nothing it would be a little less trouble we have left the pits and we don't go down again unless the company agrees to our terms the company wants to lower the price of the tram and to pay for the tempering separately 
we asked for things to be left as they were and we also asked for five centimes more the tram now it is for you to see if you are on the side of justice and work voices rose among the miners that's it he has said what we all feel we only ask what's reason others without speaking showed their approval by nodding their heads the luxurious room had disappeared with its gold and its embroideries its mysterious piling up of ancient things and they no longer even felt the carpet which they crushed beneath their heavy boots let me reply then at last exclaimed m hennebeau who was growing angry first of all it is not true that the company gains two centimes the tram let us look at the figures a confused discussion followed the manager trying to divide them appealed to perron who hid himself stammering levaque on the contrary was at the head of the more aggressive muddling up things and affirming facts of which he was ignorant the loud murmurs of their voices were stifled beneath the hangings in this hothouse atmosphere if you all talk at the same time said monsieur hanbeau we shall never come to an understanding he had regained his calmness the rough politeness without bitterness of an agent who has received his instructions and means that they shall be respected from the first word he never took his eye off etienne and manoeuvred to draw the young man out of his obstinate silence leaving the discussion about the two centimes he suddenly enlarged the question no acknowledge the truth you are yielding to abominable incitations it is a plague which is now blowing over the workers everywhere and corrupting the best oh i have no need for any one to confess i can see well that you have been changed you who used to be so quiet is it not so you have been promised more butter than bread and you have been told that now your turn has come to be masters in fact you have been enrolled in that famous international that army of brigands who dream of destroying society then etienne interrupted him you are mistaken sir not a single monceau collier has yet enrolled but if they are driven to it all the pits will enroll themselves that depends on the company from that moment the struggle went on between m hennebeau and etienne as though the other miners were no longer there the company is a providence for the men and you are wrong to threaten it this year it has spent three hundred thousand francs in building settlements which only return two per cent and i say nothing of the pensions which it pays nor of the coals and medicines which it gives you who seem to be intelligent and who have become in a few months one of our most skilful workmen would it not be better if you were to spread these truths rather than ruin yourself by associating with people of bad reputation yes i mean rasseneur whom we had to turn off in order to save our pits from socialistic corruption you are constantly seen with him and it is certainly he who has induced you to form this provident fund which we would willingly tolerate if it were merely a means of saving but which we feel to be a weapon turned against us a reserve fund to pay the expenses of the war and in this connection i ought to add that the company means to control that fund etienne allowed him to continue fixing his eyes on him while a slight nervous quiver moved his lips he smiled at the last remark and simply replied then that is a new demand for until now sir you have neglected to claim that control unfortunately we wish the company to occupy itself less with us and instead of playing the part of providence to be merely just with us giving us our due the profits which it appropriates is it honest whenever a crisis comes to leave the workers to die with hunger in order to save the shareholders dividends whatever you may say sir the new system is a disguised reduction of wages and that is what we are rebelling against for if the company wants to economize it acts very badly by only economizing on the men ah there we are cried m hanbeau i was expecting that the accusation of starving the people and living by their sweat how can you talk such folly 
you who ought to know the enormous risks which capital runs in industry in the mines for example a well-equipped pit to-day costs from fifteen hundred thousand francs to two millions and it is difficult enough to get a moderate interest on the vast sum that is thus swallowed nearly half the mining companies in france are bankrupt besides it is stupid to accuse those who succeed of cruelty when their workers suffer they suffer themselves can you believe that the company has not as much to lose as you have in the present crisis it does not govern wages it obeys competition under pain of ruin blame the facts not the company but you don't wish to hear you don't wish to understand yes said the young man we understand very well that our lot will never be bettered as long as things go on as they are going and that is the reason why some day or another the workers will end by arranging that things shall go differently this sentence so moderate in form was pronounced in a low voice but with such conviction tremulous in its menace that a deep silence followed a certain constraint a breath of fear passed through the polite drawing-room the other delegates though scarcely understanding felt that their comrade had been demanding their share of this comfort and they began to cast sidelong looks over the warm hangings the comfortable seats all this luxury of which the least knick-knack would have bought them soup for a month at last m humboldt who had remained thoughtful rose as a sign for them to depart all imitated him etienne had lightly pushed me his elbow and the latter his tongue once more thick and awkward again spoke then sir that is all that you reply we must tell the others that you reject our terms i my good fellow exclaimed the manager i reject nothing i am paid just as you are i have no more power in the matter than the smallest of your trammers i receive my orders and my only duty is to see that they are executed i have told you what i thought i ought to tell you but it is not for me to decide you have brought me your demands i will make them known to the directors then i will tell you their reply he spoke with the correct air of a high official avoiding any passionate interest in the matter with the courteous dryness of a simple instrument of authority and the miners now looked at him with distrust asking themselves what interest he might have in lying and what he would get by thus putting himself between them and the real masters a schemer perhaps this man who was paid like a worker and who lived so well etienne ventured to intervene again you see sir how unfortunate it is that we cannot plead our cause in person we could explain many things and bring forward many reasons of which you could know nothing if we only knew where we ought to go m Enfant was not at all angry he even smiled ah it gets complicated as soon as you have no confidence in me you will have to go over there the delegates had followed the vague gesture of his hand toward one of the windows where was it over there paris no doubt but they did not know exactly it seemed to fall back into a terrible distance in an inaccessible religious country where an unknown god sat on his throne crouching down at the far end of his tabernacle they would never see him they only felt him as a force far off which weighed on the ten thousand colliers of Monceau and when the director spoke he had that hidden force behind him delivering oracles they were overwhelmed with discouragement etienne himself signified by a shrug of the shoulders that it would be best to go while m hannibal touched maheu's arm in a friendly way and asked after jeanlin that is a severe lesson now and it is you who defend bad timbering you must reflect my friends you must realize that a strike would be a disaster for everybody before a week you would die of hunger what would you do i count on your good sense anyhow and i am convinced that you will go down on monday at the latest they all loved going out of the drawing-room with the tramping of a flock and rounded backs without replying a word to this hope of submission the manager who accompanied them was obliged to continue the conversation the company on the one side had its new tariff 
the workers on the other their demand for an increase of five centimes the tram in order that they might have no illusions he felt he ought to warn them that their terms would certainly be rejected by the directors reflect before committing any follies he repeated disturbed at their silence in the porch pierron bowed very low while levaque pretended to adjust his cap maheu was trying to find something to say before leaving when etienne again touched his elbow and they all left in the midst of this threatening silence the door closed with a loud bang when m hambeau re-entered the dining-room he found his guests motionless and silent before the liqueurs in two words he told his story to Danilo, whose face grew still more gloomy then as he drank his cold coffee they tried to speak of other things but the grégoires themselves returned to the subject of the strike expressing their astonishment that no laws existed to prevent workmen from leaving their work paul reassured cecile stating that they were expecting the police at last madame hombo called the servant hippolyte before we go into the drawing-room just open the windows and let in a little air End of section eighteen section nineteen of germanon by emile zola translation by havelock ellis this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Berard. part four chapter three a fortnight had passed and on the monday of the third week the list sent up to the manager showed a fresh decrease in the number of the miners who had gone down it was expected that on that morning work would be resumed but the obstinacy of the directors in not yielding exasperated the miners the voreux crecourt miro and madeleine were not the only pits resting at the victoire and at feutre cantel only about a quarter of the men had gone down even st thomas was affected the strike was gradually becoming general at the voreux a heavy silence hung over the pit mouth it was a dead workshop these great empty abandoned yards where work was leaping in the grey december sky along the high foot-bridges three or four empty trams bore witness to the mute sadness of things underneath between the slender posts of the platforms the stock of coal was diminishing leaving the earth bare and black while the supplies of wood were mouldering beneath the rain at the quay on the canal a barge was moored half laden lying drowsily in the murky water and on the deserted pit bank in which the decomposed sulphates smoked in spite of the rain a melancholy cart showed its shafts erect but the buildings especially were growing torpid the screening shed with closed shutters the steeple in which the rumbling of the receiving room no more arose and the machine-room grown cold and the giant chimney too large for the occasional smoke the winding engine was only heated in the morning the groom sent down fodder for the horses and the captains worked alone at the bottom having become laborers again watching over the damages that took place in the passages as soon as they ceased to be repaired then after nine o'clock the rest of the service was carried on by the ladders and about these dead buildings buried in their garment of black dust there was only heard the escapement of the pumping engine breathing with its thick long breath all that was left of the life of the pit which the water would destroy if that breathing should cease on the plain opposite the settlement of the deux cents coherents seemed also to be dead the prefect of lille had come in haste and the police had tramped all the roads but in face of the calmness of the strikers the prefect and police had decided to go home again never had the settlement given so splendid an example in the vast plain the men to avoid going to the public house slept all day long the women while dividing the coffee became reasonable less anxious to gossip and quarrel and even the troops of children seemed to understand it all and were so good that they ran about with naked feet smacking each other silently 
the word of command had been repeated and circulated from mouth to mouth they wished to be sensible there was however a continuous coming and going of people in the maheu's house etienne as secretary had divided the three thousand francs of the provident fund among the needy families afterwards from various sides several hundred francs had arrived yielded by subscriptions and collections but now all their resources were exhausted the miners had no more money to keep up the strike and hunger was there threatening them maigret after having promised credit for a fortnight had suddenly altered his mind at the end of a week and cut off provisions he usually took his orders from the company perhaps the latter wished to bring the matter to an end by starving the settlements he acted besides like a capricious tyrant giving or refusing bread according to the look of the girl who was sent by her parents for provisions and he especially closed his doors spitefully to Mehude, wishing to punish her because he had not been able to get catherine to complete their misery it was freezing very hard and the women watched their piles of coal diminish thinking anxiously that they could no longer renew them at the pits now that the men were not going down it was not enough to die of hunger they must also die of cold among the mehus everything was already running short the levants could still eat on the strength of a twenty-franc piece lent by Bottoloup. as to the perrons they always had money but in order to appear as needy as the others for fear of loans they got their supplies on credit from maigrat who would have thrown his shop at perron if she had held out her petticoat to him since saturday many families had gone to bed without supper and in face of the terrible days that were beginning not a complaint was heard all obeyed the word of command with quiet courage there was an absolute confidence in spite of everything a religious faith the blind gift of a population of believers since an era of justice had been promised to them they were willing to suffer for the conquest of universal happiness hunger exalted their heads never had the low horizon opened a larger beyond to these people in the hallucination of their misery they saw again over there when their eyes were dimmed by weakness the ideal city of their dream but now growing near and seeming to be real with its population of brothers its golden age of labor and meals in common nothing overcame their conviction that they were at last entering it the fund was exhausted the company would not yield every day must aggravate the situation and they preserved their hope and showed a smiling contempt for facts if the earth opened beneath them a miracle would save them this faith replaced bread and warmed their stomachs when the mehirs and the others had too quickly digested their soup made with clear water they thus rose into a state of semi-vertigo that ecstasy of a better life which has flung martyrs to the wild beasts etienne was henceforth the unquestioned leader in the evening conversations he gave forth oracles in the degree to which study had refined him and made him able to enter into difficult matters he spent the nights reading and received a large number of letters he even subscribed to the Vengeur, a belgian socialist paper and this journal the first to enter the settlement gained for him extraordinary consideration among his mates his growing popularity excited him more every day to carry on an extensive correspondence to discuss the fate of the workers in the four corners of the province to give advice to the voreux miners especially to become a centre and to feel the world rolling round him continually swelled the vanity of the former engine man the pikeman with greasy black hands he was climbing a ladder he was entering this execrated middle class with a satisfaction to his intelligence and comfort which he did not confess to himself he had only one trouble the consciousness of his lack of education which made him embarrassed and timid as soon as he was in the presence of a gentleman in a frock coat if he went on instructing himself devouring everything the lack of method would render assimilation very slow and would produce such confusion that at last he would know much more than he could understand 
so at certain hours of good sense he experienced a restlessness with regard to his mission a fear that he was not the man for the task perhaps it required a lawyer a learned man able to speak and act without compromising the mates but an outcry soon restored his assurance no 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 lawyers they are all rascals they profit by their knowledge to fatten on the people let things turn out how they will the workers must manage their own affairs and his dream of popular leadership again soothed him Monceau at his feet paris in the misty distance who knows the election some day the tribune in a gorgeous hall where he could thunder against the middle class in the first speech pronounced by a workman in a parliament during the last few days etienne had been perplexed Pluchart wrote letter after letter offering to come to monceau to quicken the zeal of the strikers it was a question of organizing a private meeting over which the mechanic would preside and beneath this plan lay the idea of exploiting the strike to gain over to the international these miners who so far had shown themselves suspicious etienne feared a disturbance but he would however have allowed Pluchart to come if rasseneur had not violently blamed this proceeding in spite of his power the young man had to reckon with the innkeeper whose services were of older date and who had faithful followers among his clients so he still hesitated not knowing what to reply on this very monday towards four o'clock a new letter came from lille as etienne was alone with maheude in the lower room maheude weary of idleness had gone fishing if he had the luck to catch a fine fish under the sluice of the canal they could sell it to buy bread old bonnemort and little jeanlin had just gone off to try their legs which were now restored while the children had departed with elzire who spent hours on the pit bank collecting cinders seated near the miserable fire which they no longer dared to keep up maheude with her dress unbuttoned and one breast hanging out of her dress and, and falling to her belly was suckling estelle when the young man had folded the letter she questioned him is the news good are they going to send us any money he shook his head and she went on i don't know what we shall do this week however we'll hold on all the same when one has right on one side don't you think it gives you heart and one ends always by being the strongest at the present time she was to a reasonable extent in favour of the strike it would have been better to force the company to be just without leaving off work but since they had left it they ought not to go back to it without obtaining justice on this point she was relentless better to die than to show oneself in the wrong when one was right ah exclaimed etienne if a fine old cholera was to break out that would free us of all these company exploiters no no she replied we must not wish any one dead that wouldn't help us at all plenty more would spring up now i only ask that they should get sensible ideas and i expect they will for there are worthy people everywhere you know i'm not at all for your politics in fact she always blamed his violent language and thought him aggressive it was good that they should want their work paid for at what it was worth but why occupy oneself with such things as the bourgeois and government why mix oneself up with other people's affairs when one would get nothing out of it but hard knocks and she kept her esteem for him because he did not get drunk and regularly paid his forty-five francs for board and lodging when a man behaves well one can forgive him the rest etienne then talked about the republic which would give bread to everybody but maheude shook her head for she remembered eighteen forty eight an awful year which had left them as bare as worms her and her man in their early housekeeping years she forgot herself in describing its horrors in a mournful voice her eyes lost in space her breast open while her infant estelle without letting it go had fallen asleep on her knees and at the end also absorbed in thought had his eyes fixed on this enormous breast 
of which the soft whiteness contrasted with the muddy yellowish complexion of her face not a farthing she murmured nothing to put between one's teeth and all the pits stopped just the same destruction of poor people as to-day but at that moment the door opened and they remained mute with surprise before catherine who then came in since her fight with chaval she had not reappeared at the settlement her emotion was so great that trembling and silent she forgot to shut the door she expected to find her mother alone and the sight of the young man put out of her head the phrases she had prepared on the way what on earth have you come here for cried maheude without even moving from her chair i don't want to have anything more to do with you get along then catherine tried to find words mother it's some coffee and sugar yes for the children i've been thinking of them and done overtime she drew out of her pockets a pound of coffee and a pound of sugar and took courage to place them on the table the strike at the voreau troubled her while she was working at jean bart and she had only been able to think of this way of helping her parents a little under the pretext of caring for the little ones but her good nature did not disarm her mother who replied instead of bringing us sweets you would have done better to stay and earn bread for us she overwhelmed her with abuse relieving herself by throwing in her daughter's face all that she had been saying against her for the past month to go off with the man to hang on to him at sixteen when the family was in want only the most degraded of unnatural children could do it one could forgive a folly but a mother never forgot a trick like that there might have been some excuse if they had been strict with her not at all she was as free as air and they only asked her to come in to sleep tell me what have you got in your skin at your age catherine standing beside the table listened with lowered head a quiver shook her thin underdeveloped girlish body and she tried to reply in broken words oh if it was only me and the amusement that i get it's him what he wants i'm obliged to want too aren't i because you see he's the strongest how can one tell how things are going to turn out anyhow it's done and can't be undone it may as well be him as another now he'll have to marry me she defended herself without a struggle with the passive resignation of a girl who has submitted to the male at an early age was it not the common lot she had never dreamed of anything else violence behind the pick bank a child of sixteen and then a wretched household if her lover married her and she did not blush with shame she only quivered like this at being treated like a slut before this lad whose presence oppressed her to despair etienne had risen however and was pretending to stir up the nearly extinct fire in order not to interrupt the explanation but their looks met he found her pale and exhausted pretty indeed with her clear eyes in the face which had grown tanned and he experienced a singular feeling his spite had vanished he simply desired that she should be happy with this man whom she had preferred to him he felt the need to occupy himself with her still a longing to go to monceau and force the other man to his duty but she only saw pity in his constant tenderness he must feel contempt for her to gaze at her like that then her heart contracted so that she choked without being able to stammer any more words of excuse that's it you'd best hold your tongue began the implacable maheude if you come back to stay come in else get along with you at once and think yourself lucky that i'm not free just now or i should have put my foot into you somewhere for now as if this threat had suddenly been realized catherine received a vigorous kick right behind so violent that she was stupefied with surprise and pain it was chaval who had leapt in through the open door to give her this lunge of a vicious beast for a moment he had watched her from outside ah slut he yelled i've followed you i knew well enough you were coming back here to get him to fill you and it's you that pay him eh you pour coffee down him with my money 
maheude and Matienne were stupefied and did not stir with a furious movement chaval chased catherine towards the door out you go by god and as she took refuge in a corner he turned on her mother a nice business keeping watch while your whore of a daughter is kicking her legs upstairs at last he caught catherine's wrist shaking her and dragging her out at the door he again turned towards maheude who was nailed to her chair she had forgotten to fasten up her breast estelle had gone to sleep and her face had slipped down into the woollen petticoat the enormous breast was hanging free and naked like the udder of a great cow when the daughter is not at it it's the mother who gets herself plugged cried chaval go on show him your meat he isn't disgusted your dirty lodger at this at the end was about to strike his mate the fear of arousing the settlement by a fight had kept him back from snatching catherine from chaval's hands but rage was now carrying him away and the two men were face to face with inflamed eyes it was an old hatred a jealousy long unacknowledged which was breaking out one of them now must do for the other take care stammered etienne with clenched teeth i'll do for you try replied chaval they looked at one another for some seconds longer so close that their hot breaths burnt each other's faces and it was catherine who suppliantly took her lover's hand again to lead him away she dragged him out of the settlement fleeing without turning her head what a brute muttered etienne banging the door and so shaken by anger that he was obliged to sit down maheude in front of him had not stirred she made a vague gesture and there was silence a silence which was painful and heavy with unspoken things in spite of an effort his gaze again returned to her breast that expanse of white flesh the brilliance of which now made him uncomfortable no doubt she was forty and had lost her shape like a good female who had produced too much but many would still desire her strong and solid with a large long face of a woman who had once been beautiful slowly and quietly she was putting back her breast with both hands a rosy corner was still obstinate and she pushed it back with her finger and then buttoned herself up and was now quite black and shapeless in her old gown he's a filthy beast she said at last only a filthy beast could have such nasty ideas i don't care a hang what he says it isn't worth notice then in a frank voice she added fixing her eyes on the young man i have my faults sure enough but not that one only two men have touched me a putter long ago when i was fifteen and then Mahil. if he had left me like the other lord i don't quite know what would have happened and i don't pride myself either on my good conduct with him since our marriage because when one hasn't gone wrong it's often because one hasn't the chance only i say things as they are and i know neighbors who couldn't say as much don't you think that's true enough replied etienne and he rose and went out while she decided to light the fire again after having placed the sleeping estelle on two chairs if the father caught and sold a fish they could manage to have some soup outside night was already coming on a frosty night and with lowered head etienne walked along sunk in dark melancholy it was no longer anger against the man or pity for the poor ill-treated girl the brutal scene was effaced and lost and he was thrown back on to the sufferings of all the abominations of wretchedness he thought of the settlement without bread these women and little ones who would not eat that evening all this struggling race with empty bellies and the doubt which sometimes touched him awoke again in the frightful melancholy of the twilight and tortured him with a discomfort which he had never felt so strongly before with what a terrible responsibility he had burdened himself must he still push them on in obstinate resistance now that there was neither money nor credit and what would be the end of it all if no help arrived and starvation came to beat down their courage 
he had a sudden vision of disaster of dying children and sobbing mothers while the men lean and pale went down once more into the pits he went on walking his feet stumbling against the stones and the thought that the company would be found strongest and that he would have brought misfortune on his comrades filled him with insupportable anguish when he raised his head he saw that he was in front of the bureau the gloomy mass of buildings looked sombre beneath the growing darkness the deserted square obstructed by great motionless shadows seemed like the corner of an abandoned fortress as soon as the winding engine stopped the soul left the place at this hour of the night nothing was alive not a lantern not a voice and the sound of the pump itself was only a distant moan coming one could not say whence in this annihilation of the whole pit as etienne gazed the blood flowed back to his heart if the workers were suffering hunger the company was encroaching on its millions why should it prove the stronger in this war of labor against gold in any case the victory would cost it dear they would have their corpses to count he felt the fury of battle again the fierce desire to have done with misery even at the price of death it would be as well for the settlement to die at one stroke as to go on dying in detail of famine and injustice his ill-digested reading came back to him examples of nations who had burnt their towns to arrest the enemy vague histories of mothers who had saved their children from slavery by crushing their heads against the pavement of men who had died of want rather than eat the bread of tyrants his head became exalted a red gaiety arose out of his crisis of black sadness chasing away doubt and making him ashamed of this passing cowardice of an hour and in this revival of his faith gusts of pride reappeared and carried him still higher the joy of being leader of seeing himself obeyed even to sacrifice the enlarged dream of his power the evening of triumph already he imagined a scene of simple grandeur his refusal of power authority placed in the hands of the people when it would be master but he awoke and started at the voice of maheu who was narrating his luck a superb trout which he had fished up and sold for three francs they would have their soup then he left his mate to return alone to the settlement saying that he would follow him and he entered and sat down in the advantage awaiting the departure of a client to tell rasseneur decisively that he should write to pluchart to come at once his resolution was taken he would organize a private meeting for victory seemed to him certain if the Monceau colliers adhered in a mass to the international end of section nineteen Section 20 of Germanon by Emile Zola, translation by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part 4. Chapter 4. It was at the Bon Joyeux, Widow Désir's, that the private meeting was organized for Thursday at two o'clock. The widow, incensed at the miseries inflicted on her children, the colliers, was in a constant state of anger especially as her end was emptying never had there been a less thirsty strike the drunkards had shut themselves up at home for fear of disobeying the sober word of command thus Monceau, which swarmed with people on feast days now exhibited its wide street in mute and melancholy desolation no beer flowed from counters or bellies the gutters were dry on the pavement at the casimir bar and the estaminet du progress one only saw the pale faces of the landladies looking inquiringly into the street then in monceau itself the deserted doors extended from the estaminet l'enfant to the estaminet tisson passing by the estaminet piquet and the tete coupe bar only the estaminet saint eloi which was frequented by captains still drew occasional glasses the solitude even extended to the volcan 
where the ladies were resting for lack of admirers although they had lowered their price from ten sous to five in view of the hard times a deep mourning was breaking the heart of the entire country by god exclaimed Wilde Désert, slapping her thighs with both hands it's the fault of the gendarmes let them run me in devil take them if they like but i must plague them for her all authorities and masters were gendarmes it was a term of general contempt in which she enveloped all enemies of the people she had greeted etienne's request with transport her whole house belonged to the miners she would lend her ballroom gratuitously and would herself issue the invitation since the law required it besides if the law was not pleased so much the better she would give them a bit of her mind since yesterday the young man had brought her some fifty letters to sign he had them copied by neighbors in the settlement who knew how to write and these letters were sent around among the pits to delegates and to men of whom they were sure the avowed order of the day was a discussion regarding the continuation of the strike but in reality they were expecting pluchart and reckoning on a discourse from him which would cause a general adhesion to the international on thursday morning etienne was disquieted by the non-appearance of his old foreman who had promised by letter to arrive on wednesday evening what then was happening he was annoyed that he would not be able to come to an understanding with him before the meeting at nine o'clock he went to Monceau with the idea that the mechanic had perhaps gone there direct without stopping at the Voreau. no i have not seen your friend replied widow Desire, but everything is ready come and see she led him into the ballroom the decorations were the same the garlands which supported at the ceiling a crown of painted paper flowers and the gilt cardboard shields in a line along the wall with the names of saints male and female only the musician's platform had been replaced by a table and three chairs in one corner and the room was furnished with forms ranged along the floor it's perfect etienne declared and you know said the widow that you're at home here yell as much as you like the gendarmes will have to pass over my body if they do come in spite of his anxiety he could not help smiling when he looked at her so vast did she appear with a pair of breasts so huge that one alone would require a man to embrace it which now led to the saying that of her six weekday lovers she had to take two every evening on account of the work but etienne was astonished to see rasseneur and savarine enter and as the widow left them all three in the large empty hall he exclaimed what you here already savarine who had worked all night at the bureau the engine men not being on strike had merely come out of curiosity as to rasseneur he had seemed constrained during the last two days and his fat round face had lost its good-natured laugh Luchard has not arrived and i am very anxious added etienne the innkeeper turned away his eyes and replied between his teeth i am not surprised i don't expect him what then he made up his mind and looking the other man in the face bravely i too have sent him a letter if you want me to tell you and in that letter i have begged him not to come yes i think we ought to manage our own affairs ourselves without turning to strangers etienne losing his self-possession and trembling with anger turned his eyes on his mates and stammered you've done that you've done that i have done that certainly and you know that i trust Blachard. he's a knowing fellow and reliable one can get on with him but you see i don't care a damn for your ideas i don't politics government and all that i don't care a damn for it what i want is for the miner to be better treated i have worked down below for twenty years i've sweated down there with fatigue and misery and i've sworn to make it easier for the poor beggars who are there still and i know well enough you'll never get anything with all your ideas you'll only make the men's fate more miserable still when they are forced by hunger to go down again they will be more crushed than ever the company will pay them with strokes of the stick 
like a runaway dog who was brought back to his kennel that's what i want to prevent do you see he raised his voice protruding his belly and squarely planted on his big legs the man's whole patient reasonable nature was revealed in clear phrases which flowed abundantly without an effort was it not absurd to believe that with one stroke one could change the world putting the workers in the place of the masters and dividing gold as one divides an apple it would perhaps take thousands and thousands of years for that to be realized there hold your tongue with your miracles the most sensible plan was if one did not wish to break one's nose to go straight forward to demand possible reforms in short to improve the lot of the workers on every occasion he did his best so far as he occupied himself with it to bring the company to better terms if not damn it all they would only starve by being obstinate etienne had let him speak his own speech cut short by indignation then he cried haven't you got any blood in your veins by god at one moment he would have struck him and to resist the temptation he rushed about the hall with long strides venting his fury on the benches through which he made a passage shut the door at all events souverain remarked there is no need to be heard having himself gone to shut it he quietly sat down in one of the office chairs he had rolled a cigarette and was looking at the other two men with his mild subtle eye his lips drawn by a slight smile you won't get any farther by being angry said rasseneur judiciously i believed at first that you had good sense it was sensible to recommend calmness to the mates to force them to keep indoors and to use your power to maintain order and now you want to get them into a mess at each turn in his walks among the benches etienne returned towards the innkeeper seizing him by the shoulders shaking him and shouting out his replies in his face but blast it all i mean to be calm yes i have imposed order on them yes i do advise them still not to stir only it doesn't do to be made a joke of after all you are lucky to remain cool now there are hours when i feel that i am losing my head this was a confession on his part he railed at his illusions of a novice his religious dream of a city in which justice would soon reign among the men who had become brothers a fine method truly to cross one's arms and wait if one wished to see a man eating each other to the end of the world like wolves no one must interfere or injustice would be eternal and the rich would forever suck the blood of the poor therefore he could not forgive himself the stupidity of having said formally that politics ought to be banished from the social question he knew nothing then now he had read and studied his ideas were right and he boasted that he had a system he explained it badly however in confused phrases which contained a little of all the theories he had successively passed through and abandoned at the summit karl marx's idea remained standing capital was the result of spoliation it was the duty and the privilege of labor to reconquer that stolen wealth in practice he had at first with proton been captured by the chimera of a mutual credit a vast bank of exchange which suppressed middlemen then la salle's cooperative societies endowed by the state gradually transforming the earth into a single industrial town had aroused his enthusiasm until he grew disgusted in face of the difficulty of controlling them and he had arrived recently at collectivism demanding that all the instruments of production should be restored to the community but this remained vague he knew not how to realize this new dream still hindered by scruples of reason and good sense not daring to risk the secretary's absolute affirmations he simply said that it was a question of getting possession of the government first of all afterwards they would see but what has taken you why are you going over to the bourgeois he continued violently again planting himself before the innkeeper you said yourself it would have to burst up rasseneur blushed slightly yes i said so and if it does burst up you will see that i am no more of a coward than anyone else 
only i refuse to be among those who increase the mess in order to fish out a position for themselves etienne blushed in his turn the two men no longer shouted having become bitter and spiteful conquered by the coldness of their rivalry it was at bottom that which always strained systems making one man revolutionary in the extreme pushing the other to an affectation of prudence carrying them in spite of themselves beyond their true ideas into those fatal parts which men do not choose for themselves and souverain who was listening exhibited on his pale girlish face a silent contempt the crushing contempt of the man who was willing to yield his life in obscurity without even gaining the splendour of martyrdom then it's to me that you're saying that asked etienne you're jealous jealous of what replied rasseneur i don't pose as a big man i'm not trying to create a section at monceau for the sake of being made secretary the other man wanted to interrupt him but he added why don't you be frank you don't care a damn for the international you're only burning to be at our head the gentleman who corresponds with the famous federal council of the nord there was silence at the end replied quivering good i don't think i have anything to reproach myself with i always asked your advice for i knew that you had fought here long before me but since you can't endure any one by your side i'll act alone in future and first i warn you that the meeting will take place even if pluchart does not come and the mates will join in spite of you oh join muttered the innkeeper that's not enough you'll have to get them to pay their subscriptions not at all the international grants time to workers on strike it will at once come to our help and we shall pay later on rasseneur was carried beyond himself well we shall see i belong to this meeting of yours and i shall speak i shall not let you turn our friends heads i shall let them know where their real interests lie we shall see whom they mean to follow me whom they have known for thirty years or you who have turned everything upside down among us in less than a year no no damn it all we shall see which of us is going to crush the other and he went out banging the door the garlands of flowers swayed from the ceiling and the gilt shields jumped against the walls then the great room fell back into its heavy calm Souverain was smoking in his quiet way seated before the table after having paced for a moment in silence etienne began to relieve his feelings at length was it his fault if they had left that fat lazy fellow to come to him and he defended himself from having popularity he knew not even how it had happened this friendliness of the settlement the confidence of the miners the power which he now had over them he was indignant at being accused of wishing to bring everything to confusion out of ambition he struck his chest protesting his brotherly feelings suddenly he stopped before souverain and exclaimed do you know if i thought i should cost a drop of blood to a friend i would go off at once to america the engine man shrugged his shoulders and a smile again came on his lips oh blood he murmured what does that matter the earth has need of it etienne grown calm took a chair and put his elbows on the other side of the table this fair face with the dreamy eyes which sometimes grew savage with the red light disturbed him and exercised a singular power over his will in spite of his comrade's silence conquered even by that silence he felt himself gradually absorbed well he asked what would you do in my place am i not right to act as i do isn't it best for us to join this association souverain after having slowly ejected a jet of smoke replied by his favourite word oh foolery but meanwhile it's always so besides their international will soon begin to move it has taken it up who then he he had pronounced this word in a whisper with religious fervour casting a glance towards the east he was speaking of the master bakunin the destroyer he alone can give the thunderclap 
he went on while your learned men with their evolution are mere cowards before three years are past the international under his orders will crush the old world etienne pricked up his ears in attention he was burning to gain knowledge to understand this worship of destruction regarding which the engine man only uttered occasional obscure words as though he kept certain mysteries to himself well but explain to me what is your aim to destroy everything no more nations no more governments no more property no more god no worship i quite understand only what will that lead you to to the primitive formless commune to a new world to the renewal of everything and the means of execution how do you reckon to set about it by fire by poison by the dagger the brigand is the true hero the popular avenger the revolutionary in action with no phrases drawn out of books we need a series of tremendous outrages to frighten the powerful and to arouse the people as he talked souverain grew terrible an ecstasy raised him on his chair a mystic flame darted from his pale eyes and his delicate hands gripped the edge of the table almost to breaking the other man looked at him in fear and thought of the stories of which he had received vague intimation of mines charged beneath the czar's palace of chiefs of police struck down by knives like wild boars of his mistress the only woman he had loved hanged at moscow one rainy morning while in the crowd he kissed her with his eyes for the last time no no murmured etienne as with a gesture he pushed away these abominable visions we haven't got to that yet over here murder and fire never it is monstrous unjust all the mates would rise and strangle the guilty one and besides he could not understand the instincts of his race refused to accept this sombre dream of the extermination of the world mown level like a rye field then what would they do afterwards how would the nation spring up again he demanded a reply tell me your program we like to know where we are going to then souverain concluded peacefully with his gaze fixed on space all reasoning about the future is criminal because it prevents pure destruction and interferes with the progress of revolution this made etienne laugh in spite of the cold shiver which passed over his flesh besides he willingly acknowledged that there was something in these ideas which attracted him by their fearful simplicity only it would be playing into rasmus's hands if he were to repeat such things to his comrades it was necessary to be practical widow Dessir proposed that they should have lunch they agreed and went into the inn parlour which was separated from the ballroom on weekdays by a movable partition when they had finished their omelette and cheese the engine man proposed to depart and as the other tried to detain him what for to listen to you talking useless foolery i've seen enough of it good day he went on in his gentle obstinate way with a cigarette between his lips etienne's anxiety increased it was one o'clock and pluchart was decidedly breaking his promise towards half-past one the delegates began to appear and he had to receive them for he wished to see who entered for fear that the company might send its usual spies he examined every letter of invitation and took note of those who entered many came in without a letter as they were admitted provided he knew them as two o'clock struck rasseneur entered finishing his pipe at the counter and chatting without haste this provoking calmness still further disturbed etienne all the more as many had come merely for fun zacharie moquet and others these cared little about the strike and found it a great joke to do nothing seated at tables and spending their last two sous on drink they grinned and bantered their mates the serious ones who had come to make fools of themselves another quarter of an hour passed there was impatience in the hall then etienne in despair made a gesture of resolution and he decided to enter when widow Desir, who was putting her head outside exclaimed but here he is your gentleman it was in fact 
he came in a cab drawn by a broken-winded horse he jumped at once on to the pavement a thin insipidly handsome man with a large square head in his black cloth frock coat he had the sunday air of a well-to-do workman for five years he had not done a stroke with the file and he took care of his appearance especially combing his hair in a correct manner vain of his successes on the platform but his limbs were still stiff and the nails of his large hands eaten by the iron had not grown again very active he worked out his ambitions scouring the province unceasingly in order to place his ideas ah don't be angry with me he said anticipating questions and reproaches yesterday lecture at Poulilly in the morning meeting in the evening at valentquet to-day lunch at marchiennes with Salagna. then i had to take a cab i'm worn out you can tell by my voice but that's nothing i shall speak all the same he was on the threshold of the bon joyeux when he bethought himself by jingo i'm forgetting the tickets we should have been in a fine fix he went back to the cab which the cabman drew up again and he pulled out a little black wooden box which he carried off under his arm etienne walked radiantly in his shadow while rasseneur in consternation did not dare to offer his hand but the other was already pressing it and saying a rapid word or two about the letter what a rum idea why not hold this meeting one should always hold a meeting when possible widow Tistier asked if he would take anything but he refused no need he spoke without drinking only he was in a hurry because in the evening he reckoned on pushing as far as Oiselle, where he wished to come to an understanding with les Gaujol. then they all entered the ballroom together maheu and levaque who had arrived late followed them the door was then locked in order to be in privacy this made the jokers laugh even more zacharie shouting to moquet that perhaps they were going to get them all with child in there about a hundred miners were waiting on the benches in the close air of the room with the warm odors of the blast bell rising from the floor whispers ran round and all heads turned while the newcomers sat down in the empty places they gazed at the little gentleman and the black frock coat caused a certain surprise and discomfort but on etienne's proposition the meeting was at once constituted he gave out the names while the others approved by lifting their hands pluchart was nominated chairman and maheu and etienne himself were voted stewards there was a movement of chairs and the officers were installed for a moment they watched the chairman disappear beneath the table under which he slid the box which he had not let go when he reappeared he struck lightly with his fist to call for attention then he began in a hoarse voice citizens a little door opened and he had to stop it was widow Desir, who coming round by the kitchen brought in six glasses on a tray don't put yourselves out she said when one talks one gets thirsty Maheu relieved her of the tray, and Pluchart was able to go on. He said how very touched he was at his reception by the Monceau workers. He excused himself for his delay, mentioning his fatigue and his sore throat. Then he gave place to citizen Rasseneur, who wished to speak. Rasseneur had already planted himself beside the table near the glasses. The back of a chair served him as a rostrum. He seemed very moved and coughed before starting in a loud voice mates what gave him his influence over the workers at the pit was the facility of his speech the good-natured way in which he could go on talking to them by the hour without ever growing weary he never ventured to gesticulate but stood stolid and smiling drowning them and dazing them until they all shouted yes yes that's true enough you're right however on this day from the first word he felt that there was a sullen opposition this made him advance prudently he only discussed the continuation of the strike and waited for applause before attacking the international certainly honour prevented them from yielding to the company's demands but how much misery what a terrible future if it was necessary to persist much longer and without declaring for submission he damped their courage he showed them the settlements dying of hunger he asked on 
what resources the partisans of resistance were counting three or four friends tried to applaud him but this accentuated the cold silence of the majority and the gradually rising dis disapprobation which greeted his phrases then despairing of winning them over he was carried away by anger he foretold misfortune if they allowed their heads to be turned at the instigation of strangers two-thirds of the audience had risen indignantly trying to silence him since he insulted them by treating them like children unable to act for themselves but he went on speaking in spite of the tumult taking repeated gulps of beer and shouting violently that the man was not born who would prevent him from doing his duty pluchard had risen as he had no bell he struck his fist on the table repeating in his hoarse voice citizens citizens at last he obtained a little quiet and the meeting when consulted brought rasseneur's speech to an end the delegates who had represented the pits in the interview with the manager led the others all enraged by starvation and agitated by new ideas the voting was decided in advance you don't care a damn you don't you can eat yelled Bavac, thrusting out his fist at rasseneur at the end leaned over behind the chairman's back to appease maheu who was very red and carried out of himself by this hypocritical discourse citizens said pluchard allow me to speak there was deep silence he spoke his voice sounded painful and hoarse but he was used to it on his journeys and took his laryngitis about with him like his program gradually his voice expanded and he produced pathetic effects with it with open arms and accompanying his periods with a swaying of his shoulders he had an eloquence which recalled the pulpit a religious fashion of sinking the ends of his sentences whose monotonous roll at last carried conviction his discourse centred on the greatness and the advantages of the international it was that with which he always started in every new locality he explained its aim the emancipation of the workers he showed its imposing structure below the commune higher the province still higher the nation and at the summit humanity his arms moved slowly piling up the stages preparing the immense cathedral of the future world then there was the internal administration he read the statutes spoke of the congresses pointed out the growing importance of the work the enlargement of the program which starting from the discussion of wages was now working towards a social liquidation to have done with the wage system no more nationalities the workers of the whole world would be united by a common need for justice sweeping away the middle-class corruption founding at last a free society in which he who did not work should not reap he roared his breath startled the flowers of painted paper beneath the low smoky ceiling which sent back the sound of his voice a wave passed through the audience some of them cried that's it we're with you he went on the world would be conquered before three years and he enumerated the nations already conquered from all sides adhesions were reigning in never had a young religion counted so many disciples then when they had the upper hand they would dictate terms to the masters who in their turn would have a fist at their throats yes yes they'll have to go down with a gesture he enforced silence now he was entering on the strike question in principle he disapproved of strikes it was a slow method which aggravated the sufferings of the worker but before better things arrived and when they were inevitable one must make up one's mind to them for they had the advantage of disorganizing capital and in this case he showed the international as providence for strikers and quoted examples in paris during the strike of the bronze workers the masters had granted everything at once terrified at the news that the international was sending help in london it had saved the miners at a colliery by sending back at its own expense a shipload of belgians who had been brought over by the coal owner it was sufficient to join and the companies trembled for the men entered the great army of workers who were resolved to die for one another rather than to remain the slaves of a capitalistic society applause interrupted him 
wiped his forehead with his handkerchief at the same time refusing a glass which maheu passed to him when he was about to continue fresh applause cut short his speech it's all right he said rapidly to etienne they've had enough quick the cards he had plunged beneath the table and reappeared with the little black wooden box citizens he shouted dominating the disturbance here are the cards of membership let your delegates come up and i will give them to them to be distributed later on we can arrange everything rasseneur rushed forward and again protested etienne was also agitated having to make a speech extreme confusion followed levaque jumped up with his fists out as if to fight maheu was up and speaking but nobody could distinguish a single word in the growing tumult the dust rose from the floor a floating dust of former balls poisoning the air with a strong odour of putters and trammers suddenly the little door opened and widow Desir filled it with her belly and breast shouting in a thundering voice for god's sake silence the gendarmes it was the commissioner of the district who had arrived rather late to prepare a report and to break up the meeting four gendarmes accompanied him for five minutes the widow had delayed them at the door replying that she was at home and that she had a perfect right to entertain her friends but they had hustled her away and she had rushed in to warn her children must clear out through here she said again there's a dirty gendarme guarding the court it doesn't matter my little wood house opens into the alley quick then the commissioner was already knocking with his fists and as the door was not opened he threatened to force it a spy must have talked for he cried that the meeting was illegal a large number of miners being there without any letter of invitation in the hall the trouble was growing they could not escape thus they had not even voted either for adhesion or for the continuation of the strike all persisted in talking at the same time at last the chairman suggested a vote by acclamation arms were raised and the delegates declared hastily that they would join in the name of their absent mates and it was thus that the ten thousand colliers of monceau became members of the internationale meanwhile the retreat began in order to cover it widow Desir had propped herself up against the door which the buttings of the gendarmes muskets were forcing at her back the miners jumped over the benches and escaped one by one through the kitchen and the wood-yard rasseneur disappeared among the first and levaque followed him forgetful of his abuse and planning how he could get an offer of a glass to pull himself together etienne after having seized the little box waited for pluchard and maheu who considered it a point of honour to emerge last as they disappeared the lock gave and the commissioner found himself in the presence of the widow whose breast and belly still formed a barricade it doesn't help you much to smash everything in my house she said you can see there's nobody here the commissioner a slow man who did not care for scenes simply threatened to take her off to prison and he then went away with his four gendarmes to prepare a report beneath the jeers of zacharie and moquet who were full of admiration for the way in which their mates had humbugged this armed force for which they themselves did not care a hang in the alley outside etienne embarrassed by the box was rushing along followed by the others he suddenly thought of perron and asked why he had not turned up maheu also running replied that he was ill a convenient illness the fear of compromising himself they wished to retain pluchart but without stopping he declared that he must set out at once for Oiselle, where le Gaujou was awaiting orders then as they ran they shouted out to him their wishes for a pleasant journey and rushed through monceau with their heels in the air a few words were exchanged broken by the panting of their chests etienne and maheu were laughing confidently henceforth certain of victory when the international had sent help it would be the company that would beg them to resume work and in this burst of hope in this gallop of big boots sounding over the pavement of the streets there was something else also something sombre and fierce a gust of violence which would inflame the settlements in the four corners of the country End of section twenty
Section twenty one of Germanon by Emile Zola, translated by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Berard. Part four. Chapter five. Another fortnight had passed by. It was the beginning of January, and cold mists benumbed the immense plain the misery had grown still greater and the settlements were in agony from hour to hour beneath the increasing famine four thousand francs sent by the international from london had scarcely supplied bread for three days and then nothing had come this great dead hope was beating down their courage on what were they to count now since even their brothers had abandoned them they felt themselves separated from the world and lost in the midst of this deep winter on tuesday no resources were left in the dosson quarant settlement etienne and the delegates had multiplied their energies new subscriptions were opened in the neighboring towns and even in paris collections were made and lectures organized these efforts came to nothing public opinion which had at first been moved grew indifferent now that the strike dragged on for ever and so quietly without any dramatic incidents small charities scarcely sufficed to maintain the poorer families the others lived by pawning their clothes and selling up the household piece by piece everything went to the brokers the wool of the mattresses the kitchen utensils even the furniture for a moment they thought themselves saved for the small retail shopkeepers of monceau killed out by Maigret, had offered credit to try and get back their custom and for a week Bardon, the grocer and the two bakers carol and smelton kept open shop but when their advances were exhausted all three stopped the bailiffs were rejoicing there only resulted a piling up of debts which would for a long time weigh upon the miners there was no more credit to be had anywhere and not an old saucepan to sell they might lie down in a corner to die like mangy dogs etienne would have sold his flesh he had given up his salary and had gone to marchand's to pawn his trousers and cloth coat happy to set the maheu's pot boiling once more his boots alone remained and he retained these to keep a firm foothold he said his grief was that the strike had come on too early before the provident fund had had time to swell he regarded this as the only cause of the disaster for the workers would surely triumph over the masters on the day when they had saved enough money to resist and he recalled souverain's words accusing the company of pushing forward the strike to destroy the fund at the beginning the sight of the settlement and of these poor people without bread or fire overcame him he preferred to go out and to weary himself with distant walks one evening as he was coming back and passing near Requillard, he perceived an old woman who had fainted by the roadside no doubt she was dying of hunger and having raised her he began to shout to a girl whom he saw on the other side of the paling why is it you he said recognizing moquette come and help me then we must give her something to drink moquette moved to tears quickly went into the shaky hovel which her father had set up in the midst of the ruins she came back at once with gin and a loaf the gin revived the old woman who without speaking bit greedily into the bread she was the mother of a miner who lived at a settlement on the Cogni side and she had fallen there on returning from Guazelle, where she had in vain attempted to borrow half a franc from a sister when she had eaten she went away dazed at the end stood in the open field of Requillard, where the crumbling sheds were disappearing beneath the brambles well won't you come in and drink a little glass asked moquette merrily and as he hesitated then you're still afraid of me he followed her won by her laughter the spread which she had given so willingly moved him she would not take him into her father's room but led him into her own room where she at once poured out two little glasses of gin the room was very neat and he complimented her on it besides the family seemed to want for nothing the father continued his duties as a groom at the Verreaux, while she saying that she could not live with folded arms had become a laundress which brought her in thirty sous a day 
one may amuse oneself with men but one isn't lazy for all that i say she murmured all at once coming and putting her arms round him prettily why don't you like me he could not help laughing she had done this in so charming a way but i like you very much he replied no no not like i mean you know that i am dying of longing come it would give me so much pleasure it was true she had desired him for six months he still looked at her as she clung to him pressing him with her two tremulous arms her face raised with such supplicating love that he was deeply moved there was nothing beautiful in her large round face with its yellow complexion eaten by the coal but her eyes shone with flame a charm rose from her skin a trembling of desire which made her rosy and young in face of this gift which was so humble and so ardent he no longer dared to refuse oh you are willing she stammered delighted oh you are willing and she gave herself up with the fainting awkwardness of aversion as if it was for the first time and she had never before known a man then when he left her it was she who was overcome with gratitude she thanked him and kissed his hands etienne remained rather ashamed of this good fortune nobody boasted of having had moquette as he went away he swore that it should not occur again but he preserved a friendly remembrance of her she was a capital girl when he got back to the settlement he found serious news which made him forget the adventure the rumour was circulating that the company would perhaps agree to make a concession if the delegates made a fresh attempt with the manager at all events some captains had spread this rumour the truth was that in this struggle the mine was suffering even more than the miners on both sides obstinacy was piling up ruin while labour was dying of hunger capital was being destroyed every day of rest carried away hundreds of thousands of francs every machine which stops is a dead machine tools and material are impaired the money that is sunk melts away like water drunk by the sand since a small stock of coal at the surface of the pits was exhausted customers talked of going to belgium so that in future they would be threatened from that quarter but what especially frightened the company although the matter was carefully concealed was the increasing damage to the galleries and workings the captains could not cope with the repairs the timber was falling everywhere and landslips were constantly taking place soon the disasters became so serious that long months would be needed for repairs before hewing could be resumed already stories were going about the country at Cre quote three hundred metres of road had subsided in a mass stopping up access to the saint pomme at madeleine the maugretot scene was crumbling away and filling with water the management refused to admit this but suddenly two accidents one after the other had forced them to avow it one morning near Pialet, the ground was found cracked above the north gallery of miro which had fallen in the day before and on the following day the ground subsided within the Voreux, shaking a corner of a suburb to such an extent that two houses nearly disappeared etienne and the delegates hesitated to risk any steps without knowing the director's intentions then sir whom they questioned avoided replying certainly the misunderstanding was deplored and everything would be done to bring about an agreement but he could say nothing definitely at last they decided that they would go to m hennebeau in order to have reason on their side for they did not wish to be accused later on of having refused the company an opportunity of acknowledging that it had been in the wrong only they vowed to yield nothing and to maintain in spite of everything their terms which were alone just the interview took place on tuesday morning when the settlement was sinking into desperate wretchedness it was less cordial than the first interview maheu was still the speaker and he explained that their mates had sent them to ask if these gentlemen had anything new to say at first m hennebeau affected surprise no order had reached him nothing could be changed so long as the miners persisted in their detestable rebellion and this official stiffness produced the worst effects 
so that if the delegates had gone out of their way to offer a conciliation the way in which they were received would only have served to make them more obstinate afterwards the manager tried to seek a basis of mutual concession thus if the men would accept the separate payment for timbering the company would raise that payment by the two centimes which they were accused of profiting by besides he added that he would take the offer on himself that nothing was settled but that he flattered himself he could obtain this concession from paris but the delegates refused and repeated their demands the retention of the old system with a rise of five centimes a tram then he acknowledged that he could treat with them at once and urged them to accept in the name of their wives and little ones dying of hunger and with eyes on the ground and stiff heads they said no always no with fierce vigour they separated curtly m hennebeau banged the doors etienne maheu and the others went off stamping with their great heels on the pavement in the mute rage of the vanquished pushed to extremes towards two o'clock the women of the settlement on their side made an application to maigrat there was only this hope left to bend this man and to wrench from him another week's credit the idea originated with maheude who often counted too much on people's good nature she persuaded the brule and the levaque to accompany her as to piron she excused herself saying that she could not leave piron whose illness still continued other women joined the band till they numbered quite twenty when the inhabitants of montsou saw them arrive gloomy and wretched occupying the whole width of the road they shook their heads anxiously doors were closed and one lady hid her plate it was the first time they had been seen thus and there could not be a worse sign usually everything was going to ruin when the women thus took to the roads at maigrat there was a violent scene at first he had made them go jeering and pretending to believe that they had come to pay their debts that was nice of them to have agreed to come and bring the money all at once then as soon as maheude began to speak he pretended to be enraged were they making fun of people more credit then they wanted to turn him into the street no not a single potato not a single crumb of bread and he told them to be off to the grocer Verdun, and to the bakers carol and smelton since they now dealt with them the women listened with timid humility apologizing and watching his eyes to see if he would relent he began to joke offering his shot to the brule if she would have him as a lover they were all so cowardly that they laughed at this and the levaque improved on it declaring that she was willing she was but he at once became abusive and pushed them towards the door as they insisted suppliantly he treated one brutally the others on the pavement shouted that he had sold himself to the company while maheude with her arms in the air in a burst of avenging indignation cried out for his death exclaiming that such a man did not deserve to eat the return to the settlement was melancholy when the women came back with empty hands the men looked at them and then lowered their heads there was nothing more to be done the day would end without a spoonful of soup and the other days extended in an icy shadow without a ray of hope they had made up their minds to it and no one spoke of surrender the success of misery made them still more obstinate mute as tracked beasts resolved to die at the bottom of their hole rather than come out who would dare to be first to speak of submission they had sworn with their mates to hold together and hold together they would as they had held together at the pit when one of them was beneath a landslip it was as it ought to be it was a good school for resignation down there they might well tighten their belts for a week when they had been swallowing fire and water ever since they were twelve years of age and their devotion was thus augmented by the pride of soldiers of men proud of their profession who in their daily struggle with death had gained a pride in sacrifice with the mahirs it was a terrible evening they were all silent seated before the dying fire in which the last cinders were smoking after 
having emptied the mattresses handful by handful they had decided the day before to sell the clock for three francs and the room seemed bare and dead now that the familiar tic-tac no longer filled it with sound the only object of luxury now in the middle of the sideboard was the rose cardboard box an old present from maheu which maheu treasured like a jewel the two good chairs had gone father bonnemort and the children were squeezed together on an old mossy bench brought in from the garden and the livid twilight now coming on seemed to increase the cold what's to be done repeated maheude crouching down in the corner by the oven etienne stood up looking at the portraits of the emperor and empress stuck against the wall he would have torn them down long since if the family had not preserved them for ornament so he murmured with clenched teeth and to think that we can't get two sous out of these damned idiots who are watching us starve if i were to take the box said the woman very pale after some hesitation maheu seated on the edge of the table with his legs dangling and his head on his chest sat up no i won't have it maheu painfully rose and walked around the room good god was it possible that they were reduced to such misery the cupboard without a crumb nothing more to sell no notion where to get a loaf and the fire which was nearly out she became angry with alzire whom she had sent in the morning to glean on the pit bank and who had come back with empty hands saying that the company would not allow gleaning did it matter a hang what the company wanted as if they were robbing any one by picking up the bits of lost coal the little girl in despair told how a man had threatened to hit her then she promised to go back next day even if she was beaten and that imp jean lin cried the mother where is he now i should like to know he ought to have brought the salad we can browse on that like beasts at all events you will see he won't come back yesterday too he slept out i don't know what he's up to the rascal always looks as though his belly were full perhaps said etienne he picks up some sous on the road she suddenly lifted both fists furiously if i knew that my children beg i'd rather kill them and myself too maheu had again sunk down on the edge of the table lenore and henri astonished that they had nothing to eat began to moan while old bonnemort in silence philosophically rolled his tongue in his mouth to deceive his hunger no one spoke any more all were becoming benumbed beneath this aggravation of their evils the grandfather coughing and spitting out the black phlegm taken again by rheumatism which was turning to dropsy the father asthmatic and with knees swollen with water the mother and the little ones scarred by scrofula and hereditary anemia no doubt their work made this inevitable they only complained when the lack of food killed them off and already they were falling like flies in the settlement but something must be found for supper my god where was it to be found what was to be done then in the twilight which made the room more and more gloomy with its dark melancholy etienne who had been hesitating for a moment at last decided with aching heart wait for me he said i'll go and see somewhere and he went out the idea of moquette had occurred to him she would certainly have a loaf and would give it willingly it annoyed him to be thus forced to return to Requillard. this girl would kiss his hands with her air of an amorous servant but one did not leave one's friends in trouble he would still be kind with her if need be i will go and look round too said maheu in her turn it's too stupid she reopened the door after the young man and closed it violently leaving the others motionless and mute in the faint light of a candle end which alzire had just lighted outside she stopped and thought for a moment then she entered the levaque's house tell me i lent you a loaf the other day could you give it me back but she stopped herself what she saw was far from encouraging the house spoke of misery even more than her own the levaque woman with fixed eyes was gazing into her burnt-out fire while levaque made drunk on his empty stomach by some nail-makers was sleeping on the table with his back to the wall bouteloup was mechanically rubbing his shoulders with the amazement of a good-natured fellow 
who has eaten up his savings and is astonished at having to tighten his belt a loaf ah my dear replied the levaque woman i wanted to borrow another from you then as her husband groaned with pain in his sleep she pushed his face against the table hold your row bloody beast so much the better if it burns your guts instead of getting people to pay for your drinks you ought to have asked twenty sous from a friend she went on relieving herself by swearing in the midst of this dirty household already abandoned so long that an unbearable smell was exhaling from the floor everything might smash up she didn't care a hang her son that rascal Bevere, had also disappeared since morning and she shouted that it would be a good riddance if he never came back then she said that she would go to bed at least she could get warm she hustled bottle come along up we go the fire's out no need to light the candle to see the empty plates well are you coming louis i tell you that we must go to bed we can cuddle up together there that's a comfort and let this damned drunkard die here of cold by himself when she found herself outside again maheude struck resolutely across the gardens towards perron's house she heard laughter as she knocked there was sudden silence it was a full minute before the door was opened what is it you exclaimed perron with affected surprise i thought it was the doctor without allowing her to speak she went on pointing to perron who was seated before a large coal fire ah he makes no progress he makes no progress at all his face looks all right it's in his belly that it takes him then he must have warmth we burn all that we've got perron in fact looked very well his complexion was good and his flesh fat it was in vain that he breathed hard in order to play the sick man besides as maheu came in she perceived a strong smell of rabbit they had certainly put the dish out of the way there were crumbs strewed over the table and in the very midst she saw a forgotten bottle of wine mother has gone to Monceau to try and get a loaf said perron again we are cooling our heels waiting for her but her voice choked she had followed her neighbor's glance and her eyes also fell on the bottle immediately she began again and narrated the story yes it was wine the peel and people had brought her that bottle for her man who had been ordered by the doctor to take claret and her thankfulness poured forth in a stream what good people they were the young lady especially she was not proud going into workpeople's houses and distributing her charities herself i see said maheude i know them her heart ached at the idea that the good things always go to the least poor it was always so and these peeline people had carried water to the river why had she not seen them in the settlement perhaps all the same she might have got something out of them i came she confessed at last to know if there was more going with you than with us have you just a little vermicelli by way of loan Perron expressed her grief noisily nothing at all my dear not what you can call a grain of semolina if mother hasn't come back it's because she hasn't succeeded we must go to bed supperless at this moment crying was heard from the cellar and she grew angry and struck her fist against the door it was that gadabout lydie whom she had shut up she said to punish her for not having returned until five o'clock after having been roaming about the whole day one could no longer keep her in order she was constantly disappearing maheude however remained standing she could not make up her mind to leave the slurged fire filled her with a painful sensation of comfort the thought that they were eating there enlarged the void in her stomach evidently they had sent away the old woman and shut up the child to blow themselves out with their rabbit ah whatever people might say when a woman behaved ill that brought luck to her house good night she said suddenly outside night had come on and the moon beyond the clouds was lighting up the earth with a dubious glow instead of traversing the gardens again maheude went round despairing afraid to go home again but along the dead frontages all the doors smelled of famine and sounded hollow what was the good of knocking there was wretchedness everywhere for weeks since they had had nothing to eat even the odour of onion had gone 
that strong odour which revealed the settlement from afar across the country now there was nothing but the smell of old vaults the dampness of holes in which nothing lives vague sounds were dying out stifled tears lost oaths and in the silence which slowly grew heavier one could hear the sleep of hunger coming on the collapse of bodies thrown across beds and the nightmares of empty bellies as she passed before the church she saw a shadow slip rapidly by a gleam of hope made her hasten for she had recognized the Mousseau priest abbe joueur who said mass on sundays at the settlement chapel no doubt he had just come out of the sacristy where he had been called to settle some affair with a rounded back he moved quickly on a fat meek man anxious to live at peace with everybody if he had come at night it must have been in order not to compromise himself among the miners it was said too that he had just obtained promotion he had even been seen walking about with his successor a lean man with eyes like live coals sir sir stammered maheu but he would not stop good night good night my good woman she found herself before her own door her legs would no longer carry her and she went in no one had stirred maheu still sat dejected on the edge of the table old bonmort and the little ones were huddled together on the bench for the sake of warmth and they had not said a word and the candle had burnt so low that even light would soon fail them at the sound of the door the children turned their heads seeing that their mother brought nothing back they looked down on the ground again repressing the longing to cry for fear of being scolded maheude fell back into her place near the dying fire they asked her no questions and the silence continued all had understood and they thought it useless to weary themselves more by talking they were now waiting despairing and without courage in the last expectation that perhaps etienne would unearth help somewhere the minutes went by and at last they no longer reckoned on this when etienne reappeared he held a cloth containing a dozen potatoes cooked but cold that's all that i have found he said with moquette also bread was wanting it was her dinner which she had forced him to take in this cloth kissing him with all her heart thanks he said to maheu who offered him his share i've eaten over there it was not true and he gloomily watched the children throw themselves on the food the father and mother also restrained themselves in order to leave more but the old man greedily swallowed everything they had to take a potato away from him for alzire then at the end said that he had heard news the company irritated by the obstinacy of the strikers talked of giving back their certificates to the compromised miners certainly the company was for war and a more serious rumour circulated they boasted of having persuaded a large number of men to go down again on the next day the victoire and the foutre cantel would be complete even at madeleine and miro there would be a third of the men the maheus were furious by god shouted the father if there are traitors we must settle their account and standing up yielding to the fury of his suffering to-morrow evening to the forest since they won't let us come to an understanding at the bon joyeux we can be at home in the forest this cry had aroused old bonnard who had grown drowsy after his gluttony it was the old rallying cry the rendezvous where the miners of old days used to plot their resistance to the king's soldiers yes yes to van damme i'm with you if you go there maheude made an energetic gesture we will all go that will finish these injustices and treacheries at the end decided that the rendezvous should be announced to all the settlements for the following evening but the fire was dead as with the levaques and the candle suddenly went out there was no more coal and no more oil they had to feel their way to bed in the intense cold which contracted the skin the little ones were crying End of section twenty one section twenty two of germinal by emile zola translation by havelock ellis 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part Four, Chapter Six. Jean Lin was now well and able to walk, but his legs had united so badly that he limped on both the right and left sides and moved with the gait of a duck though running it as fast as formerly with the skill of a mischievous and thieving animal on this evening in the dusk on the Requillard road jeanlin accompanied by his inseparable friends bebert and lady was on the watch he had taken ambush in a vacant space behind a paling opposite an obscure grocery shop situated at the corner of a lane an old woman who was nearly blind displayed there three or four sacks of lentils and haricots black with dust and it was an ancient dried codfish hanging by the door and stained with fly blows to which his eyes were directed twice already he had sent bebert to unhook it but each time someone had appeared at a bend in the road always intruders in the way one could not attend to one's affairs a gentleman went by on horseback and the children flattened themselves at the bottom of the paling where they recognized monsieur hombeau since the strike he was often thus seen along the roads riding alone amid the rebellious settlements ascertaining with quiet courage the condition of the country and never had a stone whistled by his ears he only met men who were silent and slow to salute him most often he came upon lovers who cared nothing for politics and took their fill of pleasure in holes and corners he passed by in his trotting mare with head directed straight forward so as to disturb nobody while his heart was swelling with an unappeased desire amid this gormandizing of free love he distinctly saw these three small rascals the little boys on the little girl in a heap even the youngsters were already amusing themselves in their misery his eyes grew moist and he disappeared sitting stiffly on his saddle with his frock coat buttoned up in a military manner damned luck said jeanlin this will never finish go on bebert hang on to its tail but two men once more appeared and the child again stifled an oath when he heard the voice of his brother zachary narrating to moquet how he had discovered a two-franc piece sewn into one of his wife's petticoats they both grinned with satisfaction slapping each other on the shoulder moquet proposed a game of cross for the next day they would leave the advantage at two o'clock and go to the montoir side near marchand zachary agreed what was the good of bothering over the strike as well amuse oneself since there's nothing to do and they turned the corner of the road when Etienne, who was coming along the canal, stopped them and began to talk. "'Are they going to bed here?' said Jeanlin in exasperation. "'Nearly night. The old woman will be taking in her sacks.' Another miner came down towards the Requillard. Etienne went off with him, and as they passed the paling, the child heard them speak of the forest. They had been obliged to put off the rendezvous to the following day, for fear of not being able to announce it in one day to all the settlements i say he whispered to his two mates the big affair is for to-morrow we'll go eh we can get off in the afternoon and the road being at last free he sent bebert off courage hang on to its tail and look out the old woman's got her broom fortunately the night had grown dark bebert with a leap hung on to the cod so that the string broke he ran away waving it like a kite followed by the two others all three galloping the woman came out of her shop in astonishment without understanding or being able to distinguish this band now lost in the darkness these scoundrels had become the terror of the country they gradually spread themselves over it like a horde of savages at first they had been satisfied with the yard of the voreux tumbling into the stock of coal from which they would emerge looking like negroes playing at hide-and-seek amid the supply of wood in which they lost themselves as in the depths of the virgin forest then they had taken the pit-bank by assault they would seat themselves on it and slide down the bare portions still boiling with interior fires they glided among the briars in the older parts hiding for the whole day occupied in the quiet little games of mischievous mice and they were constantly enlarging their conquests 
scuffling among the piles of bricks until blood came running about the fields and eating without bread all sorts of milky herbs searching the banks of the canals to take fish from the mud and swallow them raw and pushing still farther they travelled for kilometres as far as the thickets of vandam under which they gorged themselves with strawberries in the spring with nuts and bilberries in summer soon the immense plain belonged to them what drove them thus from monceau to marchiennes constantly on the roads with the eyes of young wolves was the growing love of plunder jeanlin remained the captain of these expeditions leading the troop on to all sorts of prey ravaging the onion fields pillaging the orchards attacking shop windows in the country people accused the miners on strike and talked of a vast organized band one day even he had forced lydie to steal from her mother and made her bring him two dozen sticks of barley sugar which perron kept in a bottle on one of the boards in her window and the little girl who was well beaten had not betrayed him because she trembled so before his authority the worst was that he always gave himself the lion's share bevere also had to bring him the booty happy if the captain did not hit him and keep it all for some time john lynn had abused his authority he would beat lydie as one beats one's lawful wife and he profited by bebert's credulity to send him on unpleasant adventures amused at making a fool of this big boy who was stronger than himself and could have knocked him over with a blow of his fist he felt contempt for both of them and treated them as slaves telling them that he had a princess for his mistress and that they were unworthy to appear before her and in fact during the past week he would suddenly disappear at the end of a road or a turning in a path no matter where it might be after having ordered them with a terrible air to go back to the settlement but first he would pocket the booty this was what happened on the present occasion give it up he said snatching the cod from his mate's hands when they stopped all three at a bend in the road near Requillard. bebert protested i want some you know i took it eh what he cried you'll have some if i give you some not to-night sure enough to-morrow if there's any left he pushed lydie and placed both of them in line like soldiers shouldering arms then passing behind them now you must stay there to five minutes without turning by god if you do turn there will be beasts that will eat you up and then you will go straight back and if bebert touches lydie on the way i shall know it and i shall hit you then he disappeared in the shadow so lightly that the sound of his naked feet could not be heard the two children remained motionless for the five minutes without looking round for fear of receiving a blow from the invisible slowly a great affection had grown up between them in their common terror he was always thinking of taking her and pressing her very tight between his arms as he had seen others do and she too would have liked it for it would have been a change for her to be so nicely caressed but neither of them would have allowed themselves to disobey when they went away although the night was very dark they did not even kiss each other they walked side by side tender and despairing certain that if they touched one another the captain would strike them from behind etienne at the same hour had entered Requillard the evening before moquette had begged him to return and he returned ashamed feeling an inclination which he refused to acknowledge for this girl who adored him like a christ it was besides with the intention of breaking it off he would see her he would explain to her that she ought no longer to pursue him on account of the mates it was not a time for pleasure it was dishonest to amuse oneself thus when people were dying of hunger and not having found her at home he had decided to wait and watch the shadows of the passers-by beneath the ruined steeple the old shaft opened half blocked up above the black hole a beam stood erect and with a fragment of roof at the top it had the profile of a gallows in the broken walling of the curbs stood two trees a mountain ash and a plain which seemed to grow from the depths of the earth it was a corner of abandoned wildness the grassy and fibrous entry of a gulf embarrassed with old wood planted with hawthorns and sloe trees which were peopled in the spring by warblers in their nests 
wishing to avoid the great expense of keeping it up the company for the last ten years had proposed to fill up this dead pit but they were waiting to install an air shaft in the Moreau, for the ventilation furnace of the two pits which communicated was placed at the foot of Requillart, of which the former winding shaft served as a conduit they were content to consolidate the tubbing by beams placed across preventing extraction and they had neglected the upper galleries to watch only over the lower gallery in which blazed the furnace the enormous coal fire with so powerful a draught that the rush of air produced the wind of a tempest from one end to the other of the neighboring mine as a precaution in order that they could still go up and down the order had been given to furnish the shaft with ladders only as no one took charge of them the ladders were rotting with dampness and in some places had already given way above a large briar stopped the entry of the passage and as the first ladder had lost some rungs it was necessary in order to reach it to hang on to a root of the mountain ash and then to take one's chance and drop into the blackness etienne was waiting patiently hidden behind a bush when he heard a long rustling among the branches he thought at first that it was the scared flight of a snake but the sudden gleam of the match astonished him and he was stupefied on recognizing john lynn who was lighting a candle and burying himself in the earth he was seized with curiosity and approached the hole the child had disappeared and a faint gleam came from the second ladder etienne hesitated a moment and then let himself go holding on to the roots he thought for a moment that he was about to fall down the whole five hundred and eighty metres of the mine but at last he felt a run and descended gently jeanlin had evidently heard nothing at the end constantly saw the light sinking beneath him while the little one's shadow colossal and disturbing danced with the deformed gait of his distorted limbs he kicked his legs about with the skill of a monkey catching on with hands feet or chin where the rungs were wanting ladders seven metres in length followed one another some still firm others shaky yielding and almost broken the steps were narrow and green so rotten that one seemed to walk in moss and as one went down the heat grew suffocating the heat of an oven proceeding from the air shaft which was fortunately not very active now the strike was on or when the furnace devoured its five thousand kilograms of coal a day one could not have risked oneself here without scorching one's hair what a damned little toad exclaimed etienne in a stifled voice where the devil is he going to twice he had nearly fallen his feet slid on the damp wood if he had only had a candle like the child but he struck himself every minute he was only guided by the vague gleam that fled beneath him he had already reached the twentieth ladder and the descent still continued then he counted them twenty-one twenty-two twenty-three and he still went down and down his head seemed to be swelling with the heat and he thought that he was falling into a furnace at last he reached a landing-place and he saw the candle going off along a gallery thirty ladders that made about two hundred and ten metres is he going to drag me about long he thought he must be going to bury himself in the stable but on the left the path which led to the stable was closed by a landslip the journey began again now more painful and more dangerous frightened bats flew about and clung to the roof of the gallery he had hastened so as not to lose sight of the light only where the child passed with ease with the suppleness of a servant he could not glide through without bruising his limbs this gallery like all the older passages was narrow and grew narrower every day from the constant fall of soil at certain places it was a mere tube which would eventually be effaced in the strangling labour the torn and broken wood became a peril threatening to saw into his flesh or to run him through with the points of splinters sharp as swords he could only advance with precaution on his knees or belly feeling in the darkness before him suddenly a band of rats stamped over him running from his neck to his feet in their galloping flight blast it all haven't we got to the end yet 
he grumbled with aching back and out of breath they were there at the end of a kilometre the tube enlarged they reached a part of the gallery which was admirably preserved it was the end of the old haulage passage cut across the bed like a natural grotto he was obliged to stop he saw the child afar placing his candle between two stones and putting himself at ease with the quiet and relieved air of a man who was glad to be at home again this gallery end was completely changed into a comfortable dwelling in a corner on the ground a pile of hay made a soft couch on some old planks placed like a table there were bread potatoes and bottles of gin already opened it was a real brigand's cavern with booty piled up for weeks even useless booty like soap and blacking stolen for the pleasure of stealing and the child quite alone in the midst of this plunder was enjoying it like a selfish brigand i say then is this how you make fun of people cried etienne when he had breathed for a moment you come and gorge yourself here when we are dying of hunger up above jeanlin astounded was trembling but recognizing the young man he quickly grew calm will you come and dine with me he said at last eh a bit of grilled cod you shall see he had not let go his cod and he began to scrape off the fly blows properly with a fine new knife one of those little dagger knives with bone handles on which mottoes are inscribed this one simply bore the word amour you have a fine knife remarked etienne it's a present from lydie replied jeanlin who neglected to add that lydie had stolen it by his orders from a huckster of monceau stationed before the tete coupe bar then as he still scraped he added proudly isn't it comfortable in my house it's a bit warmer than up above and it feels a lot better etienne had seated himself and was amused in making him talk he was no longer angry he felt interested in this debauched child who was so brave and so industrious in his vices and in fact he tasted a certain comfort in the bottom of this hall the heat was not too great an equal temperature reigned here at all seasons the warmth of the bath while the rough december wind was chapping the skins of the miserable people on the earth as they grew old the galleries became purified with noxious gases all the fire damp had gone and one only smelled now the odour of old fermented wood a subtle ethereal odour as if sharpened with a dash of cloves this wood besides had become curious to look at with a yellowish pallor of marble fringed with whitish thread lace flaky vegetations which seemed to drape it with an embroidery of silk and pearls in other places the timber was bristling with toadstools and there were flights of white butterflies snowy flies and spiders a decolorized population forever ignorant of the sun then you're not afraid asked etienne jeanlin looked at him in astonishment afraid of what i am quite alone but the cod was at last scraped he lighted a little fire of wood brought out the pan and grilled it then he cut a loaf in two it was a terribly salt feast but exquisite all the same for strong stomachs etienne had accepted his share i am not astonished you get fat while we are all growing lean do you know that it is beastly to stuff yourself like this and the others you don't think of them oh why are the others such fools well you're right to hide yourself for if your father knew you stole he would settle you what when the bourgeois are stealing from us it's you who are always saying so if i had this loaf at maigrat's you may be pretty sure it's a loaf he owed us the young man was silent with his mouth full and felt troubled he looked at him with his muzzle his green eyes his large ears a degenerate abortion with an obscure intelligence and savage cunning slowly slipping back into the animality of old the mind which had made him had just finished him by breaking his legs and lady asked him again do you bring her here sometimes jeanlin laughed contemptuously the little one ah no not i women blab and he went on laughing filled with an immense disdain for lady and bebert who had ever seen such boobies to think that they swallowed all his humbug 
and went away with empty hands while he ate the cod in this warm place tickled his sides with amusement then he concluded with the gravity of a little philosopher much better be alone then there's no falling out etienne had finished his bread he drank a gulp of the gin for a moment he asked himself if he ought not to make a bad return for jean lin's hospitality by bringing him up to daylight by the ear and forbidding him to plunder any more by the threat of telling everything to his father but as he examined this deep retreat an idea occurred to him who knows if there might not be need for it either for mates or for himself in case things should come to the worst up above he made the child swear not to sleep out as had sometimes happened when he forgot himself in his hay and taking a candle end he went away first leaving him to pursue quietly his domestic affairs moquette seated on a beam in spite of the great cold had grown desperate and waiting for him when she saw him she leapt on to his neck it was as though he had plunged a knife into her heart when he said that he wished to see her no more good god why did she not love him enough fearing to yield to the desire to enter with her he drew her towards the road and explained to her as gently as possible that she was compromising him in the eyes of his mates that she was compromising the political cause she was astonished what had that got to do with politics at last the thought occurred to her that he blushed at being seen with her she was not wounded however it was quite natural and she proposed that he should rebuff her before people so as to seem to have broken with her but he would see her just once sometimes in distraction she implored him she swore to keep out of sight she would not keep him five minutes he was touched but still refused it was necessary then as he left her he wished at least to kiss her they had gradually reached the first houses of monceau and were standing with their arms round one another beneath a large round moon when a woman passed near them with a sudden start as though she had knocked against a stone who is that asked etienne anxiously it's catherine replied moquette she's coming back from jean bart the woman now was going away with lowered head and feeble limbs looking very tired and the young man gazed at her in despair at having been seen by her his heart aching with an unreasonable remorse had she not been with a man had she not made him suffer with the same suffering here on this regular road when she had given herself to that man but all the same he was grieved to have done the like to her shall i tell you what it is whispered moquette in tears as she left him if you don't want me it's because you want someone else on the next day the weather was superb it was one of those clear frosty days the beautiful winter days when the hard earth rings like crystal beneath the feet jeanlin had gone off at one o'clock but he had to wait for bebert behind the church and they nearly set out without lighting whose mother had again shut her up in the cellar and only now liberated her to put a basket on her arm telling her that if she did not bring it back full of dandelions she should be shut up with the rats all night long she was frightened therefore and wished to go at once for salad jeanne lin dissuaded her they would see later on for a long time poland rasseneur's big rabbit had attracted his attention he was passing before the advantage when just then the rabbit came out on to the road with a leap he seized her by the ears stuffed her into the little girl's basket and all three rushed away they would amuse themselves finally by making her run like a dog as far as the forest but they stopped to gaze at zachary and moquet who after having drunk a glass with two other mates had begun their big game of cross the stake was a new cap and a red handkerchief deposited with rasseneur the four players two against two were betting for the first turn from the Vero to the pella farm nearly three kilometres and it was zachary who won with seven strokes while moquet required eight they had placed the ball the little boxwood egg on the pavement with one end up each was holding his cross the mallet with its bent iron long handle and tight-strung network two o'clock struck as they set out zachary in a masterly manner at his first stroke 
composed of a series of three sent the ball more than four hundred yards across the beetroot fields for it was forbidden to play in the villages and on the streets where people might be killed Mouquet, who was also a good player sent off the ball with so vigorous an arm that a single stroke brought the ball a hundred and fifty metres behind and the game went on backwards and forwards always running their feet bruised by the frozen ridges of the ploughed fields at first jeanlin bebert and Lydie had trotted behind the players delighted with their vigorous strokes then they remembered poland whom they were shaking up in the basket and leaving the game in the open country they took out the rabbit inquisitive to see how fast she could run she went off and they fled after her it was a chase lasting an hour at full speed with constant turns with shouts to frighten her and arms opened and closed on emptiness if she had not been at the beginning of pregnancy they would never have caught her again as they were patting the sound of oaths made them turn their heads they had just come upon the cross party again and zacharie had nearly split open his brother's skull the players were now at their fourth turn from the palo farm they had gone off to the quatre chemin then from the quatre chemin to montoir and now they were going in six strokes from montoir to pre de vache that made two leagues and a half in an hour and besides they had had drinks at the estaminet vincent and at the trois sages bar mouquet this time was ahead he had two more strokes to play and his victory was certain when zacharie grinning as he availed himself of his privilege played with so much skill that the ball rolled into a deep pit mouquet's partner could not get it out it was a disaster all four shouted the party was excited for they were neck to neck it was necessary to begin again from the pre de vache it was not two kilometres to the point of er roses in five strokes there they would refresh themselves at le renard's but jeanlin had an idea he let them go on and pulled out of his pocket a piece of string which he tied to one of poland's legs the left hind leg and it was very amusing the rabbit ran before the three young rascals waddling along in such an extraordinary manner that they had never laughed so much before afterwards they fastened it round her neck and let her run off and as she grew tired they dragged her on her belly or on her back just like a little carriage that lasted for more than an hour she was moaning when they quickly put her back into the basket near the wood at crichot on hearing the players whose game they had once more came across zachary mouquet and the two others were getting over the kilometres with no other rest than the time for a drink at all the inns which they had fixed on as their goals from the herb russe they had gone on to bouchy then to croix de pierre then to chamblay the earth rang beneath the helter-skelter of their feet rushing untiringly after the ball which bounded over the ice the weather was good they did not fall in they only ran the risk of breaking their legs in the dry air the great cross blows exploded like firearms their muscular hands grasped the strong handle their entire bodies were bent forward as though to slay an ox and this went on for hours from one end of the plain to the other over ditches and hedges and the slopes of the road the low walls of the enclosures one needed to have good bellows in one's chest and iron hinges in one's knees the pikemen thus rubbed off the rust of the mine with impassioned zeal there were some so enthusiastic at twenty-five that they could do ten leagues at forty they played no more they were too heavy five o'clock struck the twilight was already coming on one more turn to the forest of vandame to decide who had gained the cap and the handkerchief and zachary joked with his chaffing indifference for politics it would be fine to tumble down over there in the midst of the mates as to jeanlin ever since leaving the settlement he had been aiming at the forest though apparently only scouring the fields with an indignant gesture he threatened lydie who was full of remorse and fear and talked of going back to the Voreux to gather dandelions were they going to abandon the meeting he wanted to know what the old people would say 
he pushed bebert and proposed to enliven the end of the journey as far as the trees by detaching poland and pursuing her with stones his real idea was to kill her he wanted to take her off and eat her at the bottom of his hole at Requillard. the rabbit ran ahead with nose in the air and ears back a stone grazed her back another cut her tail and in spite of the growing darkness she would have been done for if the young rogues had not noticed etienne and Mehu standing in the middle of a glade they threw themselves on the animal in desperation and put her back in the basket almost at the same minute zacharie mouquet and the two others with their last blow at cross drove the ball within a few metres of the glade they all came into the midst of the rendezvous through the whole country by the roads and pathways of the flat plain ever since twilight there had been a long procession a rustling of silent shadows moving separately or in groups towards the violet thickets of the forest every settlement was emptied the women and children themselves set out as if for a walk beneath the great clear sky now the roads were growing dark this walking crowd all gliding towards the same goal could no longer be distinguished but one felt it the confused tramping moved by one soul between the hedges among the bushes there was only a light rustling a vague rumour of the voices of the night m Ambos, who was at this hour returning home mounted on his mare listened to these vague sounds he had met couples long rows of strollers on this beautiful winter night more lovers who were going to take their pleasure mouth to mouth behind the walls was it not what he always met girls tumbled over at the bottom of every ditch beggars who crammed themselves with the only joy that costs nothing and these fools complained of life when they could take their supreme fill of this happiness of love willingly would he have starved as they did if he could begin a life again with a woman who would give herself to him on a heap of stones with all her strength and all her heart his misfortune was without consolation and he envied these wretches with lowered head he went back riding his horse at a slackened pace rendered desperate by these long sounds lost in the depth of the black country in which he heard only kisses End of section 22section 23 of germinal by emile zola translation by havelock ellis this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Berard. part four chapter seven it was the plan de dame that vast glade just opened up by the felling of trees it spread out in a gentle slope surrounded by tall thickets and superb beeches with straight regular trunks which formed a white colonnade patched with green lichens fallen giants were also lying in the grass while on the left a mass of logs formed a geometrical cube the cold was sharpening with the twilight and the frozen moss crackled beneath the feet it was black darkness on the earth while the tall branches showed against the pale sky where a full moon coming above the horizon would soon extinguish the stars nearly three thousand colliers had come to the rendezvous a swarming crowd of men women and children gradually filling the glade and spreading out afar beneath the trees late arrivals were still coming up a flood of heads drowned in shadow and stretching as far as the neighbouring copses a rumbling arose from them like that of a storm in this motionless and frozen forest at the top dominating the slope etienne stood with rasseneur and Mathieu. a quarrel had broken out one could hear their voices in sudden bursts near them some men were listening Lavoque with clenched fists piron turning his back and much annoyed that he had no longer been able to feign a fever there were also father bonnemort and old monk seated side by side on a stump lost in deep meditation then behind were the chaffers zacharie mouquet and others who had come to make fun of the thing while gathered together in a very different spirit the women in a group were as serious as if at church Mahud silently shook her head at the levaque woman's muttered oaths Philomene was coughing 
her bronchitis having come back with the winter only moquette was showing her teeth with laughter amused at the way in which mother brulé was abusing her daughter an unnatural creature who had sent her away that she might gorge herself with rabbit a creature who had sold herself and who fattened on her man's cowardice and jeanlin had planted himself on the pile of wood hoisting up lighty and making bébert follow him all three higher up in the air than any one else the quarrel was raised by rasseneur who wished to proceed formally to the election of officers he was enraged by his defeat at the bon joyaux and had sworn to have his revenge for he flattered himself that he could regain his old authority when he was once face to face not with the delegates but with the miners themselves etienne was disgusted and thought the idea of officers was ridiculous in this forest they ought to act in a revolutionary fashion like savages since they were tracked like wolves as the dispute threatened to drag on he took possession of the crowd at once by jumping on to the trunk of a tree and shouting comrades comrades the confused roar of the crowd died down into a long sigh while maheu stifled rasseneur's protestations etienne went on in a loud voice comrades since they forbid us to speak since they send the police after us as if we were robbers we have come to talk here here we are free we are at home no one can silence us any more than they can silence the birds and beasts a thunder of cries and exclamations responded to him yes yes the forest is ours we can talk here go on then etienne stood for a moment motionless on the tree trunk the moon still beneath the horizon only lit up the topmost branches and the crowd remaining in the darkness stood above it at the top of the slope like a bar of shadow he raised his arm with a slow movement and began but his voice was not fierce he spoke in the cold tones of a simple envoy of the people who was rendering his account he was delivering the discourse which the commissioner of police had cut short at the bon joyaux and he began a rapid history of the strike affecting a certain scientific eloquence facts nothing but facts at first he spoke of his dislike to the strike the miners had not desired it it was the management which had provoked it with the new tempering tariff then he recalled the first step taken by the delegates in going to the manager the bad faith of the directors and later on the second step the tardy concession the ten centimes given up after the attempt to rob them now he showed by figures the exhaustion of the provident fund and pointed out the use that had been made of the help sent briefly excusing the international pluchart and the others for not being able to do more for them in the midst of the cares of their conquest of the world so the situation was getting worse every day the company was giving back certificates and threatening to hire men from belgium besides it was intimidating the weak and had forced a certain number of miners to go down again he preserved his monotonous voice as if to insist on the bad news he said that hunger was victorious that hope was dead and that the struggle had reached the last feverish efforts of courage and then he suddenly concluded without raising his voice it is in these circumstances mates that you have to take a decision to-night do you want the strike to go on and if so what do you expect to do to beat the company a deep silence fell from the starry sky the crowd which could not be seen was silent in the night beneath these words which choked every heart and a sigh of despair could be heard through the trees but etienne was already continuing with a change in his voice it was no longer the secretary of the association who was speaking it was the chief of a band the apostle who was bringing truth could it be that any were cowardly enough to go back on their word what they were to suffer in vain for a month and then to go back to the pits with lowered heads so that the everlasting wretchedness might begin over again would it not be better to die at once in the effort to destroy this tyranny of capital which was starving the worker always to submit to hunger up to the moment when hunger will again throw the calmest into revolt 
was it not a foolish game which could not go on for ever and he pointed to the exploited miners bearing alone the disasters of every crisis reduced to go without food as soon as the necessities of competition lowered net prices no the timbering tariff could not be accepted it was only a disguised effort to economize on the company's part they wanted to rob every man of an hour's work a day it was too much this time the day was coming when the miserable pushed to extremity would deal justice he stood with his arms in the air at the word justice the crowd shaken by a long shudder broke out into applause which rolled along with the sound of dry leaves voices cried justice it is time justice gradually etienne grew heated he had not rasseneur's easy-flowing abundance words often failed him he had to force his phrases bringing them out with an effort which he emphasized by a movement of his shoulders only in these continual shocks he came upon familiar images which seized on his audience by their energy while his workman's gestures his elbows in and then extended with his fists thrust out his jaw suddenly advanced as if to bite had also an extraordinary effect on his mates they all said that if he was not big he made himself heard the wage system is a new form of slavery he began again in a more sonorous voice the mine ought to belong to the miner as the sea belongs to the fisherman and the earth to the peasant do you see the mine belongs to you to all of you who for a century have paid for it with so much blood and misery he boldly entered on obscure questions of law and lost himself in the difficulties of the special regulations concerning mines the subsoil like the soil belonged to the nation only an odious privilege gave the monopoly of it to the companies all the more since at Monceau, the pretended legality of the concession was complicated by treaties formerly made with the owners of the old fiefs according to the ancient custom of Hainault, the miners then had only to reconquer their property and with extended hands he indicated the whole country beyond the forest at this moment the moon which had risen above the horizon lit him up as it glided from behind the high branches when the crowd which was still in shadow saw him thus white with light distributing fortune with his open hands they applauded anew by prolonged clapping yes yes he's right bravo then etienne trotted out his favorite subject the assumption of the instruments of production by the collectivity as he kept on saying in a phrase the pedantry of which greatly pleased him at the present time his evolution was completed having set out with the sentimental fraternity of the novice and the need for reforming the wage system he had reached the political idea of its suppression since the meeting at bon Joyeux, his collectivism still humanitarian and without a formula had stiffened into a complicated program which he discussed scientifically article by article first he affirmed that freedom could only be obtained by the destruction of the state then when the people had obtained possession of the government reforms would begin return to the primitive commune substitution of an equal and free family for the moral and oppressive family absolute equality civil political and economic individual independence guaranteed thanks to the possession of the integral product of the instruments of work finally free vocational education paid for by the collectivity this led to the total reconstruction of the old rotten society he attacked marriage the right of bequest he regulated everyone's fortune he threw down the iniquitous monument of the dead centuries with the great movement of his arm always the same movement the movement of the reaper who is cutting down a ripe harvest and then with the other hand he reconstructed he built up the future humanity the edifice of truth and justice rising in the dawn of the twentieth century in this state of mental tension reason trembled and only the sectarian's fixed idea was left the scruples of sensibility and of good sense were lost nothing seemed easier than the realization of this new world he had foreseen everything he spoke of it as of a machine which he could put together in two hours and he stuck at neither fire nor blood 
our turn is come he broke out for the last time now it is for us to have power and wealth the cheering rolled up to him from the depths of the forest the moon now whitened the whole of the glade and cut into living waves the sea of heads as far as the dimly visible copses in the distance between the great gray trunks and in the icy air there was a fury of faces of gleaming eyes of open mouths a rut of famishing men women and children let loose on the just pillage of the ancient wealth they had been deprived of they no longer felt the cold these burning words had warmed them to the bone religious exultation raised them from the earth a fever of hope like that of the christians of the early church awaiting the near coming of justice many obscure phrases had escaped them they could not properly understand this technical and abstract reasoning but the very obscurity and abstraction still further enlarged the field of promises and lifted them into a dazzling region what a dream to be masters to suffer no more to enjoy at last that's it by god it's our turn now down with the exploiters the women were delirious Mehude, losing her calmness was seized with the vertigo of hunger the levaque woman shouted old boule carried out of herself was brandishing her witch-like arms philomene was shaken by a spasm of coughing and moquette was so excited that she cried out words of tenderness to the orator among the men maheu was won over and shouted with anger between piron who was trembling and levaque who was talking too much while the chaffers zacharie and moquet though trying to make fun of things were feeling uncomfortable and were surprised that their mate could talk on so long without having a drink but on top of the pile of wood jeanlin was making more noise than any one egging on bebert and lydie and shaking the basket in which poland lay the clamour began again etienne was enjoying the intoxication of his popularity he held power as it were materialized in these three thousand breasts whose hearts he could move with a word souverain if he had cared to come would have applauded his ideas so far as he recognized them pleased with his pupil's progress in anarchism and satisfied with the programme except the article on education a relic of silly sentimentality for men needed to be dipped in a bath of holy and salutary ignorance as to rasseneur he shrugged his shoulders with contempt and anger you shall let me speak he shouted to etienne the latter jumped from the tree trunk speak we shall see if they'll hear you already rasseneur had replaced him and with a gesture demanded silence but the noise did not cease his name went round from the first ranks who had recognized him to the last lost beneath the beeches and they refused to hear him he was an overturned idol the mere sight of him angered his old disciples his facile elocution his flowing good-natured speech which had so long charmed them was now treated like warm gruel made to put cowards to sleep in vain he talked through the noise trying to take up again his discourse of conciliation the impossibility of changing the world by a stroke of the law the necessity of allowing the social evolution time to accomplish itself they choked him they hissed him his defeat at the bon joyeux was now beyond repair at last they threw handfuls of frozen moss at him and a woman cried in a shrill voice down with the traitor he explained that the miner could not be the proprietor of the mine as the weaver is of his loom and he said that he preferred sharing in the benefits the interested worker becoming the child of the house down with the traitor repeated a thousand voices while stones began to whistle by then he turned pale and despair filled his eyes with tears his whole existence was crumbling down twenty years of ambitious comradeship were breaking down beneath the ingratitude of the crowd he came down from the tree trunk with no strength to go on struck to the heart that makes you laugh he stammered addressing the triumphant at the end good i hope your turn will come it will come i tell you and as if to reject all responsibility for the evils which he foresaw he made a large gesture and went away alone across the country pale and silent hoots arose and then they were surprised to see father von mort standing on the trunk and about to speak in the midst of the tumult up till now 
Mouque and he had remained absorbed, with that air that they always had of reflecting on former things. No doubt he was yielding to one of those sudden crises of garrulity which sometimes made the past stir in him so violently that recollections rose and flowed from his lips for hours at a time there was deep silence and they listened to this old man who was like a pale spectre beneath the moon and as he narrated things without any immediate relation with the discussion long histories which no one could understand the impression was increased he was talking of his youth he described the death of his two uncles who were crushed at the Voreux then he turned to the inflammation of the lungs which had carried off his wife he kept to his main idea however things had never gone well and never would go well thus in the forest five hundred of them had come together because the king would not lessen the hours of work but he stopped short and began to tell of another strike he had seen so many they all broke out under these trees here at the plan de dame lower down at the Chabonnerie, still farther towards the salt de l'eau sometimes it froze sometimes it was hot one evening it had rained so much that they had gone back again without being able to say anything and the king's soldiers came up and it finished with volleys of musketry we raised our hands like this and we swore not to go back again ah i have sworn yes i have sworn the crowd listened gapingly feeling disturbed when etienne who had watched the scene jumped on to the fallen tree keeping the old man at his side he had just recognized chaval among their friends in the first row the idea that catherine must be there had roused a new ardour within him the desire to be applauded in her presence mates you have heard this is one of our old men and this is what he has suffered and what our children will suffer if we don't have done with the robbers and butchers he was terrible never had he spoken so violently with one arm he supported old bonmort exhibiting him as a banner of misery and mourning and crying for vengeance in a few rapid phrases he went back to the first maheu he showed the whole family used up at the mine devoured by the company hungrier than ever after a hundred years of work and contrasting with the Mahus, he pointed to the big bellies of the directors sweating gold a whole band of shareholders going on for a century like kept women doing nothing but enjoy with their bodies was it not fearful a race of men dying down below from father to son so that bribes of wine could be given to ministers and generations of great lords and bourgeois could give feasts or fatten by their firesides he had studied the diseases of the miners he made them all march past with their awful details anemia scrofula black bronchitis the asthma which chokes and the rheumatism which paralyzes these wretches were thrown as food to the engines and penned up like beasts in the settlements the great companies absorbed them regulating their slavery threatening to enroll all the workers of the nation millions of hands to bring fortune to a thousand idlers but the miner was no longer an ignorant brute crushed within the bowels of the earth an army was springing up from the depths of the pits a harvest of citizens whose seed would germinate and burst through the earth some sunny day and they would see then if after forty years of service any one would dare to offer a pension of a hundred and fifty francs to an old man of sixty who spat out coal and whose legs were swollen with the water from the cuttings yes labour would demand an account from capital that impersonal god unknown to the worker crouching down somewhere in his mysterious sanctuary where he sucked the life out of the starvelings who nourished him they would go down there they would at last succeed in seeing his face by the gleam of incendiary fires they would drown him in blood that filthy swine that monstrous idol gorged with human flesh he was silent but his arm still extended in space indicated the enemy down there he knew not where from one end of the earth to the other this time the clamour of the crowd was so great that people at Mosso heard it and looked towards van damme seized with anxiety at the thought that some terrible landslip had occurred night-birds rose above the trees and clear open sky 
he now concluded his speech mates what is your decision do you vote for the strike to go on their voices yelled yes yes and what steps do you decide on we are sure of defeat if cowards go down to-morrow their voices rose again with the sound of a tempest kill the cowards then you decide to call them back to duty and to their sworn word that is what we can do present ourselves at the pits bring back the traitors by our presence show the company that we are all agreed and that we are going to die rather than yield that's it to the pits to the pits while he was speaking etienne had looked for catherine among the pale shouting heads before him she was certainly not there but he still saw chaval affecting to jeer shrugging his shoulders but devoured by jealousy and ready to sell himself for a little of this popularity and if there are any spies among us mates etienne went on let them look out they're known yes i can see vandam colliers here who have not left their pit is that meant for me asked chaval with an air of bravado for you and for any one else but since you speak you ought to understand that those who eat have nothing to do with those who are starving you work at jean bart a chaffing voice interrupted oh he work he's got a wife who works for him chaval swore while the blood rose to his face by god is it forbidden to work then yes said etienne when your mates are enduring misery for the good of all it is forbidden to go over like a selfish sneaking coward to the master's side if the strike had been general we should have got the best of it long ago not a single man at vandame ought to have gone down when monceau is resting to accomplish the great stroke work should be stopped in the entire country at m de Nolens, as well as here do you understand there are only traitors in the jean bart cuttings you're all traitors the crowd around chaval grew threatening and fists were raised and cries of kill him kill him began to be uttered he had grown pale but in his infuriated desire to triumph over etienne an idea restored him listen to me then come to-morrow to jean bart and you shall see if i'm working we're on your side they've sent me to tell you so the fires must be extinguished and the engine men too must go on strike all the better if the pumps do stop the water will destroy the pits and everything will be done for he was furiously applauded in his turn and now etienne himself was outflanked other orators succeeded each other from the tree trunk gesticulating amid the tumult and throwing out wild propositions it was a mad outburst of faith the impatience of a religious sect which tired of hoping for the expected miracle had at last decided to provoke it these heads emptied by famine saw everything red and dreamed of fire and blood in the midst of a glorious apotheosis from which would arise universal happiness and the tranquil moon bathed this surging sea the deep forest encircled with its vast silence this cry of massacre the frozen moss crackled beneath the heels of the crowd while the beeches erect in their strength with the delicate tracery of their black branches against the white sky neither saw nor heard the miserable beings who writhed at their feet there was some pushing and maheude found herself near maheude both of them driven out of their ordinary good sense and carried away by the slow exasperation which had been working within them for months approved levaque who went to extremes by demanding the heads of the engineers perron had disappeared bonnemort and Mouk were both talking together saying vague violent things which nobody heard for a joke zacharie demanded the demolition of the churches while moquet with his cross in his hand was beating it against the ground for the sake of increasing the row the women were furious the levaque with her fist to her hips was setting to with philomene whom she accused of having laughed moquette talked of attacking the gendarmes by kicking them somewhere mother brule who had just slapped lydie on finding her without either basket or salad went on launching blows into space against all the masters whom she would like to have got at for a moment jeanlin was in terror 
bebert having learned through a trammer that madame rasseneur had seen them steal poland but when he had decided to go back and quietly release the beast at the door of the advantage he shouted louder than ever and opened his new knife brandishing the blade and proud of its glitter mates mates repeated the exhausted etienne hoarse with the effort to obtain a moment's silence for a definite understanding at last they had listened mates to-morrow morning at jean bart is it agreed yes yes at jean bart death to the traitors the tempest of these three thousand voices filled the sky and died away in the pure brightness of the moon End of section twenty three section twenty four of german Aunt by emile zola translated by havelock ellis this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard part five chapter one at four o'clock the moon had set and the night was very dark everything was still asleep at denolens the old brick house stood mute and gloomy with closed doors and windows at the end of the large ill-kept garden which separated it from the jean bart mine the other frontage faced the deserted road to vandamme a large country town about three kilometres off hidden behind the forest deneulin tired after a day spent in part below was snoring with his face toward the wall when he dreamt that he had been called at last he awoke and really hearing a voice got out and opened the window one of his captains was in the garden what is it then he asked there's a rebellion sir half the men will not work and are preventing the others from going down he scarcely understood with head heavy and dazed with sleep and the great cold struck him like an icy douche then make them go down by george he stammered it's been going on an hour said the captain then we thought it best to come for you perhaps you will be able to persuade them very good i'll go he quickly dressed himself his mind quite clear now and very anxious the house might have been pillaged neither the cook nor the manservant had stirred but from the other side of the staircase alarmed voices were whispering and when he came out he saw his daughter's door open and they both appeared in white dressing gowns slipped on in haste father what is it lucy the elder was already twenty-two a tall dark girl with a haughty air while jeanne the younger as yet scarcely nineteen years old was small with golden hair and a certain caressing grace nothing serious he replied to reassure them it seems that some blusterers are making a disturbance down there i am going to see but they exclaimed that they would not let him go before he had taken something warm if not he would come back ill with his stomach out of order as he always did he struggled gave his word of honour that he was too much in a hurry listen said jean at last hanging to his neck you must drink a little glass of rum and eat two biscuits or i shall remain like this and you'll have to take me with you he resigned himself declaring that the biscuits would choke him they had already gone down before him each with her candlestick in the dining-room below they hastened to serve him one pouring out the rum the other running to the pantry for the biscuits having lost their mother when very young they had been rather badly brought up alone spoiled by their father the elder haunted by the dream of singing on the stage the younger mad over painting in which she showed a singular boldness of taste but when they had to retrench after the embarrassment in their affairs these apparently extravagant girls had suddenly developed into very sensible and shrewd managers with an eye for errors of centimes in accounts to-day with their boyish and artistic demeanour they kept the purse were careful over suit and haggled with the tradesmen renovated their dresses unceasingly and in fact succeeded in rendering decent the growing embarrassment of the house eat papa repeated lucy then remarking his silent gloomy preoccupation she was again frightened is it serious then that you look at us like this tell us we will stay with you and they can do without us at that lunch 
she was speaking of a party which had been planned for the morning madame hennebeau was to go in her carriage first for cecile at the grégoires then to call for them so that they could all go to marchiennes to lunch at the forges where the manager's wife had invited them it was an opportunity to visit the workshops the blast furnaces and the coke ovens we will certainly remain declared jeanne in her turn but he grew angry a fine idea i tell you that it is nothing just be so good as to get back into your beds again and dress yourselves for nine o'clock as was arranged he kissed them and hastened to leave they heard the noise of his boots vanishing over the frozen earth in the garden jeanne carefully placed the stopper in the rum bottle while lucy locked up the biscuits the room had the cold neatness of dining-rooms where the table is but meagerly supplied and both of them took advantage of this early descent to see if anything had been left uncared for the evening before a serviette lay about the servant should be scolded at last they were upstairs again while he was taking the shortest cut through the narrow paths of his kitchen garden Deneland was thinking of his compromised fortune this monsieur denier this million which he had realized dreaming to multiply it tenfold and which was to-day running such great risks it was an uninterrupted course of ill luck enormous and unforeseen repairs ruinous conditions of exploitation then the disaster of this industrial crisis just when the profits were beginning to come in if the strike broke out here he would be overthrown he pushed a little door the buildings of the pit could be divined in the black night by the deepening of the shadow starred by a few lanterns jean bart was not so important as the Barreau, but its renewed installation made it a pretty pit as the engineers say they had not been contented by enlarging the shaft one meter and a half and deepening it to seven hundred and eight meters they had equipped it afresh with a new engine new cages entirely new material all set up according to the latest scientific improvements and even a certain seeking for elegance was visible in the constructions a screening shed with carved frieze a steeple adorned with a clock a receiving room and an engine room both rounded into an apse like a renaissance chapel and surmounted by a chimney with a mosaic spiral made of black bricks and red bricks the pump was placed on the other shaft of the concession the old gaston marie pit reserved solely for this purpose jean bart to right and left of the winding shaft only had two conduits that for the steam ventilator and that for the ladders in the morning ever since three o'clock chaval who had arrived first had been seducing his comrades convincing them that they ought to imitate those at monceau and demand an increase of five centimes a tram soon four hundred workmen had passed from the shed into the receiving room in the midst of a tumult of gesticulation and shouting those who wished to work stood with their lamps barefooted with shovel or pick beneath their arms while the others still in their sabots with their overcoats on their shoulders because of the great cold were barring the shaft and the captains were growing hoarse in the effort to restore order begging them to be reasonable and not to prevent those who wanted from going down but chaval was furious when he saw catherine in her trousers and jacket her head tied up in a blue cap on getting up he had roughly told her to stay in bed in despair at this arrest of work she had followed him all the same for he never gave her any money she often had to pay both for herself and him and what was to become of her if she earned nothing she was overcome by fear the fear of a brothel at marchand's which was the end of putter girls without bread and without lodging by god cried chaval what the devil have you come here for she stammered that she had no income to live on and that she wanted to work then you put yourself against me wench back you go at once or i'll go back with you and kick my sabots into your backside she recoiled timidly but she did not leave resolved to see how things would turn out denolin had arrived by the screening stairs in spite of the weak light of the lanterns with a quick look he took in the scene with this rabble wrapped in shadow he knew every face 
the pikemen the porters the landers the putters even the trammers in the nave still new and clean the arrested task was waiting the steam in the engine under pressure made slight whistling sounds the cages were hanging motionless to the cables the trams abandoned on the way were encumbering the metal floors scarcely eighty lamps had been taken the others were flaming in the lamp cabin but no doubt a word from him would suffice and the whole life of labor would begin again well what's going on then my lads he asked in a loud voice what are you angry about just explain to me and we will see if we can agree he usually behaved in a paternal way towards his men while at the same time demanding hard work with an authoritative rough manner he had tried to conquer them by a good nature which had its outbursts of passion and he often gained their love the men especially respected in him his courage always in the cuttings with them the first in danger whenever an accident terrified the pit twice after fire-damp explosions he had been let down fastened by a rope under his armpits when the bravest drew back now he began again you are not going to make me repent of having trusted you you know that i have refused police protection talk quietly and i will hear you all were now silent and awkward moving away from him and it was chaval who at last said well monsieur Danilin, we can't go on working we must have five centimes more the tram he seemed surprised what five centimes and why this demand i don't complain about your timbering i don't want to impose a new tariff on you like the monceau directors maybe but the monceau mates are right all the same they won't have the tariff and they want a rise of five centimes because it is not possible to work properly at the present rates we want five centimes more don't we you others voices approved and the noise began again in the midst of violent gesticulation gradually they grew near forming a small circle a flame came into denolin's eyes and his fist that of a man who liked strong government was clenched for fear of yielding to the temptation of seizing one of them by the neck he preferred to discuss on the basis of reason you want five centimes and i agree that the work is worth it only i can't give it if i gave it i should simply be done for you must understand that i have to live first in order for you to live and i've got to the end the least rise in net prices will upset me two years ago you remember at the time of the last strike i yielded i was able to then but that rise of wages was not the less ruinous for these two years have been a struggle to-day i would rather let the whole thing go than not be able to tell next month where to get the money to pay you chaval laughed roughly in the face of this master who told them his affairs so frankly the others lowered their faces obstinate and incredulous refusing to take into their heads the idea that a master did not gain millions out of his men then denelin persisting explained his struggle with monceau always on the watch and ready to devour him if some day he had the stupidity to come to grief it was a savage competition which forced him to economize the more so since the great depth of john bart increased the price of extraction an unfavorable condition hardly compensated by the great thickness of the coal beds he would never have raised wages after the last strike if it had not been necessary for him to imitate monceau for fear of seeing his men leave him and he threatened them with the morrow a fine result it would be for them if they obliged him to sell to pass beneath the terrible yoke of the directors he did not sit on a throne far away in an unknown sanctuary he was not one of those shareholders who pay agents to skin the miner who has never seen them he was a master he risked something besides his money he risked his intelligence his health his life stoppage of work would simply mean death for he had no stock and he must fulfil orders besides his standing capital could not sleep how could he keep his engagements who would pay the interest on the sums his friends had confided to him it would mean bankruptcy that's where we are my good fellows he said in conclusion i want to convince you we don't ask a man to cut his own throat do we and if i give you your five centimes 
or if i let you go out on strike it's the same as if i cut my throat he was silent grunts went round a party among the miners seemed to hesitate several went back towards the shaft at least said a captain let every one be free who are those who want to work catherine had advanced among the first but chaval fiercely pushed her back shouting we are all agreed it's only bloody rogues who'll leave their mates after that conciliation appeared impossible the cries began again and men were hustled away from the shaft at the risk of being crushed against the walls for a moment the manager in despair tried to struggle alone to reduce the crowd by violence but it was useless madness and he retired for a few minutes he rested out of breath on a chair in the receiver's office so overcome by his powerlessness that no ideas came to him at last he grew calm and told an inspector to go and bring cheval then when the latter had agreed to the interview he motioned the others away leave us Deneland's idea was to see what this fellow was after at the first words he felt that he was vain and was devoured by passionate jealousy then he attacked him by flattery affecting surprise that a workman of his merit should so compromise his future it seemed as though he had long had his eyes on him for rapid advancement and he ended by squarely offering to make him captain later on chaval listened in silence with his fists at first clenched but then gradually unbent something was working in the depths of his skull if he persisted in the strike he would be nothing more than etienne's lieutenant while now another ambition opened that of passing into the ranks of the bosses the heat of pride rose to his face and intoxicated him besides the band of strikers whom he had expected since the morning had not arrived some obstacle must have stopped them perhaps the police it was time to submit but all the time he shook his head he acted the incorruptible man striking his breast indignantly then without mentioning to the master the rendezvous he had given to the montsou men he promised to call his mates and to persuade them to go down deneland remained hidden and the captains themselves stood aside for an hour they heard chaval orating and discussing standing on a tram in the receiving room some of the men hooted him a hundred and twenty went off exasperated persisting in the resolution which he had made them take it was already past seven the sun was rising brilliantly it was a bright day of hard frost and all at once movement began in the pit and the arrested labor went on first the crank of the engine plunged rolling and unrolling the cables on the drums then in the midst of the tumult of the signals the descent took place the cages filled and were engulfed and rose again the shaft swallowing its ration of trammers and putters and pikemen while on the metal floors the landers pushed the trams with a sound of thunder by god what the devil are you doing there cried chaval to catherine who was awaiting her turn will you just go down and not laze about at nine o'clock when madame hennebeau arrived in her carriage with cecile she found lucie and jeanne quite ready and very elegant in spite of their dresses having been renovated for the twentieth time but deneline was surprised to see negrel accompanying the carriage on horseback what were the men also in the party then madame hennebeau explained in her maternal way that they had frightened her by saying that the streets were full of evil faces and so she preferred to bring a defender negrel laughed and reassured them nothing to cause anxiety threats of brawlers as usual but not one of them would dare to throw a stone at a window-pane still pleased with his success deneline related the checked rebellion at jean bart he said that he was now quite at rest and on the vandamme road while the young ladies got into the carriage all congratulated themselves on the superb day oblivious of the long swelling shudder of the marching people afar off in the country though they might have heard the sound of it if they had pressed their ears against the earth well it is agreed replied madame Hennebeau. this evening you will call for the ladies and dine with us madame grégoire has also promised to come for cecile you may reckon on me replied deneline 
the carriage went off towards vandame jeanne and lucy leaning down to laugh once more to their father who was standing by the roadside while Miguel gallantly trotted behind the fleeing wheels they crossed the forest taking the road from vandame to marchiennes as they approached tartaret jeanne asked madame hennebeau if she knew Colbert, and the latter in spite of her stay of five years in the country acknowledged that she had never been on that side then they made a detour tartaret on the outskirts of the forest was an uncultivated moor of volcanic sterility under which for ages a coal mine had been burning its history was lost in legend the miners of the place said that fire from heaven had fallen on the sodom in the bowels of the earth where the putter girls had committed abominations together so that they had not even had the time to come to the surface and to-day were still burning at the bottom of this hell the calcined rocks of a sombre red were covered by an efflorescence of alum as by a leprosy sulphur grew like a yellow flower at the edge of the fissures at night those who were brave enough to venture to look into these holes declared that they saw flames there sinful souls shriveling in the furnace within wandering lights moved over the soil and hot vapours the poisons from the devil's ordure and his dirty kitchen were constantly smoking and like a miracle of eternal spring in the midst of this accursed moor of tartaret Cultivert appeared with its meadows for ever green its beaches with leaves unceasingly renewed its fields where three harvests ripened it was a natural hothouse warmed by the fire in the deep strata beneath the snow never lay on it the enormous bouquet of verdure beside the leafless forest trees blossomed on this december day and the frost had not even scorched the edge of it soon the carriage was passing over the plain Negrel joked over the legend and explained that a fire often occurred at the bottom of a mine from the fermentation of the coal dust if not mastered it would burn on for ever and you mentioned a belgian pit which had been flooded by diverting a river and running it into the pit but he became silent for the last few minutes groups of miners had been constantly passing the carriage they went by in silence with sidelong looks at the luxurious equipage which forced them to stand aside their number went on increasing the horses were obliged to cross the little bridge over the scarp at walking pace what was going on then to bring all these people into the roads the young ladies became frightened and negrel began to smell out some fray in the excited country it was a relief when they at last arrived at marchand's the batteries of coke ovens and the chimneys of the blast furnaces beneath the sun which seemed to extinguish them were belching out smoke and raining their everlasting soot through the air End of section twenty four section twenty five of germinal by emile zola translated by havelock ellis this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Matt Berard. Part Five, Chapter Two. At Jean Bard, Catherine had already been at work for an hour, pushing trams as far as the relays, and she was soaked in such a bath of perspiration that she stopped a moment to wipe her face. At the bottom of the cutting, where he was hammering at the seam with his mates chaval was astonished when he no longer heard the rumble of the wheels the lamps burnt badly and the coal dust made it impossible to see what's up he shouted when she answered that she was sure she would melt and that her heart was going to stop he replied furiously do like us stupid take off your shift they were seven hundred and eight meters to the north in the first passage of the Desiree seam which was at a distance of three kilometres from the pit eye when they spoke of this part of the pit the miners of the region grew pale and lowered their voices as if they had spoken of hell and most often they were content to shake their heads as men who would rather not speak of these depths of fiery furnace as the galleries sank towards the north they approached tartaret 
penetrating to that interior fire which calcined the rocks above the cuttings at the point at which they had arrived had an average temperature of forty five degrees they were there in the accursed city in the midst of the flames which the passers-by on the plain could see through the fissures spitting out sulphur and poisonous vapors catherine who had already taken off her jacket hesitated then took off her trousers also and with naked arms and naked thighs her chemise tied round her hips by a cord like a blouse she began to push again anyhow that's better she said aloud in the stifling heat she still felt a vague fear ever since they began working here five days ago she had thought of the stories told her in childhood of those putter girls of the days of old who were burning beneath tartaret as a punishment for things which no one dared to repeat no doubt she was too big now to believe such silly stories but still what would she do if she were suddenly to see coming out of the wall a girl as red as a stove with eyes like live coals the idea made her perspire still more at the relay eighty metres from the cutting another putter took the tram and pushed it eighty metres farther to the upbrow so that the receiver could forward it with the others which came down from the upper galleries gracious you're making yourself uncomfortable said this woman a lean widow of thirty when she saw catherine in her chemise i can't do it the trammers at the brow bother me with their dirty tricks ah well replied the young girl i don't care about the men i feel too bad she went off again pushing an empty tram the worst was that in this bottom passage another cause joined with the neighbourhood of tartaret to make the heat unbearable they were by the side of old workings a very deep abandoned gallery of gaston marie where ten years earlier an explosion of fire damp had set the seam alight and it was still burning behind the clay wall which had been built there and was kept constantly repaired in order to limit the disaster deprived of air the fire ought to have become extinct but no doubt unknown currents kept it alive it had gone on for ten years and heated the clay wall like the bricks of an oven so that those who passed felt half roasted it was along this wall for a length of more than a hundred metres that the haulage was carried on in a temperature of sixty degrees after two journeys catherine again felt stifled fortunately the passage was large and convenient in this desiree seam one of the thickest in the district the bed was one metre ninety in height and the men could work standing but they would rather have worked with twisted necks and a little fresh air hello there are you asleep said chaval again roughly as soon as he no longer heard catherine moving how the devil did i come to get such a jade will you just fill your tram and push she was at the bottom of the cutting leaning on her shovel she was feeling ill and she looked at them all with a foolish air without obeying she scarcely saw them by the reddish gleam of the lamps entirely naked like animals so black so encrusted in sweat and coal that their nakedness did not frighten her it was a confused task the bending of ape-like backs an infernal vision of scorched limbs spending their strength amid dull blows and groans but they could see her better no doubt for the picks left off hammering and they joked her about taking off her trousers eh you'll catch cold look out it's because she's got such fine legs i say cheval there's enough there for two. Oh, we must see lift up higher higher then cheval without growing angry at these jokes turned on her that's it by god ah she likes dirty jokes she'd stay there to listen till to-morrow catherine had painfully decided to fill her tram then she pushed it the gallery was too wide for her to get a purchase on the timber on both sides her naked feet were twisted in the rails where they sought a point of support while she slowly moved on her arms stiffened in front and her back breaking as soon as she came up to the clay wall the fiery torture again began and the sweat fell from her whole body in enormous drops as from a storm cloud she had scarcely got a third of the way before she streamed blinded soiled also by the black mud 
her narrow chemise as though dipped in ink was sticking to her skin and rising up to her waist with the movement of her thighs it hurt her so that she had once more to stop her task what was the matter with her then to-day never before had she felt as if there were wool in her bones it must be the bad air the ventilation did not reach to the bottom of this distant passage one breathed there all sorts of vapours which came out of the coal with the low bubbling sound of a spring so abundantly sometimes that the lamps would not burn to say nothing of fire damp which nobody noticed for from one week's end to the other the men were always breathing it into their noses throughout the scene she knew that bad air well dead air the miners called it the heavy asphyxiating gases below above them the light gases which catch fire and blow up all the stalls of a pit with hundreds of men in a single burst of thunder from her childhood she had swallowed so much that she was surprised she bore it so badly with buzzing ears and burning throat unable to go farther she felt the need of taking off her chemise it was beginning to torture her this garment of which the least folds cut and burnt her she resisted the longing and tried to push again but was forced to stand upright then quickly saying to herself that she would cover herself at the relay she took off everything the cord and the chemise so feverishly that she would have torn off her skin if she could and now naked and pitiful brought down to the level of the female animal seeking its living in the mire of the streets covered with soot and mud up to the belly she laboured on like a cab hack on all fours she pushed onwards but despair came it gave her no relief to be naked what more could she take off the buzzing in her ears deafened her she seemed to feel a vice gripping her temples she fell on her knees the lamp wedged into the coal in the tram seemed to her to be going out the intention to turn up the wick alone survived in the midst of her confused ideas twice she tried to examine it and both times when she placed it before her on the earth she saw it turn pale as though it also lacked breath suddenly the lamp went out then everything whirled around her in the darkness a millstone turned in her head her heart grew weak and left off beating numbed in its turn by the immense weariness which was putting her limbs to sleep she had fallen back in anguish amid the asphyxiating air close to the ground by god i believe she's lazing again growled chaval's voice he listened from the top of the cutting and could hear no sound of wheels eh catherine you damned worm his voice was lost afar in the black gallery and not a breath replied i'll come and make you move i will nothing stirred there was only the same silence as of death he came down furiously rushing along with his lamp so violently that he nearly fell over the putter's body which barred the way he looked at her in stupefaction what was the matter then was it humbug a pretense of going to sleep but the lamp which he had lowered to light up her face threatened to go out he lifted it and lowered it afresh and at last understood it must be a gust of bad air his violence disappeared the devotion of the miner in face of a comrade's peril was awakening within him he shouted for her chemise to be brought and seized the naked and unconscious girl in his arms holding her as high as possible when their garments had been thrown over her shoulders he set out running supporting his burden with one hand and carrying the two lamps with the other the deep galleries unrolled before him as he rushed along turning to the right then to the left seeking life in the frozen air of the plain which blew down the air shaft at last the sound of a spring stopped him the trickle of water flowing from the rock he was at a square in the great haulage gallery which formerly led to gaston marie the air here blew in like a tempest and was so fresh that a shudder went through him as he seated himself on the earth against the props his mistress was still unconscious with closed eyes catherine come now by god no humbug hold yourself up a bit while i dip this in the water he was frightened to find her so limp however he was able to dip her chemise in the spring and to bathe her face with it she was like a corpse already buried in the depth of the earth 
with her slender girlish body which seemed to be still hesitating before swelling to the form of puberty then a shudder ran over her childish breast over the belly and thighs of the poor little creature deflowered before her time she opened her eyes and stammered i'm cold ah that's better now cried chaval relieved he dressed her slipped on the chemise easily but swore over the difficulty he had in getting on the trousers for she could not help much she remained dazed not understanding where she was nor why she was naked when she remembered she was ashamed how had she dared to take everything off and she questioned him had she been seen so without even a handkerchief around her waist to cover up he joked and made up stories saying that he had just brought her there in the midst of all the mates standing in a row what an idea to have taken his advice and exhibited her bum afterwards he declared that the mates could not even know whether it was round or square he had rushed along so swiftly the deuce but i'm dying of cold he said dressing himself in turn never had she seen him so kind usually for one good word that he said to her she received at once two bullying ones it would have been so pleasant to live in agreement a feeling of tenderness went through her in the languor of her fatigue she smiled at him and murmured kiss me he embraced her and lay down beside her waiting till she was able to walk you know she said again you were wrong to shout at me over there for i couldn't do more really even in the cutting you're not so hot if you only knew how it roasts you at the bottom of the passage sure enough he replied it would be better under the trees you feel bad in that stall i'm afraid my poor girl she was so touched at hearing him agree with her that she tried to be brave oh it's a bad place then to-day the air is poisoned but you shall see soon if i'm a worm when one has to work one works isn't it true i'd die rather than stop there was silence he held her with one arm round her waist pressing her against his breast to keep her from harm although she already felt strong enough to go back to the stall she forgot everything in her delight only she went on in a very low voice i should like it so much if you were kinder yes it is so good when we love each other a little and she began to cry softly but i do love you he cried for i've taken you with me she only replied by shaking her head there are often men who take women just in order to have them caring mighty little about their happiness her tears flowed more hotly it made her despair now to think of the happy life she would have led if she had chanced to fall to another lad whose arm she would always have felt thus round her waist another and the vague image of that other arose from the depth of her emotion but it was done with she only desired now to live to the end with this one if he would not hustle her about too much then she said try to be like this sometimes sobs cut short her words and he embraced her again you're a stupid there i swear to be kind i'm not worse than any one else go on she looked at him and began to smile through her tears perhaps he was right one never met women who were happy then although she distrusted his oath she gave herself up to the joy of seeing him affectionate good god if only that could last they had both embraced again and as they were pressing each other in a long clasp they heard steps which made them get up three mates who had seen them pass had come up to know how she was they set out together it was nearly ten o'clock and they took their lunch into a cool corner before going back to sweat at the bottom of the cutting they were finishing the double slice of bread and butter their brick and were about to drink the coffee from their tin when they were disturbed by a noise coming from stalls in the distance what then was it another accident they got up and ran pikemen putters trammers crossed them at every step no one knew anything all were shouting it must be some great misfortune gradually the whole mine was in terror frightened shadows emerged from the galleries lanterns danced and flew away in the darkness where was it why could no one say all at once a captain passed shouting they are cutting the cables they are cutting the cables 
then the panic increased it was a furious gallop through the gloomy passages their heads were confused why cut the cables and who was cutting them when the men were below it seemed monstrous but the voice of another captain was heard and then lost the monsoon men are cutting the cables let every one go up when he had understood chaval stopped catherine short the idea that he would meet the monsoon men up above should he get out paralyzed his legs it had come then that band which he thought had got into the hands of the police for a moment he thought of retracing his path and ascending through gaston marie but that was no longer possible he swore hesitating hiding his fear repeating that it was stupid to run like that they would not surely leave them at the bottom the captain's voice echoed anew now approaching them let every one go up to the ladders to the ladders and chaval was carried away with his mates he pushed catherine and accused her of not running fast enough did she want then to remain in the pit to die of hunger for those monsieur brigands were capable of breaking the ladders without waiting for people to come up this abominable suggestion ended by driving them wild along the galleries there was only a furious rush helter-skelter a race of madmen each striving to arrive first and mount before the others some men shouted that the ladders were broken and that no one could get out and then in frightened groups they began to reach the pit-eye where they were all engulfed they threw themselves toward the shaft they crushed through the narrow door to the ladder passage while an old groom who had prudently led back the horses to the stable looked at them with an air of contemptuous indifference accustomed to spend nights in the pit and certain that he could eventually be drawn out of it by god will you climb up in front of me said chaval to catherine at least i can hold you if you fall out of breath and suffocated by this race of three kilometres which had once more bathed her in sweat she gave herself up without understanding to the eddies of the crowd then he pulled her by the arm almost breaking it and she cried with pain her tears bursting out already he was forgetting his oath never would she be happy go on then he roared but he frightened her too much if she went first he would bully her the whole time so she resisted while the wild flood of their comrades pushed them to one side the water that filled her from the shaft was falling in great drops and the floor of the pit eye shaken by this tramping was trembling over the sump the muddy cesspool ten metres deep at jean bart two years earlier a terrible accident had happened just here the breaking of a cable had precipitated the cage to the bottom of the sump in which two men had been drowned and they all thought of this every one would be left down there if they all crowded on to the planks confounded the dunderhead shouted chaval die then i shall be rid of you he climbed up and she followed from the bottom to daylight there were a hundred and two ladders about seven metres in length each placed on a narrow landing which occupied the breadth of the passage and in which a square hole scarcely allowed the shoulders to pass it was like a flat chimney seven hundred metres in height between the wall of the shaft and the brattice of the winding cage a damp pipe black and endless in which the ladders were placed one above the other almost straight in regular stages it took a strong man twenty-five minutes to climb up this great column the passage however was no longer used except in cases of accident catherine at first climbed bravely her naked feet were used to the hard coal on the floors of the passages and did not suffer from the square rungs covered with iron rods to prevent them from wearing away her hands hardened by the haulage grasped without fatigue the uprights that were too big for her and it even interested her and took her out of her grief this unforeseen ascent this long serpent of men flowing on and hoisting themselves up three on a ladder so that even when the head should emerge in daylight the tail would still be trailing over the sump they were not there yet the first could hardly have ascended a third of the shaft no one spoke now only their feet moved with a low sound while the lamps like travelling stars 
spaced out from below upward formed a continually increasing line catherine heard a tremor behind her counting the ladders it gave her the idea of counting them also they had already mounted fifteen and were arriving at a landing place but at that moment she collided with chaval's legs he swore shouting to her to look out gradually the whole column stopped and became motionless what then had something happened and every one recovered his voice to ask questions and to express fear their anxiety had increased since leaving the bottom their ignorance as to what was going on above oppressed them more as they approached daylight some one announced that they would have to go down again that the ladders were broken that was the thought that preoccupied them all the fear of finding themselves face to face with space another explanation came down from mouth to mouth there had been an accident a pikeman slipped from a rung no one knew exactly the shouts made it impossible to hear were they going to bed there at last without any precise information being obtained the ascent began again with the same slow painful movement in the midst of the tread of feet and the dancing of lamps it must certainly be higher up that the ladders were broken at the thirty-second ladder as they passed a third landing stage catherine felt her legs and arms grow stiff at first she had felt a slight tingling in her skin now she lost the sensation of the iron and the wood beneath her feet and in her hands a vague pain which gradually became burning heated her muscles and in the dizziness which came over her she recalled her grandfather bonmort's stories of the days when there was no passage and little girls of ten used to take out the coal on their shoulders of bare ladders so that if one of them slipped or a fragment of coal simply rolled out of a basket three or four children would fall down head first from the blow the cramp in her limbs became unbearable she would never reach the end fresh stoppages allowed her to breathe but the terror which was communicated every time from above dazed her still more above and below her respiration became more difficult this interminable ascent was causing giddiness and the nausea affected her with the others she was suffocating intoxicated with the darkness exasperated with the walls which crushed against her flesh and shuddering also with the dampness her body perspiring beneath the great drops which fell on her they were approaching a level where so thick a rain fell that it threatened to extinguish their lamps chaval twice spoke to catherine without obtaining any reply what the devil was she doing down there had she let her tongue fall she might just tell him if she was all right they had been climbing for half an hour but so heavily that he had only reached the fifty-ninth ladder there were still forty-three catherine at last stammered that she was getting on all right he would have treated her as a worm if she had acknowledged her weariness the iron of the rungs must have cut her feet it seemed to her that it was sawing in up to the bone after every grip she expected to see her hands leave the uprights they were so peeled and stiff she could not close her fingers and she feared she would fall backward with torn shoulders and dislocated thighs in this continual effort it was especially the defective slope of the ladders from which she suffered the almost perpendicular position which obliged her to hoist herself up by the strength of her wrists with her belly against the wood the panting of many breaths now drowned the sound of the feet forming an enormous moan multiplied tenfold by the partition of the passage arising from the depths and expiring towards the light there was a groan word ran along that a trammer had just cut his head open against the edge of a stair and catherine went on climbing they had passed the level the rain had ceased a mist made heavy the cellar like air poisoned with the odor of old iron and damp wood mechanically she continued to count in a low voice eighty one eighty two eighty three still nineteen the repetition of these figures supported her merely by their rhythmic balance she had no further consciousness of her movements when she lifted her eyes the lamps turned in a spiral her blood was flowing she felt that she was dying the last breath would have knocked her over 
the worst was that those below were now pushing and that the entire column was stampeding yielding to the growing anger of its fatigue the furious need to see the sun again the first mates had emerged there were then no broken ladders but the idea that they might yet be broken to prevent the last from coming up when others were already breathing up above nearly drove them mad and when a new stoppage occurred oaths broke out and all went on climbing hustling each other passing over each other's bodies to arrive at all costs then catherine fell she had cried chaval's name in despairing appeal he did not hear he was struggling digging his heels into a comrade's ribs to get before him and she was rolled down and trampled over as she fainted she dreamed it seemed to her that she was one of the little putter girls of old days and that a fragment of coal fallen from the basket above her had thrown her to the bottom of the shaft like a sparrow struck by a flint five ladders only remained to climb it had taken nearly an hour she never knew how she reached daylight carried up on people's shoulders supported by the throttling narrowness of the passage suddenly she found herself in the dazzling sunlight in the midst of a yelling crowd who were hooting her End of section twenty five section twenty six of germinal by emile zola translation by havelock ellis this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. part five chapter three from early morning before daylight a tremor had agitated the settlements and that tremor was now swelling through the roads and over the whole country but the departure had not taken place as arranged for the news had spread that cavalry and police were scouring the plain it was said that they had arrived from douai during the night and rasseneur was accused of having betrayed his mates by warning m hennebeau a putter even swore that she had seen the servant taking a dispatch to the telegraph office the miners clenched their fists and watched the soldiers from behind their shutters by the pale light of the early morning towards half-past seven as the sun was rising another rumour circulated reassuring the impatient it was a false alarm a simple military promenade such as the general occasionally ordered since the strike had broken out at the desire of the prefect of lille the strikers detested this official they reproached him with deceiving them by the promise of a conciliatory intervention which was limited to a march of troops into monceau every week to overawe them so when the cavalry and police quietly took the road back to marchands after contenting themselves with deafening the settlements by the stamping of their horses over the hard earth the miners jeered at this innocent prefect and his soldiers who turned on their heels when things were beginning to get hot up until nine o'clock they stood peacefully about in good humour before their houses following with their eyes up the streets the meek backs of the last gendarmes in the depths of their large beds the good people of monceau were still sleeping with their heads among the feathers at the manager's house madame Hennebeau had just been seen in the carriage leaving m Hennebeau at work no doubt for the closed and silent villa seemed dead not one of the pits had any military guard it was a fatal lack of foresight in the hour of danger the natural stupidity which accompanies catastrophes the fault which a government commits whenever there is need of precise knowledge of the facts and nine o'clock was striking when the colliers at last took the vandam road to repair to the rendezvous decided on the day before in the forest etienne had very quickly perceived that he would certainly not find over jean bart the three thousand comrades of whom he was counting many believed that the demonstration was put off and the worst was that two or three bands already on the way would compromise the cause if he did not at all costs put himself at their head almost a hundred who had set out before daylight were taking refuge beneath the forest beaches waiting for the others so whom the young man went up to consult shrugged his shoulders 
ten resolute fellows could do more work than a crowd and he turned back to the open book before him refusing to join in the thing threatened to turn into sentiment when it would have been enough to adopt the simple method of burning monceau as etienne left the house he saw rasseneur seated before the metal stove and looking very pale while his wife in her everlasting black dress was abusing him in polite and cutting terms Mahieu was of opinion that they ought to keep their promise a rendezvous like this was sacred however the night had calmed their fever he was now fearing misfortune and he explained that it was their duty to go over there to maintain their mates in the right path Mahieu approved with a nod etienne repeated complacently that it was necessary to adopt revolutionary methods without attempting any person's life before setting out he refused his share of a loaf that had been given him the evening before together with a bottle of gin but he drank three little glasses one after the other saying that he wanted to keep out the cold he even carried away a tinful alzire would look after the children old bon mort whose legs were suffering from yesterday's walk remained in bed they did not go away together from motives of prudence jeanlin had disappeared long ago maheu and Mihid went off on the side sloping towards monceau while etienne turned towards the forest where he proposed to join his mates on the way he caught up a band of women among whom he recognized mother brulé and the levaque woman as they walked they were eating chestnuts which moquette had brought they swallowed the skins so as to feel more in their stomachs but in the forest he found no one the men were already at jean bart he took the same course and arrived at the pit at the moment when levaque and some hundreds others were penetrating into the square miners were coming up from every direction the men by the main road the women by the fields all at random without leaders without weapons flowing naturally thither like water which runs down a slope etienne perceived jeanlin who had climbed up on a footbridge installed as though at a theatre he ran faster and entered among the first there were scarcely three hundred of them there was some hesitation when deneulin showed himself at the top of the staircase which led to the receiving room what do you want he asked in a loud voice after having watched the disappearance of the carriage from which his daughters were still laughing towards him he had returned to the pit overtaken by a strange anxiety everything however was found in good order the men had gone down the cage was working and he became reassured again and was talking to the head captain when the approach of the strikers was announced to him he had placed himself at a window of the screening shed and in the face of this increasing flood which filled the square he at once felt his impotence how could he defend these buildings open on every side he could scarcely group some twenty of his workmen round himself he was lost what do you want he repeated pale with repressed anger making an effort to accept his disaster courageously there were pushes and growls amid the crowd etienne at last came forward saying we do not come to injure you sir but work must cease everywhere deneulin frankly treated him as an idiot do you think you will benefit me if you stop work at my place you might just as well fire a gun off into my back yes my men are below and they shall not come up unless you mean to murder me first these rough words raised a clamour maheu had to hold back levaque who was pushing forward in a threatening manner while etienne went on discussing and tried to convince deneulin of the lawfulness of their revolutionary conduct but the latter replied by the right to work besides he refused to discuss such folly he meant to be master in his own place his only regret was that he had not four gendarmes here to sweep away this mob to be sure it is my fault i deserve what has happened to me with fellows of your sort force is the only argument the government thinks to buy you by concessions you will throw it down that's all when it has given you weapons etienne was quivering but still held himself in he lowered his voice i beg you sir give the order for your men to come up i cannot answer for my mates you may avoid a disaster no 
be good enough to let me alone do i know you you do not belong to my works you have no quarrel with me it is only brigands who thus scour the country to pillage houses loud vociferations now drowned his voice the women especially abused him but he continued to hold his own experiencing a certain relief in this frankness with which he expressed his disciplinarian nature since he was ruined in any case he thought platitudes a useless cowardice but their numbers went on increasing nearly five hundred were pushing towards the door and he might have been torn to pieces if his head captain had not pulled him violently back for mercy's sake sir there will be a massacre what is the good of letting men be killed for nothing he struggled and protested in one last cry thrown at the crowd you set of brigands you will know what when we are strongest again they led him away the hustling of the crowd had thrown the first ranks against the staircase so that the rail was twisted it was the women who pushed and screamed and urged on the men the door yielded at once it was a door without a lock simply closed by a latch but the staircase was too narrow for the pushing crowd which would have taken long to get in if the rear of the besiegers had not gone off to enter by other openings then they poured in on all sides by the shed the screening place the boiler buildings in less than five minutes the whole pit belonged to them they swarmed at every story in the midst of furious gestures and cries carried away by their victory over this master who resisted maheu and terror had rushed forward among the first saying to etienne they must not kill him the latter was already running then when etienne understood that deneulin had barricaded himself in the captain's room he replied well would it be our fault such a madman he was feeling anxious however being still too calm to yield to this outburst of anger his pride of leadership also suffered on seeing the band escape from his authority and become enraged going beyond the cold execution of the will of the people such as he had anticipated in vain he called for coolness shouting that they must not put right on their enemy's side by acts of useless destruction to the boilers shouted mother brule put out the fires levaque who had found a file was brandishing it like a dagger dominating the tumult with a terrible cry cut the cables cut the cables soon they all repeated this only etienne and maheu continued to protest dazed and talking in the tumult without obtaining silence at last the farmer was able to say but there are men below mates the noise redoubled and voices arose from all sides so much the worse ought not to be down serve the traitors right yes yes let them stay there and then they have the ladders then when this idea of the ladders had made them still more obstinate etienne saw that he would have to yield for fear of a greater disaster he hastened towards the engine wishing at all events to bring the cages up so that the cables being cut above the shaft should not smash them by falling down with their enormous weight the engine man had disappeared as well as the few daylight workers and he took hold of the starting lever manipulating it while levaque and two others climbed up the metal scaffold which supported the pulleys the cages were hardly fixed on the keeps when the strident sound was heard of the file biting into the steel there was deep silence and this noise seemed to fill the whole pit all raised their heads looking and listening seized by emotion in the first rank maheu felt a fierce joy possess him as if the teeth of the file would deliver them from misfortune by eating into the cable of one of these dens of wretchedness into which they would never descend again but mother brule had disappeared by the shed stairs still shouting the fires must be put out to the boilers to the boilers some women followed her Mehud hastened to prevent them from smashing everything just as her husband had tried to reason with the men she was the calmest of them one could demand one's rights without making a mess in people's places when she entered the boiler building the women were already chasing away the two stokers and the brule armed with a large shovel and crouching down before one of the stoves was violently emptying it throwing the red-hot coke 
on to the brick floor where it continued to burn with black smoke there were ten stoves for the five boilers soon the women warmed to the work the levaque manipulating her shovel with both hands moquette raising her clothes up to her thighs so as not to catch fire all looking red in the reflection of the flames sweating and dishevelled in this witch's kitchen the piles of coal increased and the burning heat cracked the ceiling of the vast hall enough now cried maheude the storeroom is a fire so much the better replied mother brulé that will do the work ah by god haven't i said that i would pay them out for the death of my man at this moment jeanlin's shrill voice was heard look out i'll put it out i will i'll let it all off he had come in among the first and had kicked his legs about among the crowd delighted at the fray and seeking out what mischief he could do the idea had occurred to him to turn on the discharge taps and let off the steam the jets came out with the violence of volleys the five boilers were emptied with the sound of a tempest whistling in such a roar of thunder that one's ears seemed to bleed everything had disappeared in the midst of the vapour the hot coal grew pale and the women were nothing more than shadows with broken gestures the child alone appeared mounted on the gallery behind the whirlwinds of white steam filled with delight and grinning broadly in the joy of unchaining this hurricane this lasted nearly a quarter of an hour a few buckets of water had been thrown over the heaps to complete their extinction all danger of a fire had gone by but the anger of the crowd had not subsided on the contrary it had been whipped up men went down with hammers even the women armed themselves with iron bars and they talked of smashing boilers of breaking engines and of demolishing the mine etienne forewarned hastened to come up with Mehu. he himself was becoming intoxicated and carried away by this hot fever of revenge he struggled however and entreated them to be calm now that with cut cables extinguished fires and empty boilers work was impossible he was not always listened to and was again about to be carried away by the crowd when hoots arose outside a little low door where the latter passage emerged down with the traitors oh the dirty chops of the cowards down with them down with them the men were beginning to come up from below the first arrivals blinded by the daylight stood there with quivering eyelids then they moved away trying to gain the road and flee down with the cowards down with the traitors the whole band of strikers had run up in less than three minutes there was not a man left in the buildings the five hundred Mosso men were ranged in two rows and the vandamme men who had had the treachery to go down were forced to pass between this double hedge and as every fresh miner appeared at the door of the passage covered with the black mud of work and with garments in rags the hooting redoubled and ferocious jokes arose oh look at that one three inches of legs and then his arse and this one with his nose eaten by those vulcan girls and this other with eyes pissing out enough wax to furnish ten cathedrals and this other the tall fellow without a rump and as long as lent an enormous putter woman who rolled out with her breast to her belly and her belly to her backside raised a furious laugh they wanted to handle them the joking increased and was turning to cruelty blows would soon have rained while the row of poor devils came out shivering and silent beneath the abuse with sidelong looks and expectation of blows glad when they could at last rush away out of the mine hello how many are there in there asked etienne he was astonished to see them still coming out and irritated at the idea that it was not a mere handful of workers urged by hunger terrorized by the captains they had lied to him then in the forest nearly all jean bart had gone down but a cry escaped from him and he rushed forward when he saw chaval standing on the threshold by god is this the rendezvous you called us to imprecations broke out and there was a movement of the crowd towards the traitor what he has sworn with them the day before and now they found him down below with the others was he then making fools of people off with him to the shaft to the shaft 
chaval white with fear stammered and tried to explain but etienne cut him short carried out of himself and sharing the fury of the band you wanted to be in it and you shall be in it come on take your damned snout along another clamour covered his voice catherine in her turn had just appeared dazzled by the bright sunlight and frightened at falling into the midst of these savages she was panting with legs aching from the hundred and two ladders and with bleeding palms when Mehude, seeing her rushed forward with her hand up ah slut you too when your mother is dying of hunger you betray her for your bully Mehu held back her arm and stopped the blow but he shook his daughter he was enraged like his wife he threw her conduct in her face and both lost their heads shouting louder than their mates the sight of catherine had completed etienne's exasperation he repeated on we go to the other pits and you come with us you dirty devil chaval had scarcely time to get his savants from the shed and to throw his woollen jacket over his frozen shoulders they all dragged him on forcing him to run in the midst of them catherine bewildered also put on her sabots buttoning at her neck her man's old jacket with which she kept off the cold and she ran behind her lover she would not leave him for surely they were going to murder him then in two minutes jean bart was emptied jean lin had found a horn and was blowing it producing hoarse sounds as though he were gathering oxen together the women mother brule the levaque and moquette raised their skirts to run while levaque with an axe in his hand manipulated it like a drum major's stick other men continued to arrive they were nearly a thousand without order again flowing on to the road like a torrent let loose the gates were too narrow and the palings were broken down to the pits down with the traders no more work and jean bart fell suddenly into a great silence not a man was left not a breath was heard deneulin came out of the captain's room and quite alone with a gesture forbidding any one to follow him he went over the pit he was pale and very calm at first he stopped before the shaft lifting his eyes to look at the cut cables the steel ends hung useless the bite of the file had left a living scar a fresh wound which gleamed in the black grease afterwards he went up to the engine and looked at the crank which was motionless like the joint of a colossal limb struck by paralysis he touched the metal which had already cooled and the cold made him shudder as though he had touched a corpse then he went down to the boiler room walked slowly before the extinguished stoves yawning and inundated and struck his foot against the boilers which sounded hollow well it was quite finished his ruin was complete even if he mended the cables and lit the fires where would he find men another fortnight's strike and he would be bankrupt and in this certainty of disaster he no longer felt any hatred of the Monceau brigands he felt that all had a complicity in it that it was a general age-long fault they were brutes no doubt but brutes who could not read and who were dying of hunger End of section twenty six section twenty seven of germinal by emil zola translated by havelock ellis this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard part five chapter four and the troop went off over the flat plain white with frost beneath the pale winter sun and overflowed the path as they passed through the beetroot fields from the forshall bouffs etienne had assumed command he cried his orders while the crowd moved on and organized the march john lynn galloped at the head performing barbarous music on his horn then the women came in the first ranks some of them armed with sticks they hid with wild eyes seemed to be seeking afar for the promised city of justice mother brule the levaque woman moquette striding along beneath their rags like soldiers setting off for the seat of war if they had any encounters we should see if the police dared to strike women 
and the men followed in a confused flock a stream that grew larger and larger bristling with iron bars and dominated by levaque's single axe with its blade glistening in the sun etienne in the middle kept cheval in sight forcing him to walk before him while Mahieu, behind gloomily kept an eye on catherine the only woman among these men obstinately trotting near her lover for fear that he would be hurt bare heads were dishevelled in the air only the clank of sabots could be heard like the movement of released cattle carried away by jeanlin's wild trumpeting but suddenly a new cry arose bread 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 it was midday the hunger of six weeks on strike was awaking in these empty stomachs whipped up by this race across the fields the few crusts of the morning and moquette's chestnuts had long been forgotten their stomachs were crying out and the suffering was added to their fury against the traders to the pits no more work bread etienne who had refused to eat his share at the settlement felt an unbearable tearing sensation in his chest he made no complaint but mechanically took his tin from time to time and swallowed a gulp of gin shaking so much that he thought he needed it to carry him to the end his cheeks were heated and his eyes inflamed he kept his head however and still wished to avoid needless destruction as they arrived at the oiselle road a vandamme pikeman who had joined the band for revenge on his master impelled the men towards the right shouting to gaston marie must stop the pump let the water ruin jean bart the mob was already turning in spite of the protests of etienne who begged them to let the pumping continue what was the good of destroying the galleries it offended his workman's heart in spite of his resentment maheu also thought it unjust to take revenge on a machine but the pikeman still shouted his cry of vengeance and etienne had to cry still louder to marou there are traitors down there to marou to marou with a gesture he had turned the crowd towards the left road while jeanlin going ahead was blowing louder than ever an eddy was produced in the crowd this time gaston marie was saved and the four kilometres which separated them from miro were traversed in half an hour almost at a running pace across the interminable plain the canal on this side cut it with a long icy ribbon the leafless trees on the banks changed by the frost into giant candelabra alone broke this pale uniformity prolonged and lost in the sky at the horizon as in a sea an undulation of the ground hid monceau and marchiane there was nothing but bare immensity they reached the pit and found a captain standing on a footbridge at the screening shed to receive them they all well knew father Quandieu the doyen of the Monceau captains an old man whose skin and hair were quite white and who was in his seventies a miracle of fine health in the mines what have you come after here you pack of meddlers he shouted the band stopped it was no longer a master it was a mate and a certain respect held them back before this old workman there are men down below said etienne make them come up yes there are men there said father Quandieu. some six dozen the others were afraid of you evil beggars but i warn you that not one comes up or you will have to deal with me exclamations arose the men pushed the women advanced quickly coming down from the footbridge the captain now barred the door then maheu tried to interfere it is our right old man how can we make the strike general if we don't force all the mates to be on our side the old man was silent a moment evidently his ignorance on the subject of coalition equaled the pikeman's at last he replied it may be your right i don't say but i only know my orders i am alone here the men are down till three and they shall stay there till three the last words were lost in hooting this were threateningly advanced the women deafened him and their hot breath blew in his face but he still held out his head erect and his beard and hair white as snow his courage had so swollen his voice that he could be heard distinctly over the tumult 
by god you shall not pass as true as the sun shines i would rather die than let you touch the cables don't push any more or i'm damned if i don't fling myself down the shaft before you the crowd drew back shuddering and impressed he went on where is the beast who does not understand that i am only a workman like you others i have been told to guard here and i'm guarding that was as far as father Quandieu's intelligence went stiffened by his obstinacy of military duty his narrow skull and eyes dimmed by the black melancholy of half a century spent underground the men looked at him moved feeling within them an echo of what he said this military obedience the sense of fraternity and resignation in danger he saw that they were hesitating still and repeated i'm damned if i don't fling myself down the shaft before you a great recoil carried away the mob they all turned and in the rush took the right-hand road which stretched far away through the fields again cries arose to madeleine to crecourt no more work bread bread but in the centre as they went on there was hustling it was cheval they said who was trying to take advantage of an opportunity to escape etienne had seized him by the arm threatening to do for him if he was planning some treachery and the other struggled and protested furiously what's all this for isn't that man free i've been freezing the last hour i want to clean myself let me go he was in fact suffering from the coal glued to his skin by sweat and his woolen garment was no protection on you go or we'll clean you replied etienne don't expect to get your life at a bargain they were still running and he turned towards catherine who was keeping up well it annoyed him to feel her so near him so miserable shivering beneath her man's old jacket and her muddy trousers she must be nearly dead of fatigue she was running all the same you can go off you can he said at last catherine seemed not to hear her eyes on meeting etienne's only flamed with reproach for a moment she did not stop why did he want her to leave her man cheval was not at all kind it was true he would even beat her sometimes but he was her man the one who had had her first and it enraged her that they should throw themselves on him more than a thousand of them she would have defended him without any tenderness at all out of pride off you go repeated maheu violently her father's order slackened her course for a moment she trembled and her eyelids swelled with tears then in spite of her fear she came back to the same place again still running then they let her be the mob crossed the oiselle road went a short distance up the cron road and then mounted towards Colny. On this side, factory chimneys striped the flat horizon. Wooden sheds, brick workshops with large dusty windows, appeared along the street. They passed one after another the low buildings of two settlements, that of the saint quatre vingt then that of the soixante six And from each of them, at the sound of the horn and the clamor arising from every mouth, whole families came out men women and children running to join their mates in the rear when they came up to madeleine there were at least fifteen hundred the road descended in a gentle slope the rumbling flood of strikers had to turn round the pit-bank before they could spread over the mine square it was now not more than two o'clock but the captains had been warned and were hastening the ascent as the band arrived the men were all up only some twenty remained and were now disembarking from the cage they fled and were pursued with stones two were struck another left the sleeve of his jacket behind this manhunt saved the material and neither the cables nor the boilers were touched the flood was already moving away rolling on towards the next pit this one crevecourt was only five hundred metres away from madeleine there also the mob arrived in the midst of the ascent a putter girl was taken and whipped by the women with her breeches split open and her buttocks exposed before the laughing men the trammer boys had their ears boxed the pikemen got away their sides blue from blows and their noses bleeding 
and in this growing ferocity in this old need of revenge which was turning every head with madness the choked cries went on death to traitors hatred against ill-paid work the roaring of bellies after bread they began to cut the cables but the file would not bite and the task was too long now that the fever was on them for moving onward forever onward at the boilers a tap was broken while the water thrown by buckets full into the stoves made the metal gratings burst outside they were talking of marching on st thomas this was the best disciplined pit the strike had not touched it nearly seven hundred men must have gone down there this exasperated them they would wait for these men with sticks ranged for battle just to see who would get the best of it but the rumor ran along that there were gendarmes at st thomas the gendarmes of the morning whom they had made fun of how was this known nobody could say no matter they were seized by fear and decided on foutre cantel their giddiness carried them on all were on the road clanking their sabots rushing forward to foutre cantel to foutre cantel the cowards there were certainly four hundred in number and there would be fun situated three kilometres away this pit lay in a fold of the ground near the scarp they were already climbing the slope of the platrières beyond the road to bojny when a voice no one knew from whom threw out the idea that the soldiers were perhaps down there at foutre cantel then from one to the other of the column it was repeated that the soldiers were down there they slackened their march panic gradually spread in the country idle without work which they had been scouring for hours why had they not come across any soldiers this impunity troubled them at the thought of the repression which they felt to be coming without any one knowing where it came from a new word of command turned them towards another pit to the victoire to the victoire were there then neither soldiers nor police at the victoire nobody knew all seemed reassured and turning round they descended from the beaumont side and cut across the fields to reach the Wazelle road the railway line barred their passage and they crossed it pulling down the palings now they were approaching Monceau. the gradual undulation of the landscape grew less the sea of beetroot fields enlarged reaching far away to the black houses at marchiennes this time it was a march of five good kilometres so strong an impulse pushed them on that they had no feeling of their terrible fatigue or of their bruised and wounded feet the rear continued to lengthen increased by mates enlisted on the roads and in the settlements when they had passed the canal at the magash bridge and appeared before the victoire there were two thousand of them but three o'clock had struck the ascent was completed not a man remained below their disappointment was spent in vain threats they could only heave broken bricks at the workmen who had arrived to take their duty at the earth cutting there was a rush and the deserted pit belonged to them and in their rage at not finding a traitor's face to strike they attacked things a rankling abscess was bursting within them a poison boil of slow growth years and years of hunger tortured them with a thirst for massacre and destruction behind a shed etienne saw some porters filling a wagon with coal will you just clear out of the bloody place he shouted not a bit of coal goes out at his orders some hundred strikers ran up and the porters only had time to escape men unharnessed the horses which were frightened and set off struck in the haunches while others overturning the wagon broke the shafts levaque with violent blows of his axe had thrown himself on the platforms to break down the footbridges they resisted and it occurred to him to tear up the rails destroying the line from one end of the square to the other soon the whole band set to this task maheu made the metal chairs leap up armed with his iron bar which he used as a lever during this time mother brule led away the women and invaded the lamp cabin where their sticks covered the soil with a carnage of lamps Mehid, carried out of herself was laying about her as vigorously as the levaque woman all were soaked in oil 
and mouquette dried her hands on her skirt laughing to find herself so dirty jeanlin for a joke had emptied a lamp down her neck but all this revenge produced nothing to eat stomachs were crying out louder than ever and the great lamentation dominated still bread 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 a former captain at the victoire kept a stall near by no doubt he had fled in fear for his shed was abandoned when the women came back and men had finished destroying the railway they besieged the stall the shutters of which yielded at once they found no bread there there were only two pieces of raw flesh and a sack of potatoes but in the pillage they discovered some fifty bottles of gin which disappeared like a drop of water drunk up by the sand etienne having emptied his tin was able to refill it little by little a terrible drunkenness the drunkenness of the starved was inflaming his eyes and baring his teeth like a wolf's between his pallid lips suddenly he perceived that chaval had gone off in the midst of the tumult he swore and men ran to seize the fugitive who was hiding with catherine behind the timber supply ah you dirty swine you are afraid of getting into trouble shouted etienne it was you in the forest who called for a strike of the engine men to stop the pumps and now you want to play us a filthy trick very well by god we will go back to gaston marie i will have you smash the pump yes by god you shall smash it he was drunk he was urging his men against this pump which he had saved a few hours earlier to gaston marie to gaston marie they all cheered and rushed on while chaval seized by the shoulders was drawn and pushed violently along while he constantly asked to be allowed to wash will you take yourself off then cried maheu to catherine who had also begun to run again this time she did not even draw back but turned her burning eyes on her father and went on running once more the mob ploughed through the flat plain they were retracing their steps over the long straight paths by the fields endlessly spread out it was four o'clock the sun which approached the horizon lengthened the shadows of this horde with their furious gestures over the frozen soil they avoided Monceau and farther on rejoined the Loiselle road to spare the journey round forche au bouf they passed beneath the walls of violaine the grégoires had just gone out having to visit a lawyer before going to dine with the Anbos, where they would find cecile the estate seemed asleep with its avenue of deserted limes its kitchen garden and its orchard bared by the winter nothing was stirring in the house and the closed windows were dulled by the warm steam within out of the profound silence an impression of good-natured comfort arose the patriarchal sensation of good beds and a good table the wise happiness of the proprietor's existence without stopping the band cast gloomy looks through the grating and at the length of protecting walls bristling with broken bottles the cry arose again bread 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 the dogs alone replied by barking ferociously a pair of great danes with rough coats who stood with open jaws and behind the closed blind there were only the servants melanie the cook and honorine the housemaid attracted by this cry pale and perspiring with fear at seeing these savages go by they fell on their knees and thought themselves killed on hearing a single stone breaking a pane of a neighbouring window it was a joke of jean lens he had manufactured a sling with a piece of cord and had just sent a little passing greeting to the grégoires already he was again blowing his horn the band was lost in the distance and the cry grew fainter bread 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 they arrived at gaston marie in still greater numbers more than two thousand five hundred madmen breaking everything sweeping away everything with the force of a torrent which gains strength as it moves the police had passed here an hour earlier and had gone off towards st thomas led astray by some peasants in their haste they had not even taken the precaution of leaving a few men behind to guard the pit in less than a quarter of an hour the fires were overturned the boilers emptied the buildings torn down and devastated but it was the pump which they specially threatened it was not enough to stop it in the last expiring breath of its steam they threw themselves on it 
as on a living person whose life they required the first blow is yours repeated etienne putting a hammer into chaval's hand come you have sworn with the others chaval drew back trembling and in the hustling the hammer fell while other men without waiting battered the pump with blows from iron bars blows from bricks blows from anything they could lay their hands on some even broke sticks over it the nuts leapt off the pieces of steel and copper were dislocated like torn limbs the blow of a shovel delivered with full force fractured the metal body the water escaped and emptied itself and there was a supreme gurgle like an agonizing death rattle that was the end and the mob found themselves outside again madly pushing on behind etienne who would not let chaval go kill him the traitor to the shaft to the shaft the livid wretch clinging with imbecile obstinacy to his fixed idea continued to stammer his need of cleaning himself wait if that bothers you said the levaque woman here here's a bucket there was a pond there an infiltration of the water from the pump it was white with a thick layer of ice and they struck it and broke the ice forcing him to dip his head in this cold water duck then repeated mother brule by god if you don't duck we'll shove you in and now you shall have a drink of it yes yes like a beast with your jaws in the trough he had to drink on all fours they all laughed with cruel laughter one woman pulled his ears another woman threw in his face a handful of dung found fresh on the road his old woolen jacket in tatters no longer held together he was haggard stumbling and with struggling movements of his hips he tried to flee maheu had pushed him and maheu was among those who grew furious both of them satisfying their old spite even moquette who generally remained such good friends with her old lovers was wild with this one treating him as a good-for-nothing and talking of taking his breeches down to see if he was still a man etienne made her hold her tongue that's enough there's no need for all to set to it if you like you we will just settle it together his fists closed and his eyes were lit up with homicidal fury his intoxication was turning into the, the desire to kill are you ready one of us must stay here give him a knife i've got mine catherine exhausted and terrified gazed at him she remembered his confidences his desire to devour a man when he had drunk poisoned after the third glass to such an extent had his drunkard's appearance put this beastliness into his body suddenly she leapt forward struck him with both her woman's hands and choking with indignation shouted into his face coward 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 isn't it enough then all his abominations you want to kill him now that he can't stand upright any longer she turned towards her father and her mother she turned towards the others you are cowards cowards kill me then with him i will tear your eyes out i will if you touch him again oh the cowards and she planted herself before her man to defend him forgetting the blows forgetting the life of misery lifted up by the idea that she belonged to him since he had taken her and that it was a shame for her when they so crushed him etienne had grown pale beneath this girl's blows at first he had been about to knock her down then after having wiped his face with the movement of a man who is recovering from intoxication he said to chaval in the midst of deep silence she is right that's enough off you go immediately chaval was away and catherine galloped behind him the crowd gazed at them as they disappeared round a corner of the road but maheu muttered you were wrong ought to have kept him he is sure to be after some treachery but the mob began to march on again five o'clock was about to strike the sun as red as a furnace on the edge of the horizon seemed to set fire to the whole plain a peddler who was passing informed them that the military were descending from the crecour side then they turned an order ran to Monceau, to the manager bread 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 end of section twenty seven section twenty eight of germinal by emile zola 
translation by havelock ellis this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard part five chapter five monsieur rambeau had placed himself in front of his study window to watch the departure of the carriage which was taking away his wife to lunch at marchand his eyes followed Negrel for a moment as he trotted beside the carriage door then he quietly returned and seated himself at his desk when neither his wife nor his nephew animated the place with their presence the house seemed empty on this day the coachman was driving his wife rose the new housemaid had leave to go out till five o'clock there only remained hippolyte the valet de chambre trailing about the rooms in slippers and the cook who had been occupied since dawn in struggling with her saucepans entirely absorbed in the dinner which was to be given in the evening so m hennebeau promised himself a day of serious work in this deep calm of the deserted house towards nine o'clock although he had received orders to send every one away hippolyte took the liberty of announcing dansart who was bringing news the manager then heard for the first time of the meeting in the forest the evening before the details were very precise and he listened while thinking of the intrigue with piron so well known that two or three anonymous letters every week denounced the licentiousness of the head captain evidently the husband had talked and no doubt the wife had too he even took advantage of the occasion he let the head captain know that he was aware of everything contenting himself with recommending prudence for fear of a scandal startled by these reproaches in the midst of his report dansart denied stammered excuses while his great nose confessed the crime by its sudden redness he did not insist however glad to get off so easily for as a rule the manager displayed the implacable severity of the virtuous man whenever an employee allowed himself the indulgence of a pretty girl in the pit the conversation continued concerning the strike that meeting in the forest was only the swagger of blusterers nothing serious threatened in any case the settlements would surely not stir for some days beneath the impression of respectful fear which must have been produced by the military promenade of the morning when m hennebeau was alone again he was however on the point of sending a telegram to the prefect only the fear of uselessly showing a sign of anxiety held him back already he could not forgive himself his lack of insight in saying everywhere and even writing to the directors that the strike would last at most a fortnight it had been going on and on for nearly two months to his great surprise and he was in despair over it he felt himself every day lowered and compromised and was forced to imagine some brilliant achievement which would bring him back into favour with the directors he had just asked them for orders in the case of a skirmish there was delay over the reply and he was expecting it by the afternoon post he said to himself that there would be time then to send out telegrams and to obtain the military occupation of the pits if such was the desire of those gentlemen in his own opinion there would certainly be a battle and an expenditure of blood this responsibility troubled him in spite of his habitual energy up to eleven o'clock he worked peacefully there was no sound in the dead house except hippolyte's waxing stick which was rubbing a floor far away on the first floor then one after the other he received two messages the first announcing the attack on jean bart by the monceau band the second telling of the cut cables the overturned fires and all the destruction he could not understand why had the strikers gone to Denelin instead of attacking one of the company's pits besides they were quite welcome to sack vandame that would merely ripen the plan of conquest which he was meditating and at midday he lunched alone in the large dining-room served so quietly by the servant that he could not even hear his slippers the solitude rendered his preoccupations more gloomy he was feeling cold at the heart when a captain who had arrived running was shown in and told him of the mob's march on miro almost immediately 
as he was finishing his coffee a telegram informed him that madeleine and crecourt were in their turn threatened then his perplexity became extreme he was expecting the postman at two o'clock ought he at once to ask for troops or would it be better to wait patiently and not to act until he had received the director's orders he went back into his study he wished to read a report which he had asked negrel to prepare the day before for the prefect but he could not put his hand on it he reflected that perhaps the young man had left it in his room where he often wrote at night and without taking any decision pursued by the idea of this report he went upstairs to look for it in the room as he entered m hennebeau was surprised the room had not been done no doubt through hippolyte's forgetfulness or laziness there was a moist heat there the close heat of the past night made heavier from the mouth of the hot air stove being left open and he was suffocated too with a penetrating perfume which he thought must be the odour of the toilet waters with which the basin was full there was great disorder in the room garments scattered about damp towels thrown on the backs of chairs the bed yawning with a sheet drawn back and draggling on the carpet but at first he only glanced round with an abstracted look as he went towards a table covered with papers to look for the missing report twice he examined the papers one by one but it was certainly not there where the devil could that madcap paul have stuffed it and as m hennebeau went back into the middle of the room giving a glance at each article of furniture he noticed in the open bed a bright point which shone like a star he approached mechanically and put out his hand it was a little gold scent bottle lying between two folds of the sheet he at once recognized a scent bottle belonging to madame hennebeau the little ether bottle which was always with her but he could not understand its presence here how could it have got into paul's bed and suddenly he grew terribly pale his wife had slept there beg your pardon sir murmured hippolyte's voice through the door i saw you going up the servant entered and was thrown into consternation by the disorder lord why the room is not done so rose has gone out leaving all the house on my shoulders m hennebeau had hidden the bottle in his hand and was pressing it almost to breaking what do you want it's another man sir he has come from crecourt with a letter good leave me alone tell him to wait his wife had slept there when he had bolted the door he opened his hand again and looked at the little bottle which had left its image in red on his flesh suddenly he saw and understood this filthiness had been going on in his house for months he recalled his old suspicion the rustling against the doors the naked feet at night through the silent house yes it was his wife who went up to sleep there falling into a chair opposite the bed which he gazed at fixedly he remained some minutes as though crushed a noise aroused him someone was knocking at the door trying to open it he recognized the servant's voice sir ah you are shut in sir what is it now there seems to be a hurry the men are breaking everything there are two more messengers below there are also some telegrams you just leave me alone i am coming directly the idea that hippolyte would himself have discovered the scent bottle had he done the room in the morning had just frozen him and besides this man must know he must have found the bed still hot with adultery twenty times over with madame's hairs trailing on the pillow and abominable traces staining the linen the man kept interrupting him and it could only be out of inquisitiveness perhaps he had stayed with his ear stuck to the door excited by the debauchery of his masters m hennebeau did not move he still gazed at the bed his long past of suffering unrolled before him his marriage with this woman their immediate misunderstanding of the heart and of the flesh the lovers whom she had had unknown to him and the lover whom he had tolerated for ten years as one tolerates an impure taste in a sick woman then came their arrival at montsou the mad hope of curing her 
months of languor of sleepy exile the approach of old age which would perhaps at last give her back to him then their nephew arrived this paul to whom she became a mother and to whom she spoke of her dead heart buried forever beneath the ashes and he the imbecile husband foresaw nothing he adored this woman who was his wife whom other men had possessed but whom he alone could not possess he adored her with shameful passion so that he would have fallen on his knees if she would but have given him the leavings of other men the leavings of the others she gave to this child the sound of a distant gong at this moment made m hennebeau start he recognized it it was struck by his orders when the postman arrived he rose and spoke aloud breaking into the flood of coarseness with which his parched throat was bursting in spite of himself ah i don't care a bloody hang for their telegrams and their letters not a bloody hang now he was carried away by rage the need of some sewer in which to stamp down all this filthiness with his heels this woman was a vulgar drab he sought for crude words and buffeted her image with them the sudden idea of the marriage between cecile and paul which she was arranging with so quiet a smile completed his exasperation there was then not even passion not even jealousy at the bottom of this persistent sensuality it was now a perverse plaything the habit of the woman a recreation taken like an accustomed dessert and he put all the responsibility on her he regarded as almost innocent the lad at whom she had bitten in this reawakening of appetite just as one bites at an early green fruit stolen by the wayside whom would she devour of on whom would she fall when she no longer had complacent nephews sufficiently practical to accept in their own family the table the bed and the wife there was a timid scratch at the door and hippolyte allowed himself to whisper through the keyhole the postman sir and monsieur dansart too has come back saying that they are killing one another i'm coming down good god what should he do to them chase them away on their return from marchiennes like stinking animals whom he would no longer have beneath his roof he would take a cudgel and would tell them to carry elsewhere their poisonous coupling it was with their sighs with their mixed breaths that the damp warmth of this room had grown heavy the penetrating odour which had suffocated him with the odour of musk which his wife's skin exhaled another perverse taste a fleshly need of violent perfumes and he seemed to feel also the heat and odour of fornication of living adultery in the pots which lay about in the basin still full in the disorder of the linen of the furniture of the entire room tainted with vice the fury of impotence threw him on to the bed which he struck with his fists belabouring the places where he saw the imprint of their two bodies enraged with the disordered coverlets and the crumpled sheets soft and inert beneath his blows as though exhausted themselves by the embraces of the whole night but suddenly he thought he heard hippolyte coming up again he was arrested by shame for a moment he stood panting wiping his forehead calming the bounds of his heart standing before a mirror he looked at his face so changed that he did not recognize himself then when he had watched it gradually grow calmer by an effort of supreme will he went downstairs five messengers were standing below not counting Danser. all brought him news of increasing gravity concerning the march of the strikers among the pits and the chief captain told him at length what had gone on at Mero and the fine behaviour of father Quandieu. he listened nodding his head but he did not hear his thoughts were in the room upstairs at last he sent them away saying that he would take due measures when he was alone again seated before his desk he seemed to grow drowsy with his head between his hands covering his eyes his mail was there and he decided to look for the expected letter the director's reply the lines at first danced before him but he understood at last that these gentlemen desired a skirmish certainly they did not order him to make things worse but they allowed it to be seen that disturbances would hasten the conclusion of the strike by provoking energetic repression 
after this he no longer hesitated but sent off telegrams on all sides to the prefect of lille to the court of soldiery at Douai, to the police at marchiennes it was a relief he had nothing to do but shut himself in he even spread the report that he was suffering from gout and all the afternoon he hid himself in his study receiving no one contenting himself with reading the telegrams and letters which continued to rain in he thus followed the mob from afar from madeleine to crevecourt from crevecourt to the victoire from the victoire to gaston marie information also reached him of the bewilderment of the police and the troops wandering along the roads and always with their backs to the pit attacked they might kill one another and destroy everything he put his head between his hands again with his fingers over his eyes and buried himself in the deep silence of the empty house where he only heard now and then the noise of the cook's saucepans as she bustled about preparing the evening's dinner the twilight was already darkening the room it was five o'clock when a disturbance made m hombeau jump as he sat dazed and inert with his elbows in his papers he thought that it was the two wretches coming back but the tumult increased and a terrible cry broke out just as he was going to the window bread 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 it was the strikers now invading Monceau, while the police expecting an attack on the Verreaux, were galloping off in the opposite direction to occupy that pit just then two kilometres away from the first houses a little beyond the crossways where the main road cut the vandamme road madame hombeau and the young ladies had witnessed the passing of the mob the day had been spent pleasantly at marchiennes there had been a delightful lunch with the manager of the forges then an interesting visit to the workshops and to the neighbouring glassworks to occupy the afternoon and as they were now going home in the limpid decline of the beautiful winter day cecile had had the whim to drink a glass of milk as she noticed a little farm near the edge of the road they all then got down from the carriage and negrel gallantly leapt off his horse while the peasant woman alarmed by all these fine people rushed about and spoke of laying a cloth before serving the milk but lucie and jean wanted to see the cow milked and they went into the cattle shed with their cups making a little rural party and laughing greatly at the litter in which one sank madame hombeau with her complacent maternal air was drinking with the edge of her lips when a strange roaring noise from without disturbed her what is that then the cattle shed built at the edge of the road had a large door for carts for it was also used as a barn for hay the young girls who had put out their heads were astonished to see on the left a black flood a shouting band which was moving along the vandamme road the deuce muttered negrel who had also gone out are our brawlers getting angry at last it is perhaps the colliers again said the peasant woman this is twice they've passed seems things are not going well they are masters out of the country she uttered every word prudently watching the effects on their faces and when she noticed the fright of all of them and their deep anxiety at this encounter she hastened to conclude oh the rascals the rascals negrel seeing that it was too late to get into their carriage and reach monceau ordered the coachman to bring the vehicle into the farmyard where it would remain hidden behind a shed he himself fastened his horse which a lad had been holding beneath the shed when he came back he found his aunt and the young girls distracted and ready to follow the peasant woman who proposed that they should take refuge in her house but he was of opinion that they would be safer where they were for certainly no one would come and look for them in the hay the door however shut very badly and had such large chinks in it that the road could be seen between the worm-eaten planks come courage he said we will sell our lives dearly this joke increased their fear the noise grew louder but nothing could yet be seen along the vacant road the wind of a tempest seemed to be blowing like those sudden gusts which precede great storms no no i don't want to look said cecile going to hide herself in the hay madame hombeau who was very pale and felt angry with these people who had spoiled her pleasure 
stood in the background with a sidelong look of repugnance while lucy and jeanne though trembling had placed their eyes at a crack anxious to lose nothing of the spectacle a sound of thunder came near the earth was shaken and jeanlin galloped up first blowing into his horn take out your scent bottles the sweat of the people is passing by murmured Negrel, who in spite of his republican convictions liked to make fun of the populace when he was with ladies but this witticism was carried away in the hurricane of gestures and cries the women had appeared nearly a thousand of them with outspread hair dishevelled by running the naked skin appearing through their rags the nakedness of females weary with giving birth to starvelings a few held their little ones in their arms raising them and shaking them like banners of mourning and vengeance others who were younger with swollen breasts of amazons brandished sticks while frightful old women were yelling so loudly that the cords of their fleshless necks seemed to be breaking and then the men came up two thousand madmen trammers pikemen menders a compact mass which rolled along like a single block in confused serried rank so that it was impossible to distinguish their faded trousers or ragged woolen jackets all effaced in the same earthly uniformity their eyes were burning and one only distinguished the holes of black mouths singing the marseillaise the stanzas were lost in a confused roar accompanied by the clang of sabots over the hard earth above their heads amid the bristling iron bars an axe passed by carried erect and this single axe which seemed to be the standard of the band showed in the clear air the sharp profile of a guillotine blade what atrocious faces stammered madame hanbeau negrel said between his teeth devil take me if i can recognize one of them where did the bandits spring from and in fact anger hunger these two months of suffering and this enraged helter-skelter through the pits had lengthened the placid faces of the montsou colliers into the muzzles of wild beasts at this moment the sun was setting its last rays of sombre purple cast a gleam of blood over the plain the road seemed to be full of blood men and women continued to rush by bloody as butchers in the midst of slaughter oh superb whispered lucy and jean stirred in their artistic taste by the beautiful horror of it they were frightened however and drew back close to madame hanbeau who was leaning on a trough she was frozen at the thought that a glance between the planks of that disjointed door might suffice to murder them negrel also who was usually very brave felt himself grow pale seized by a terror that was superior to his will the terror which comes from the unknown cecile in the hay no longer stirred and the others in spite of the wish to turn away their eyes could not do so they were compelled to gaze it was the red vision of the revolution which would one day inevitably carry them all away on some bloody evening at the end of the century yes some evening the people unbridled at last would thus gallop along the roads making the blood of the middle class flow parading severed heads and sprinkling gold from disemboweled coffers the women would yell the men would have those wolf-like jaws open to bite yes the same rags the same thunder of great sabots the same terrible troop of dirty skins and tainted breath sweeping away the old world beneath an overflowing flood of barbarians fires would flame they would not leave standing one stone of the towns they would return to the savage life of the woods after the great rut the great feast day when the poor in one night would emaciate the wives and empty the cellars of the rich there would be nothing left not a sou of the great fortunes not a title deed of properties acquired until the day dawned when a new earth would perhaps spring up once more yes it was these things which were passing along the road it was the force of nature herself and they were receiving the terrible wind of it in their faces a great cry arose dominating the marseillaise bread 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 lucy and jean pressed themselves against madame hanbeau who was almost fainting while negrel placed himself before them as though to protect them by his body 
was the old social order cracking this very evening and what they saw immediately after completed their stupefaction the band had nearly passed by there were only a few stragglers left when moquette came up she was delaying watching the bourgeois at their garden gates or the windows of their houses and whenever she saw them as she was not able to spit in their faces she showed them what for her was the climax of contempt doubtless she perceived some one now for suddenly she raised her skirts bent her back and showed her enormous buttocks naked beneath the last rays of the sun there was nothing obscene in those fierce buttocks and nobody laughed everything disappeared the flood rolled on to monceau along the turns of the road between the low houses streaked with bright colours the carriage was drawn out of the yard but the coachman would not take it upon him to convey back madame and the young ladies without delay the strikers occupied the street and the worst was there was no other road we must go back however for dinner will be ready said madame hambeau exasperated by annoyance and fear these dirty workpeople have again chosen a day when i have visitors how can you do good to such creatures lucy and jean were occupied in pulling cecile out of the hay she was struggling believing that those savages were still passing by and repeating that she did not want to see them at last they all took their places in the carriage again it then occurred to negrel who had remounted that they might go through the regular lanes go gently he said to the coachman for the road is atrocious if any groups prevent you from returning to the road over there you can stop behind the old pit and we will return on foot through the little garden door while you can put up the carriage and horses anywhere in some inn outhouse they set out the band far away was streaming into monceau as they had twice seen police and military the inhabitants were agitated and seized by panic abominable stories were circulating it was said that written placards had been set up threatening to rip open the bellies of the bourgeois nobody had read them but all the same they were able to quote the exact words at the lawyers especially the terror was at its height for he had just received by post an anonymous letter warning him that a barrel of powder was buried in his cellar and that it would be blown up if he did not declare himself on the side of the people just then the gregoires prolonging their visit on the arrival of this letter were discussing it and deciding that it must be the work of a joker when the invasion of the mob completed the terror of the house they however smiled drawing back a corner of the curtain to look out and refused to admit that there was any danger certain they said that all would finish up well five o'clock struck and they had time to wait until the street was free for them to cross the road to dine with the Ambos, where cecile who had surely returned must be waiting for them but no one in monceau seemed to share their confidence people were wildly running about doors and windows were banged too they saw Magrat on the other side of the road barricading his shop with a large supply of iron bars and looking so pale and trembling that his feeble little wife was obliged to fasten the screws the band had come to a halt before the manager's villa and the cry echoed bread 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 Monsieur Rambeau was standing at the window when Hippolyte came in to close the shutters, for fear the windows should be broken by stones. He closed all on the ground floor, and then went up to the first floor. The creak of the window fasteners was heard, and the clack of the shutters, one by one. Unfortunately, it was not possible to shut the kitchen window in the area in the same way. A window made disquietingly ruddy by the gleams from the saucepans and the spit mechanically m rambeau who wished to look out went up to paul's room on the second floor it was on the left the best situated for it commanded the road as far as the company's yards and he stood behind the blinds overlooking the crowd but this room had again overcome him the toilet table sponged and in order the cold bed with neat and well-drawn sheets all his rage of the afternoon that furious battle in the depths of his silent solitude had now turned to an immense fatigue his whole being was now like this room grown cold swept of the filth of the morning 
returned to its habitual correctness what was the good of a scandal had anything really changed in his house his wife had simply taken another lover that she had chosen him in the family scarcely aggravated the fact perhaps even it was an advantage for she thus preserved appearances he pitied himself when he thought of his mad jealousy how ridiculous to have struck that bed with his fists since he had tolerated another man he could certainly tolerate this one it was only a matter of a little more contempt a terrible bitterness was poisoning his mouth the uselessness of everything the internal pain of existence shame for himself who had always adored and desired this woman in the dirt in which he had abandoned her beneath the window the yells broke out with increased violence bread 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 idiots said m hombo between his clenched teeth he heard them abusing him for his large salary calling him a bloated idler a bloody beast who stuffed himself to indigestion with good things while the worker was dying of hunger the women had noticed the kitchen and there was a tempest of imprecations against the pheasant roasting there against the sauces that with fat odors irritated their empty stomachs ah the stinking bourgeois they should be stuffed with champagne and truffles till their guts burst bread 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 idiots repeated m hombeau am i happy anger arose in him against these people who could not understand he would willingly have made them a present of his large salary to possess their hard skin and their facility of coupling without regret why could he not seat them at his table and stuff them with his pheasant while he went to fornicate behind the hedges to tumble the girls over making fun of those who had tumbled them over before him he would have given everything his education his comfort his luxury his power as manager if he could be for one day the vilest of the wretches who obeyed him free of his flesh enough of a blackguard to beat his wife and to take his pleasure with his neighbors wives and he longed also to be dying of hunger to have an empty belly a stomach twisted by cramps that would make his head turn with giddiness perhaps that would have killed the eternal pain ah to live like a brute to possess nothing to scour the fields with the ugliest and dirtiest putter and to be able to be happy bread 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 then he grew angry and shouted furiously in the tumult bread is that enough idiots he could eat and all the same he was groaning with torment his desolate household his whole wounded life choked him at the throat like a death agony things were not all for the best because one had bread who was the fool who placed earthly happiness in the partition of wealth these revolutionary dreamers might demolish society and rebuild another society they would not add one joy to humanity they would not take away one pain by cutting bread and butter for everybody they would even enlarge the unhappiness of the earth they would one day make the very dogs howl with despair when they had taken them out of the tranquil satisfaction of instinct to raise them to the unappeasable suffering of passion no the one good thing was not to exist and if one existed to be a tree a stone less still a grain of sand which cannot bleed beneath the heels of the passer-by and in this exasperation of his torment tears swelled in m hombeau's eyes and broke in burning drops on his cheeks the twilight was drowning the road when stones began to riddle the front of the villa with no anger now against these starving people only enraged by the burning wound at his heart he continued to stammer in the midst of his tears idiots idiots but the cry of the belly dominated and a roar blew like a tempest sweeping everything before it bread 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 End of section twenty eight Section twenty nine of Germanon by Emile Zola translation by Havelock Ellis. This Livervox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part five, Chapter six. 
sobered by catherine's blows etienne had remained at the head of his mates but while he was hoarsely urging them on to montsou he heard another voice within him the voice of reason asking in astonishment the meaning of all this he had not intended any of these things how had it happened that having set out for jean bart with the object of acting calmly and preventing disaster he had finished this day of increasing violence by besieging the manager's villa he it certainly was however who had just cried halt only at first his sole idea had been to protect the company's yards which there had been talk of sacking and now that stones were already grazing the facade of the villa he sought in vain for some lawful prey on which to throw the band so as to avoid greater misfortunes as he thus stood alone powerless in the middle of the road he was called by a man standing on the threshold of the estaminet de Son, where the landlady had just put up the shutters in haste leaving only the door free yes it's me will you listen it was rasseneur some thirty men and women nearly all belonging to the settlement of the dulcin quarant who had remained at home in the morning and had come in the evening for news had invaded this estaminet on the approach of the strikers zacharie occupied a table with his wife philomene farther on perron and Piron, with their backs turned were hiding their faces no one was drinking they had simply taken shelter etienne recognized rasseneur and was turning away when the latter added you don't want to see me eh i warned you things are getting awkward now you may ask for bread they'll give you lead then etienne came back and replied what troubles me is the cowards who fold their arms and watch us risking our skins your notion then is to pillage over there asked rasseneur my notion is to remain to the last with our friends quit by dying together in despair etienne went back into the crowd ready to die on the road three children were throwing stones and he gave them a good kick shouting out to his comrades that it was no good breaking windows bever and lighting who had rejoined jeanlin were learning from him how to work the sling they each set a flint playing at who could do the most damage Lydy had awkwardly cracked the head of a woman in the crowd and the two boys were loudly laughing bonmort and mulk seated on a bench were gazing at them behind bonmort's swollen legs bore him so badly that he had great difficulty in dragging himself so far no one knew what curiosity impelled him for his face had the earthy look of those days when he never spoke a word nobody however any longer obeyed etienne the stones in spite of his orders went on hailing and he was astonished and terrified by these brutes he had unmuzzled who were so slow to move and then so terrible so ferociously tenacious in their rage all the old flemish blood was there heavy and placid taking months to get heated and then giving itself up to abominable savagery listening to nothing until the beast was glutted by atrocities in his southern land crowds flamed up more quickly but they did not effect so much he had to struggle with levaque to obtain possession of his axe and he knew not how to keep back the Mahus, who were throwing flints with both hands the women especially terrified him the levaque moquette and the others who were agitated by murderous fury with teeth and nails out barking like bitches and driven on by mother brule whose lean figure dominated them but there was a sudden stop a moment's surprise brought a little of that calmness which etienne's supplications could not obtain it was simply the grégoires who had decided to bid farewell to the lawyer and to cross the road to the manager's house and they seemed so peaceful they so clearly had the air of believing that the whole thing was a joke on the part of their worthy miners whose resignation had nourished them for a century that the latter in fact left off throwing stones for fear of hitting this old gentleman and old lady who had fallen from the sky they allowed them to enter the garden mount the steps 
and rang at the barricaded door which was by no means opened in a hurry just then rose the housemaid was returning laughing at the furious workmen all of whom she knew for she belonged to montsou and it was she who by striking her fists against the door at last forced hippolyte to set it ajar it was time for as the grégoires disappeared the hail of stones began again recovering from its astonishment the crowd was shouting louder than ever death to the bourgeois hurrah for the people rose went on laughing in the hall of the villa as though amused by the adventure and repeated to the terrified manservant they're not bad-hearted i know them m grégoire methodically hung up his hat then when he had assisted madame grégoire to draw off her thick cloth mantle he said in his turn certainly they have no malice at bottom when they have shouted well they will go home to supper with more appetite at this moment m hennebeau came down from the second floor he had seen the scene and came to receive his guests in his usual cold and polite manner the pallor of his face alone revealed the grief which had shaken him the man was tamed there only remained in him the correct administrator resolved to do his duty you know he said the ladies have not yet come back for the first time some anxiety disturbed the grégoires cecile not come back how could she come back now if the miners were to prolong their joking i thought of having the place cleared added m hennebeau but the misfortune is that i am alone here and besides i do not know where to send my servant to bring me four men and a corporal to clear away this mob rose who had remained there ventured to murmur anew oh sir they are not bad-hearted the manager shook his head while the tumult increased outside and they could hear the dull crash of the stones against the house i don't wish to be hard on them i can even excuse them one must be as foolish as they are to believe that we are anxious to injure them but it is my duty to prevent disturbance to think that there are police all along the roads as i am told and that i have not been able to see a single man since the morning he interrupted himself and drew back before madame grégoire saying let me beg you madame do not stay here come into the drawing-room but the cook coming up from below in exasperation kept them in the hall a few minutes longer she declared that she could no longer accept any responsibility for the dinner for she was expecting from the marchiennes pastry cook some vol crusts which she had ordered for four o'clock the pastry cook had evidently turned aside on the road for fear of these bandits perhaps they had even pillaged his hampers she saw the vol blockaded behind a bush besieged going to swell the bellies of the three thousand wretches who were asking for bread in any case monsieur was warned she would rather pitch her dinner into the fire if it was to be spoilt because of the revolt patience patience said m hennebeau all is not lost the pastry cook may come and as he turned toward madame grégoire opening the drawing-room door himself he was much surprised to observe seated on the hall bench a man whom he had not distinguished before in the deepening shade what you magrat what is it then magrat arose his fat pale face was changed by terror he no longer possessed his usual calm stolidity he humbly explained that he had slipped into the manager's house to ask for aid and protection should the brigands attack his shop you see that i am threatened myself and that i have no one replied m hennebeau you would have done better to stay at home and guard your property oh i have put up iron bars and left my wife there the manager showed impatience and did not conceal his contempt a fine guard that poor creature worn out by blows well i can do nothing you must try to defend yourself i advise you to go back at once for there they are again demanding bread listen in fact the tumult began again and maigrat thought he heard his own name in the midst of the cries to go back was no longer possible they would have torn him to pieces besides the idea of his ruin overcame him he pressed his face to the glass panel of the door 
perspiring and trembling in anticipation of disaster while the gregoires decided to go into the drawing-room m Hennebeau quietly endeavoured to do the honours of his house but in vain he begged his guests to sit down the close barricaded room lighted by two lamps in the daytime was filled with terror at each new clamour from without amid the stuffy hangings the fury of the mob rolled more disturbingly with vague and terrible menace they talked however constantly brought back to this inconceivable revolt he was astonished at having foreseen nothing and his information was so defective that he specially talked against rasseneur whose detestable influence he said he was able to recognize besides the gendarmes would come it was impossible that he should be thus abandoned as to the grégoires they only thought about their daughter the poor darling who was so quickly frightened perhaps in face of the peril the carriage had returned to marchiennes they waited on for another quarter of an hour worn out by the noise in the street and by the sound of the stones from time to time striking the closed shutters which rang out like gongs the situation was no longer bearable m hennebeau spoke of going out to chase away the brawlers by himself and to meet the carriage when hippolyte appeared exclaiming sir sir here is madame they are killing madame the carriage had not been able to pass through the threatening groups in the Requillard lane negrel had carried out his idea walking the hundred metres which separated them from the house and knocking at the little door which led to the garden near the common the gardener would hear them for there was always someone there to open and at first things had gone perfectly madame Envo and the young ladies were already knocking when some women who had been warned rushed into the lane then everything was spoiled the door was not opened and negrel in vain sought to burst it open with his shoulder the rush of women increased and fearing they would be carried away he adopted the desperate method of pushing his aunt and the girls before him in order to reach the front steps by passing through the besiegers but this manoeuvre led to a hustling they were not left free a shouting band followed them while the crowd floated up to right and to left without understanding simply astonished at these dressed-up ladies lost in the midst of the battle at this moment the confusion was so great that it led to one of those curious mistakes which can never be explained lucy and jean reached the steps and slipped in through the door which the housemaid opened madame Hambeau had succeeded in following them and behind them negrel at last came in and then bolted the door feeling sure that he had seen cecile go in first she was no longer there having disappeared on the way so carried away by fear that she had turned her back to the house and had moved of her own accord into the thick of danger at once the cry arose hurrah for the people death to the bourgeois to death with them a few of those in the distance beneath the veil which hid her face mistook her for madame Ambeau. others said she was a friend of the manager's wife the young wife of a neighbouring manufacturer who was execrated by his men and besides it mattered little it was her silk dress her fur mantle even the white feather in her hat which exasperated them she smelled of perfume she wore a watch she had the delicate skin of a lazy woman who had never touched coal stop shouted mother brule we'll put it on your arse that lace the lazy sluts steal it from us said the Levaque. they stick fur on to their skins while we are dying of cold just strip her naked to show her how to live at once moquette rushed forward yes yes whip her and the women in this savage rivalry struggled and stretched out their rags as though each were trying to get a morsel of this rich girl no doubt her backside was not better made than any one else's more than one of them were rotten beneath their gewgaws this injustice had lasted quite long enough they should be forced to dress themselves like workwomen these harlots who dared to spend fifty sous on the washing of a single petticoat in the midst of these furies cecile was shaking with paralyzed legs stammering over and over again the same phrase ladies please please ladies please don't hurt me but she suddenly uttered a shrill cry cold hands had seized her by the neck 
the rush had brought her near old bonnard who had taken hold of her he seemed drunk from hunger stupefied by his long misery suddenly arousing himself from the resignation of half a century under the influence of no one knew what malicious impulse after having in the course of his life saved a dozen mates from death risking his bones in fire damps and landslips he was yielding to things which he would not have been able to express compelled to do thus fascinated by this young girl's white neck and as on this day he had lost his tongue he clenched his fingers with his air of an old infirm animal ruminating over his recollections no no yelled the women uncover her arse out with her arse in the villa as soon as they had realized the mishap the negrel and m hennebeau bravely reopened the door to run to cecile's help but the crowd was now pressing against the garden railings and it was not easy to go out a struggle took place here while the gregoires in terror stood on the steps let her be then old man it's the pilain young lady cried maheude to the grandfather recognizing cecile whose veil had been torn off by one of the women on his side etienne overwhelmed at this retaliation on a child was trying to force the band to let go their prey an inspiration came to him he brandished the axe which he had snatched from levaque's hands to maigrat's house by god there's bread in there down to the earth with maigrat's damned shed and at random he gave the first blow of the axe against the shop door some comrades had followed him levaque maheu and a few others but the women were furious and cecile had fallen from bonnemort's fingers into mother brulee's hands Lady and bebert led by jeanlin had slipped on all fours between her petticoats to see the lady's bottom already the women were pulling her about her clothes were beginning to split when a man on horseback appeared pushing on his animal and using his riding whip on those who would not stand back quick enough ah rascals you are going to flog our daughters are you it was denalon who had come to the rendezvous for dinner he quickly jumped on to the road took cecile by the waist and with the other hand manipulating his horse with remarkable skill and strength he used it as a living wedge to split the crowd which drew back before the onset at the railing the battle continued he passed through however with some bruises this unforeseen assistance delivered negrel and m rambeau who were in great danger amid the oaths and blows and while the young man at last led in the fainting cecile Denelin protected the manager with his tall body and at the top of the steps received a stone which nearly put his shoulder out that's it he cried break my bones now you've broken my engines he promptly pushed the door to and a volley of flints fell against it what madmen he exclaimed two seconds more and they would have broken my skull like an empty cord there is nothing to say to them what could you do they know nothing you can only knock them down in the drawing-room the gregoires were weeping as they watched cecile recover she was not hurt there was not even a scratch to be seen only her veil was lost but their fright increased when they saw before them their cook melanie who described how the mob had demolished Pilain. mad with fear she had run to warn her masters she had come in when the door was ajar at the moment of the fray without anyone noticing her and in her endless narrative the single stone with which jeanlin had broken one window-pane became a regular cannonade which had crushed through the walls then m grégoire's ideas were altogether upset they were murdering his daughter they were raising his house to the ground it was then true that these miners could bear him ill-will because he lived like a worthy man on their labour the housemaid who had brought in a towel and some eau de cologne repeated all the same it's queer they are not bad-hearted but Bon, seated and very pale had not recovered from the shock to her feelings and she was only able to find a smile when negrel was complimented cecile's parents especially thanked the young man and the marriage might now be regarded as settled m Bon looked on in silence turning from his wife to this lover whom in the morning he had been swearing to kill then to this young girl by whom he would no doubt soon be freed from him 
there was no haste only the fear remained with him of seeing his wife fall lower perhaps to some lackey and you my little darlings asked deneulin of his daughters have they broken any of your bones lucie and jeanne had been much afraid but they were pleased to have seen it all they were now laughing by george the father went on we've had a fine day if you want a dowry you would do well to earn it yourselves and you may also expect to have to support me he was joking but his voice trembled his eyes swelled with tears as his two daughters threw themselves into his arms m hennebeau had heard this confession of ruin a quick thought lit up his face vandame would now belong to montsou this was the hoped-for compensation the stroke of fortune which would bring him back to favour with the gentleman on the directorate at every crisis of his existence he took refuge in the strict execution of the orders he had received in the military discipline in which he lived he found his small share of happiness but they grew calm the drawing-room fell back into a weary peacefulness with the quiet light of its two lamps and the warm stuffiness of the hangings what then was going on outside the brawlers were silent and stones no longer struck the house one only heard deep full blows those blows of the hatchet which one hears in distant woods they wished to find out and went back into the hall to venture a glance through the glass panel of the door even the ladies went upstairs to post themselves behind the blinds on the first floor do you see that scoundrel rasseneur over there on the threshold of the public-house said m hennebeau to deneulin i had guessed as much he must be in it it was not rasseneur however it was etienne who was dealing blows from his axe at maigrat's shop and he went on calling to the men did not the goods in there belong to the colliers had they not the right to take back their property from this thief who had exploited them so long who was starving them at a hint from the company gradually they all left the manager's house and ran up to pillage the neighbouring shop the cry bread 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 broke out anew they would find bread behind that door the rage of hunger carried them away as if they suddenly felt that they could wait no longer without expiring on the road such furious thrusts were made at the door that at every stroke of the axe at the end feared to wound someone meanwhile maigrat who had left the hall of the manager's house had at first taken refuge in the kitchen but hearing nothing there he imagined some abominable attempt against his shop and came up again to hide behind the pump outside when he distinctly heard the crackling of the door and shouts of pillage in which his own name was mixed it was not a nightmare then if he could not see he could now hear and he followed the attack with ringing ears every blow struck him in the heart a hinge must have given way five minutes more and the shop would be taken the thing was stamped on his brain in real and terrible images the brigands rushing forward then the drawers broken open the sacks emptied everything eaten everything drunk the house itself carried away nothing left not even a stick with which he might go and beg through the villages no he would never allow them to complete his ruin he would rather leave his life there since he had been here he noticed at a window of his house his wife's thin silhouette pale and confused behind the panes no doubt she was watching the blows with her usual silent air of a poor beaten creature beneath there was a shed so placed that from the villa garden one could climb it from the palings then it was easy to get on to the tiles up to the window and the idea of thus returning home now pursued him in his remorse of having left perhaps he would have time to barricade the shop with furniture he even invented other and more heroic defences boiling oil lighted petroleum poured out from above but this love of his property struggled against his fear and he groaned in the battle with cowardice suddenly on hearing a deeper blow of the axe he made up his mind avarice conquered he and his wife would cover the sacks with their bodies rather than abandon a single loaf almost immediately hooting broke out look look the tomcat's up there 
after the cat after the cat the mob had just seen maigrat on the roof of the shed in his fever of anxiety he had climbed the palings with agility in spite of his weight and without troubling over the breaking wood and now he was flattening himself along the tiles and endeavouring to reach the window but the slope was very steep he was incommoded by his stuffness and his nails were torn he would have dragged himself up however if he had not begun to tremble with the fear of stones for the crowd which he could not see continued to cry beneath him after the cat after the cat do for him and suddenly both his hands let go at once and he rolled down like a ball leapt at the gutter and fell across the metal wall in such a way that by ill chance he rebounded on the side of the road where his skull was broken open on the corner of a stone pillar his brain had spurted out he was dead his wife up above pale and confused behind the window panes still looked out they were stupefied at first at the end stopped short and the axe slipped from his hands maheu levaque and the others forgot the shop with their eyes fixed on the wall along which a thin red streak was slowly flowing down and the cries ceased and silence spread over the growing darkness all at once the hooting began again it was the women who rushed forward overcome by the drunkenness of blood then there is a good god after all ah the bloody beast he's done for they surrounded the still warm body they insulted it with laughter abusing his fractured head the dirty chops hurling in the dead man's face the long venom of their starved lives i owed you sixty francs now you're paid thief said maheude enraged like the others you won't refuse me credit any more wait wait i must fatten you once more with her finger she scratched up some dirt took two handfuls and stuffed it violently into his mouth there eat that there eat eat you used to eat us the abuse increased while the dead man stretched on his back gazed motionless with his large fixed eyes at the immense sky from which the night was falling this earth heaped in his mouth was the bread he had refused to give and henceforth he would eat of no other bread it had not brought him luck to starve poor people but the women had another revenge to wreak on him they moved round smelling him like she-wolves they were all seeking for some outrage some savagery that would relieve them mother belay's shrill voice was heard cut him like a tomcat yes yes after the cat after the cat he's done too much the dirty beast moquette was already unfastening and drawing off the trousers while the levaque woman raised the legs and mother brulee with her dry old hands separated the naked thighs and seized this dead virility she took hold of everything tearing with an effort which bent her lean spine and made her long arms crack the soft skin resisted she had to try again and at last carried away the fragment a lump of hairy and bleeding flesh which she brandished with a laugh of triumph i've got it i've got it shrill voices saluted with curses the abominable trophy ah swine you won't fill our daughters any more yes we've done with paying on your beastly body we shan't any more have to offer a backside in return for a loaf here i owe you six francs would you like to settle it i'm quite willing if you can do it still this joke shook them all with terrible gaiety they showed each other the bleeding fragment as an evil beast from which each of them had suffered and which they had at last crushed and saw before them there inert in their power they spat on it they thrust out their jaws saying over and over again with furious bursts of contempt he can do no more he can do no more it's no longer a man that they'll put away in the earth go and rot then good for nothing mother brulee then planted the whole lump on the end of her stick and holding it in the air bore it out like a banner rushing along the road followed helter-skelter by the yelling troop of women drops of blood rained down and that pitiful flesh hung like a waste piece of meat on a butcher's stall up above at the window madame maigret still stood motionless but beneath the last gleams of the setting sun the confused flaws of the window-panes distorted her white face which looked as though it were laughing 
beaten and deceived at every hour with shoulders bent from morning to night over a ledger perhaps she was laughing while the band of women rushed along with that evil beast that crushed beast at the end of the stick this frightful mutilation was accomplished in frozen horror neither etienne nor maheu nor the others had had time to interfere they stood motionless before this gallop of furies at the door of the estaminet tisson a few heads were grouped rasseneur pale with disgust zacharie and philomene stupefied at what they had seen the two old men bonmort and mouk were gravely shaking their heads only jeanlin was making fun pushing bebert with his elbow and forcing lydie to look up but the women were already coming back turning round and passing beneath the manager's windows behind the blinds the ladies were stretching out their necks they had not been able to observe the scene which was hidden from them by the wall and they could not distinguish well in the growing darkness what is it they have at the end of that stick asked cecile who had grown bold enough to look out lucie and jeanne declared that it must be a rabbit skin no no murmured madame Ambeau. they must have been pillaging a pork butcher's it seems to be a remnant of a pig at this moment she shuddered and was silent madame grégoire had nudged her with her knee they both remained stupefied the young ladies who were very pale asked no more questions but with large eyes followed this red vision through the darkness etienne once more brandished the axe but the feeling of anxiety did not disappear this corpse now barred the road and protected the shop many had drawn back satiety seemed to have appeased them all maheu was standing by gloomily when he heard a voice whisper in his ear to escape he turned round and recognized catherine still in her old overcoat black and panting with a movement he repelled her he would not listen to her he threatened to strike her with a gesture of despair she hesitated and then ran towards etienne save yourself save yourself the gendarmes are coming he also pushed her away and abused her feeling the blood of the blows she had given him mounting to his cheeks but she would not be repelled she forced him to throw down the axe and drew him away by both arms with irresistible strength don't i tell you the gendarmes are coming listen to me it's cheval who has gone for them and is bringing them if you want to know it's too much for me and i've come save yourself i don't want them to take you and catherine drew him away while at the same instant a heavy gallop shook the street from afar immediately a voice arose the gendarmes the gendarmes there was a general breaking up so mad a rush for life that in two minutes the road was free absolutely clear as though swept by a hurricane maigrat's corpse alone made a patch of shadow on the white earth before the estaminet tisson rasseneur only remained feeling relieved and with open face applauding the easy victory of the sabres while in dim and deserted Monceau, in the silence of the closed houses the bourgeois remained with perspiring skins and chattering teeth not daring to look out the plain was drowned beneath the thick night only the blast furnaces and the coke furnaces were burning against the tragic sky the gallop of the gendarmes heavily approached they came up in an indistinguishable sombre mass and behind them the marchion's pastry cook's vehicle a little covered cart which had been confided to their care at last arrived and a small drudge of a boy jumped down and quietly unpacked the crust for the vol au vent end of section twenty nine section thirty of germinal by emile zola translation by havelock ellis this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part 6. Chapter 1. The first fortnight of February passed, and a black cold prolonged the hard winter without pity for the poor. Once more the authorities had scoured the roads. The prefect of Lille, an attorney general, and the police were not sufficient. The military had come to occupy Monceau a whole regiment of men were camped between bonnet and marchiennes 
armed pickets guarded the pits and there were soldiers before every engine the manager's villa the company's yards even the houses of certain residents were bristling with bayonets nothing was heard along the streets but the slow movement of patrols on the pit bank of the Voreau, a sentinel was always placed in the frozen wind that blew up there like a lookout man above the flat plain and every two hours as though in an enemy's country were heard the sentry's cries give it advance and give the password nowhere had work been resumed on the contrary the strike had spread crecourt miro madeleine like the Vero, were producing nothing at fultricantel and the victoire there were fewer men every morning even at st thomas which had been hitherto exempt men were wanting there was now a silent persistence in the face of this exhibition of force which exasperated the miners pride the settlements looked deserted in the midst of the beetroot fields not a workman stirred only at rare intervals was one to be met by chance isolated with sidelong look lowering his head before the red trousers and in this deep melancholy calm in this passive opposition to the guns there was a deceptive gentleness a forced and patient obedience of wild beasts in a cage with their eyes on the tamer ready to spring on his neck if he turned his back the company who were being ruined by this death of work talked of hiring miners from the borinage on the belgian frontier but did not dare so that the battle continued as before between the colliers who were shut up at home and the dead pits guarded by soldiery on the morrow of the terrible day this calm had come about at once hiding such a panic that the greatest silence possible was kept concerning the damage and the atrocities the inquiry which had been opened showed that Magrath had died from his fall and the frightful mutilation of the corpse remained uncertain already surrounded by a legend on its side the company did not acknowledge the disasters it had suffered any more than the gregoires cared to compromise their daughter in the scandal of a trial in which she would have to give evidence however some arrests took place mere supernumeraries as usual silly and frightened knowing nothing by mistake Piron was taken off with handcuffs on his wrists as far as marchand's to the great amusement of his mates rosnor also was nearly arrested by two gendarmes the management was content with preparing lists of names and giving back certificates in large numbers Mehu had received his levaque also as well as thirty-four of their mates in the settlement of the deux cents alone and all the severity was directed against etienne who had disappeared on the evening of the fray and who was being sought although no trace of him could be found chaval in his hatred had denounced him refusing to name the others at catherine's appeal for she wished to save her parents the days passed every one felt that nothing was yet concluded and with oppressed hearts every one was awaiting the end at Monson, during this period the inhabitants awoke with a start every night their ears buzzing with an imaginary alarm bell and their nostrils haunted by the smell of powder but what completed their discomfiture was a sermon by the new cure abbe ranvier that lean priest with eyes like red-hot coals who had succeeded abbe joie he was indeed unlike the smiling discreet man so fat and gentle his only anxiety was to live at peace with everybody abbe ranvier went so far as to defend these abominable brigands who had dishonoured the district he found excuses for the atrocities of the strikers he violently attacked the middle class throwing on them the whole of the responsibility it was the middle class which by dispossessing the church of its ancient liberties in order to misuse them itself had turned this world into a cursed place of injustice and suffering it was the middle class which prolonged misunderstandings which was pushing on towards a terrible catastrophe by its atheism by its refusal to return to the old beliefs to the fraternity of the early christians and he dared to threaten the rich he warned them that if they obstinately persisted in refusing to listen to the voice of god god would surely put himself on the side of the poor 
he would take back their fortunes from those who faithlessly enjoyed them and would distribute them to the humble of the earth for the triumph of his glory the devout trembled at this the lawyer declared that it was socialism of the worst kind all saw the cure at the head of a band brandishing a cross and with vigorous blows demolishing the bourgeois society of eighty nine m hennebeau when informed contented himself with saying as he shrugged his shoulders if he troubles us too much the bishop will free us from him and while the breath of panic was thus blowing from one end of the plain to the other etienne was dwelling beneath the earth in jeanlin's burrow at the bottom of Requillard. it was there that he was in hiding no one believed him so near the quiet audacity of that refuge in the very mine in that abandoned passage of the old pit had baffled search above the sloes and hawthorns growing among the fallen scaffolding of the belfry filled up the mouth of the hole no one ventured down it was necessary to know the trick how to hang on to the roots of the mountain ash and to let go fearlessly to catch hold of the runs that were still solid other obstacles also protected him the suffocating heat of the passage a hundred and twenty metres of dangerous descent then the painful gliding on all fours for a quarter of a league between the narrowed walls of the gallery before discovering the brigand's cave full of plunder he lived there in the midst of abundance finding gin there the rest of the dried cod and provisions of all sorts the large hay bed was excellent and not a current of air could be felt in this equal temperature as warm as a bath light however threatened to fail jeanlin who had made himself purveyor with the prudence and discretion of a savage and delighted to make fun of the police had even brought him pomatum but could not succeed in putting his hands on a packet of candles after the fifth day etienne never lighted up except to eat he could not swallow in the dark this complete and interminable night always of the same blackness was his chief torment it was in vain that he was able to sleep in safety that he was warm and provided with bread the night had never weighed so heavily on his brain it seemed to him even to crush his thoughts now he was living on thefts in spite of his communistic theories old scruples of education arose and he contented himself with gnawing his share of dry bread but what was to be done one must live and his task was not yet accomplished another shame overcame him remorse for that savage drunkenness from the gin drunk in the great cold on an empty stomach which had thrown him armed with a knife on cheval this stirred in him the whole of that unknown terror the hereditary ill the long ancestry of drunkenness no longer tolerating a drop of alcohol without falling into homicidal mania would he then end as a murderer when he found himself in shelter in this profound calm of the earth seized by satiety of violence he had slept for two days the sleep of a brute gorged and overcome and the depression continued he lived in a bruised state with bitter mouth and aching head as after some tremendous spree a week passed by the Mahirs, who had been warned were not able to send a candle he had to give up the enjoyment of light even when eating now etienne remained for hours stretched out on his hay vague ideas were working within him for the first time a feeling of superiority which placed him apart from his mates an exultation of his person as he grew more instructed never had he reflected so much he asked himself the why of his disgust on the morrow of that furious course among the pits and he did not dare to reply to himself his recollections were repulsive to him the ignoble desires the coarse instincts the odour of all that wretchedness shaken out to the wind in spite of the torment of the darkness he would come to hate the hour for returning to the settlement how nauseous were all these wretches in a heap living at the common bucket there was not one of them with whom he could seriously talk politics it was a bestial existence always the same air tainted by onion in which one choked he wished to enlarge their horizon to raise them to the comfort and good manners of the middle class 
by making them masters but how long it would take and he no longer felt the courage to await victory in this prison of hunger by slow degrees his vanity of leadership his constant preoccupation of thinking in their place left him free breathing into him the soul of one of those bourgeois whom he execrated jeanlin one evening brought a candle end stolen from a carter's lantern and this was a great relief for etienne when the darkness began to stupefy him weighing on his skull almost to madness he would light up for a moment then as soon as he had chased away the nightmare he extinguished the candle miserly of this brightness which was as necessary to his life as bread the silence buzzed in his ears he only heard the flight of a band of rats the cracking of the old timber the tiny sound of a spider weaving her web and with eyes open in this warm nothingness he returned to his fixed idea the thought of what his mates were doing above desertion on his part would have seemed to him the worst cowardice if he thus hid himself it was to remain free to give counsel or to act his long meditations had fixed his ambition while awaiting something better he would like to be pluchart leaving manual work in order to work only at politics but alone in a clean room under the pretext that brain labor absorbs the entire life and needs quiet at the beginning of the second week the child having told him that the police supposed he had gone over to belgium etienne ventured out of his hole at nightfall he wished to ascertain the situation and to decide if it was still well to persist he himself considered the game doubtful before the strike he felt uncertain of the result and had simply yielded to facts and now after having been intoxicated with rebellion he came back to this first doubt despairing of making the company yield but he would not yet confess this to himself he was tortured when he thought of the miseries of defeat and the heavy responsibility of suffering which would weigh upon him the end of the strike was it not the end of his part the overthrow of his ambition his life falling back into the brutishness of the mine and the horrors of the settlement and honestly without any base calculation or falsehood he endeavored to find his faith again to prove to himself that resistance was still possible that capital was about to destroy itself in face of the heroic suicide of labor throughout the entire country in fact there was nothing but a long echo of ruin at night when he wandered through the black country like a wolf who has come out of his forest he seemed to hear the crash of bankruptcies from one end of the plain to the other he now passed by the roadside nothing but closed dead workshops becoming rotten beneath the dull sky the sugar works had especially suffered the holton sugar works the fauvel works after having reduced the number of their hands had come to grief one after the other at the dutle flower works the last mill had stopped on the second saturday of the month and the blues rope works for mine cables had been quite ruined by the strike on the martian side the situation was growing worse every day all the fires were out at the gagebois glassworks men were continually being sent away from the sonville workshops only one of the three blast furnaces of the forges was alight and not one battery of coke ovens was burning on the horizon the strike of the Montsou colliers born of the industrial crisis which had been growing worse for two years had increased it and precipitated the downfall to the other causes of suffering the stoppage of orders from america and the engorgement of invested capital in excessive production was now added the unforeseen lack of coal for the few furnaces which were still kept up and that was the supreme agony this engine bread which the pits no longer furnished frightened by the general anxiety the company by diminishing its output and starving its miners inevitably found itself at the end of december without a fragment of coal at the surface of its pits everything held together the plague blew from afar one fall led to another the industries tumbled each other over as they fell in so rapid a series of catastrophes that the shocks echoed in the midst of the neighboring cities lille douai valenciennes where absconding bankers were bringing ruin on whole families 
at the turn of a road etienne often stopped in the frozen night to hear the rubbish raining down he breathed deeply in the darkness the joy of annihilation seized him the hope that day would dawn on the extermination of the old world with not a single fortune left standing the scythe of equality levelling everything to the ground but in this massacre it was the company's pits that especially interested him he would continue his walk blinded by the darkness visiting them one after the other glad to discover some new disaster landslips of increasing gravity continued to occur on account of the prolonged abandonment of the passages above the north gallery of miro the ground sank in to such an extent that the Wazelle road for the distance of a hundred metres had been swallowed up as though by the shock of an earthquake and the company disturbed at the rumours raised by these accidents paid the owners for their vanished fields without bargaining crecourt and madeleine which lay in very shifting rock were becoming stopped up more and more it was said that two captains had been buried at the victoire there was an inundation at boutre cantel it had been necessary to wall up a gallery for the length of a kilometre at st thomas where the ill-kept timbering was breaking down everywhere thus every hour enormous sums were spent making great breaches in the shareholders dividends a rapid destruction of the pits was going on which must end at last by eating up the famous Monceau deniers which had been centupled in a century in the face of these repeated blows hope was again born in etienne he came to believe that a third month of resistance would crush the monster the wary sated beast crouching down there like an idol in his unknown tabernacle he knew that after the Monceau troubles there had been great excitement in the paris journals quite a violent controversy between the official newspapers and the opposition newspapers terrible narratives which were especially directed against the international of which the empire was becoming afraid after having first encouraged it and the directors not daring to turn a deaf ear any longer two of them had condescended to come and hold an inquiry but with an air of regret not appearing to care about the upshot so disinterested that in three days they went away again declaring that everything was going on as well as possible he was told however from other quarters that during their stay these gentlemen sat permanently displaying feverish activity and absorbed in transactions of which no one about them uttered a word and he charged them with affecting confidence they did not feel and came to look upon their departure as a nervous flight feeling now certain of triumph since these terrible men were letting everything go but on the following night etienne despaired again the company's back was too robust to be so easily broken they might lose millions but later on they would get them back again by gnawing at their men's bread on that night having pushed as far as jean bart he guessed the truth when an overseer told him that there was talk of yielding vandame to monceau at delin's house it was said the wretchedness was pitiful the wretchedness of the rich the father ill in his powerlessness aged by his anxiety over money the daughters struggling in the midst of tradesmen trying to save their shifts there was less suffering in the famished settlements than in this middle-class house where they shut themselves up to drink water work had not been resumed at jean bart and it had been necessary to replace the pump at gaston marie while in spite of all haste an inundation had already begun which made great expenses necessary Denelin had at last risked his request for a loan of one hundred thousand francs from the gregoires and the refusal though he had expected it completed his dejection if they refused it was for his sake in order to save him from an impossible struggle and they advised him to sell he as usual violently refused it enraged him to have to pay the expenses of the strike he hoped at first to die of it with the blood at his head strangled by apoplexy then what was to be done he had listened to the director's offers they wrangled with him they depreciated this superb prey this repaired pit equipped anew where the lack of capital alone paralyzed the output he would be lucky if he got enough out of it 
to satisfy his creditors for two days he had struggled against the directors at montsou furious at the quiet way with which they took advantage of his embarrassment and shouting his refusals at them in his loud voice and there the affair remained and they had returned to paris to await patiently his last groans etienne smelled out this compensation for the disasters and was again seized by discouragement before the invincible power of the great capitalists so strong in battle that they fattened in defeat by eating the corpses of the small capitalists who fell at their side the next day fortunately jeanlin brought him a piece of good news at the Verreaux, the tubbing of the shaft was threatening to break and the water was filtering in from all the joints in great haste a gang of carpenters had been set on to repair it up to now etienne had avoided the Verreaux worn by the everlasting black silhouette of the sentinel stationed on the pit-bank above the plain he could not be avoided he dominated in the air like the flag of the regiment towards three o'clock in the morning the sky became overcast and he went to the pit where some mates explained to him the bad condition of the tubbing they even thought it would have to be done entirely over again which would stop the output of coal for three months for a long time he prowled round listening to the carpenter's mallets hammering in the shaft that wound which had to be dressed rejoiced his heart as he went back in the early daylight he saw the sentinel still on the pit bank this time he would certainly be seen as he walked he thought about those soldiers who were taken from the people to be armed against the people how easy the triumph of the revolution would be if the army were suddenly to declare for it it would be enough if the workmen and the peasant in the barracks were to remember their origin that was the supreme peril the great terror which made the teeth of the middle class chatter when they thought of a possible defection of the troops in two hours they would be swept away and exterminated with all the delights and abominations of their iniquitous life it was already said that whole regiments were tainted with socialism was it true when justice came would it be thanks to the cartridges distributed by the middle class and snatching at another hope the young man dreamed that the regiment with its posts now guarding the pits would come over to the side of the strikers shoot down the company to a man and at last give the mine to the miners he then noticed that he was ascending the pit bank his head filled with these reflections why should he not talk with this soldier he would get to know what his ideas were with an air of indifference he continued to come nearer as though he were gleaning old wood among the rubbish the sentinel remained motionless eh mate damned weather said etienne at last i think we shall have snow he was a small soldier very fair with a pale gentle face covered with red freckles he wore his military greatcoat with the awkwardness of a recruit yes perhaps we shall i think he murmured and with his blue eyes he gazed at the livid sky a smoky dawn with soot weighing like lead afar over the plain what idiots they are to put you here to freeze etienne went on one would think the cossacks were coming and then there's always wind here the little soldier shivered without complaining there was certainly a little cabin of dry stones there where old bonmort used to take shelter when it blew a hurricane but the order being not to leave the summit of the pit bank the soldier did not stir from it his hands so stiffened by cold that he could no longer feel his weapon he belonged to the guard of sixty men who were protecting the barreau and as this cruel sentry duty frequently came round he had before nearly stayed there for good with his dead feet his work demanded it a passive obedience finished the benumbing process and he replied to these questions with the stammered words of a sleepy child etienne in vain endeavoured during a quarter of an hour to make him talk about politics he replied yes or no without seeming to understand some of his comrades said that the captain was a republican as to him he had no idea it was all the same to him if he was ordered to fire he would fire so as not to be punished the workmen listened seized with the popular hatred against the army against these brothers whose hearts 
were changed by sticking a pair of red pantaloons onto their buttocks then what's your name jules and where do you come from from plogot over there he stretched out his arm at random it was in brittany he knew no more his small pale face grew animated he began to laugh and felt warmer i have a mother and a sister they are waiting for me sure enough ah it won't be for to-morrow when i left they came with me as far as pont Mayabe. we had to take the horse to le point it nearly broke its legs at the bottom of the Audien hill cousin charles was waiting for us with sausages but the women were crying too much and it stuck in our throats good lord what a long way off our home is his eyes grew moist though he was still laughing the desert moorland of plogot that wild storm-beaten point of the Raz, appeared to him beneath a dazzling sun in the rosy season of heather do you think he asked if i'm not punished that they'll give me a month's leave in two years then etienne talked about provence which he had left when he was quite small the daylight was growing and flakes of snow began to fly earthy sky and at last he felt anxious on noticing jean Lin, who was prowling about in the midst of the bushes stupefied to see him up there the child was beckoning to him what was the good of this dream of fraternizing with the soldiers it would take years and years in his useless attempt cast him down as though he had expected to succeed but suddenly he understood jeanlin's gesture the sentinel was about to be relieved and he went away running off to bury himself at Requillard, his heart crushed once more by the certainty of defeat while the little scamp who ran beside him was accusing that dirty beast of a trooper of having called out the guard to fire at them on the summit of the pit-bank jules stood motionless with eyes vacantly gazing at the falling snow the sergeant was approaching with his men and the regulation cries were exchanged give in advance and give the password and they heard the heavy steps begin again ringing as though on a conquered country in spite of the growing daylight nothing stirred in the settlements the colliers remained in silent rage beneath the military boot End of section thirty Section thirty one of Germanon by Emile Zola Translation by Havelock Ellis This Librivox recording is in the public domain reading by Matt Perard. Part six Chapter two Snow had been falling for two days since the morning it had ceased and an intense frost had frozen the immense sheet this black country with its inky roads and walls and trees powdered with coal dust was now white a single whiteness stretching out without end the dusson quaron settlement lay beneath the snow as though it had disappeared no smoke came out of the chimneys the houses without fire and as cold as the stones in the street did not melt the thick layer on the tiles it was nothing more than a quarry of white slabs in the white plain a vision of a dead village wound in its shroud along the roads the passing patrols alone made a muddy mess with their stamping among the mahirs the last shovelful of cinders had been burnt the evening before and it was no use any longer to think of gleaning on the pit bank in this terrible weather when the sparrows themselves could not find a blade of grass alzire from the obstinacy with which her poor hands had dug in the snow was dying Mehud had to wrap her up in the fragment of a coverlet while waiting for dr vanderhagen for whom she had twice gone up without being able to find him the servant had however promised that he would come to the settlement before night and the mother was standing at the window watching while the little invalid who had wished to be downstairs was shivering on a chair having the illusion that it was better there near the cold grate old bonmort opposite his legs bad once more seemed to be sleeping neither lenore or henri had come back from scouring the roads in company with john lynn to ask for sue maheu alone was walking heavily up and down the bare room stumbling against the wall at every turn with the stupid air of an animal which can no longer see its cage the petroleum 
also was finished but the reflection of the snow from outside was so bright that it vaguely lit up the room in spite of the deepening night there was a noise of sabots and the levaque woman pushed open the door like a gale of wind beside herself shouting furiously from the threshold at Mehud. then it's you who have said that i forced my lodger to give me twenty sous when he sleeps with me the other shrugged her shoulders don't bother me i said nothing and who told you so they tell me you said so it doesn't concern you who it was you even said you could hear us at our dirty tricks behind the wall and that the filth gets into our house because i'm always on my back just tell me you didn't say so eh every day quarrels broke out as a result of the constant gossiping of the women especially between those households which lived door to door squabbles and reconciliations took place every day but never before had such bitterness thrown them one against the other since the strike hunger exasperated their rancor so that they felt the need of blows an altercation between two gossiping women finished by a murderous onset between their two men just then levaque arrived in his turn dragging bouteloup here's our mate let him just say if he has given twenty sous to my wife to sleep with her the lodger hiding his timid gentleness in his great beard protested and stammered oh that no never anything never at once levaque became threatening and thrust his fist beneath maheu's nose you know that won't do for me if a man's got a wife like that he ought to knock her ribs in if not then you believe what she says by god exclaimed maheu furious at being dragged out of his dejection what is all this clatter again haven't we got enough to do with our misery just leave me alone damn you or i'll let you know it and first who says that my wife said so who says so pierron said so maheu broke into a sharp laugh and turning towards the levaque woman ah pierron is it well i can tell you what she told me yes she told me that you sleep with both your men the one underneath and the other on top after that it was no longer possible to come to an understanding they all grew angry and the levaques as a reply to the maheus asserted that perron had said a good many other things on their account that they had sold catherine that they were all rotten together even to the little ones with a dirty disease caught by etienne at the volcan she said that she said that yelled maheu good i'll go to her i will and if she says that she said that she shall feel my hand on her chops he was carried out of himself and the levaques followed him to see what would happen while bouteloup having a horror of disputes furtively returned home excited by the altercation maheude was also going out when a complaint from Elzir held her back she crossed the ends of the coverlet over the little one's quivering body and placed herself before the window looking out vaguely and that doctor who still delayed at the perron's door maheu and the levaques met lydy who was stamping in the snow the house was closed and a thread of light came through a crack in a shutter the child replied at first to their questions with constraint no her father was not there he had gone to the wash-house to join mother brule and bring back the bundle of linen then she was confused and would not say what her mother was doing at last she let out everything with a sly spiteful laugh her mother had pushed her out of the door because monsieur dansart was there and she prevented them from talking since the morning he had been going about the settlement with two policemen trying to pick up workmen imposing on the weak and announcing everywhere that if the descent did not take place on monday at the voreau the company had decided to hire men from the baronage and as the night came on he sent away the policeman finding perron alone then he had remained with her to drink a glass of gin before a good fire hush hold your tongue we must see them said levaque with a lewd laugh we'll explain everything directly get off with you youngster lydy drew back a few steps while he put his eye to a crack in the shutter he stifled a low cry and his back bent with a quiver in her turn his wife looked through but she said as though taken by the colic that it was disgusting maheu who had pushed her wishing also to see 
then declared that he had had enough for his money and they began again in a row each taking his glance as at a peep show the parlor glittering with cleanliness was enlivened by a large fire there were cakes on the table with a bottle and glasses in fact quite a feast what they saw going on in there at last exasperated the two men who under other circumstances would have laughed over it for six months that she should let herself be stuffed up to the neck with her skirts in the air was funny but good god was it not disgusting to do that in front of a great fire and to get up one's strength with biscuits when the mates had neither a slice of bread nor a fragment of coal here's father cried the lady running away Piron was quietly coming back from the wash-house with a bundle of linen on his shoulder maheu immediately addressed him here they tell me that your wife says that i sold catherine and that we are all rotten at home and what do they pay you in your house your wife and the gentleman who is this minute wearing out her skin the astonished Piron could not understand and Piron seized with fear on hearing the tumult of voices lost her head and set the door ajar to see what was the matter they could see her looking very red with her dress open and her skirt tucked up at her waist while dansart in the background was wildly buttoning himself up the head captain rushed away and disappeared trembling with fear that the story would reach the manager's ears then there would be an awful scandal laughter and hooting and abuse you who are always saying that other people are dirty shouted the levaque woman to Piron. it's not surprising that you're clean when you get the bosses to scour you ah it's fine for her to talk said levaque again here's a trollop who says that my wife sleeps with me and the lodger one below and the other above yes yes that's what they tell me you say but Piron, grown calm held her own against this abuse very contemptuous in the assurance that she was the best-looking and the richest i've said what i've said just leave me alone will you what have my affairs got to do with you a pack of jealous creatures who want to get over us because we are able to save up money get along get along you can say what you like my husband knows well enough why monsieur Dancet was here Piron, in fact was furiously defending his wife the quarrel turned they accused him of having sold himself of being a spy the company's dog they charged him with shutting himself up to gorge himself with the good things with which the bosses paid him for his treachery in defence he pretended that maheu had slipped beneath his door a threatening paper with two crossbones and a dagger above and this necessarily ended in a struggle between the men as the quarrels of the women always did now that famine was enraging the mildest maheu and levaque rushed on Piron with their fists and had to be pulled off blood was flowing from her son-in-law's nose when mother brulé in her turn arrived from the wash-house when informed of what had been going on she merely said the damned beast dishonours me the road was becoming deserted not a shadow spotted the naked whiteness of the snow and the settlement falling back into its death-like immobility went on starving beneath the intense cold and the doctor asked maheu as he shut the door not come replied maheu still standing before the window are oh, the little ones back no not back maheu again began his heavy walk from one wall to the other looking like a stricken ox father bonmort sitting stiffly on his chair had not even lifted his head Azir also had said nothing and was trying not to shiver so as to avoid giving them pain but in spite of her courage and suffering she sometimes trembled so much that one could hear against the coverlet the quivering of the little invalid girl's lean body while with her large open eyes she stared at the ceiling from which the pale reflection of the white gardens lit up the room like moonshine the emptied house was now in its last agony having reached a final stage of nakedness the mattress ticks had followed the wool to the dealers then the sheets had gone the linen everything that could be sold one evening they had sold a handkerchief of the grandfather's for two sous tears fell over each object of the poor household which had to go and the mother was still lamenting that one day she had carried away in her skirt 
the pink cardboard box her man's old present as one would carry away a child to get rid of it on some doorstep they were bare they had only their skins left to sell so worn out and injured that no one would have given a farthing for them they no longer even took the trouble to search they knew that there was nothing left that they had come to the end of everything that they must not hope even for a candle or a fragment of coal or a potato and they were waiting to die only grieved about the children and revolted by the useless cruelty that gave the little one a disease before starving it at last here he is said maheu a black figure passed before the window the door opened but it was not dr vanderhagen they recognized the new curé abbe ranvier who did not seem surprised at coming on this dead house without light without fire without bread he had already been to three neighboring houses going from family to family seeking willing listeners like dansart with his two policemen and at once he exclaimed in his feverish fanatic's voice why were you not at mass on sunday my children you are wrong the church alone can save you now promise me to come next sunday Maheu, after staring at him, went on pacing heavily, without a word. It was Maheu who replied. To mass, sir? What for? Isn't the good God making fun of us? Look here, what has my little girl there done to him, to be shaking with fever? Hadn't we enough misery that he had to make her ill, too, just when I can't even give her a cup of warm gruel? Then the priest stood and talked at length he spoke of the strike this terrible wretchedness this exasperated rancor of famine with the ardor of a missionary who was preaching to savages for the glory of religion he said that the church was with the poor that she would one day cause justice to triumph by calling down the anger of god on the iniquities of the rich and that day would come soon for the rich had taken the place of god and were governing without god in their impious theft of power but if the workers desired their fair division of the goods of the earth they ought at once to put themselves in the hands of the priests just as on the death of jesus the poor and the humble grouped themselves around the apostles what strength the pope would have what an army the clergy would have under them when they were able to command the numberless crowd of workers in one week they would purge the world of the wicked they would chase away the unworthy masters then indeed there would be a real kingdom of god every one recompensed according to his merits and the law of labor as the foundation for universal happiness Mehid, who was listening to him seemed to hear etienne in those autumn evenings when he announced to them the end of their evils only she had always distrusted the cloth that's very well what you say there sir she replied but that's because you no longer agree with the bourgeois all our other cures dined at the manager's and threatened us with the devil as soon as we asked for bread he began again and spoke of the deplorable misunderstanding between the church and the people now in veiled phrases he hit at the town cures at the bishops at the highly placed clergy sated with enjoyment gorged with domination making pacts with the liberal middle class in the imbecility of their blindness not seeing that it was this middle class which had dispossessed them of the empire of the world deliverance would come from the country priests who would all rise to re-establish the kingdom of christ with the help of the poor and already he seemed to be at their head he raised his bony form like the chief of a band a revolutionary of the gospel his eyes so filled with light that they illuminated the gloomy room this enthusiastic sermon lifted him to mystic heights and the poor people had long ceased to understand him no need for so many words growled maheu suddenly you'd best begin by bringing us a loaf come on sunday to mass cried the priest god will provide for everything and he went off to catechize the lavaques in their turn so carried away by his dream of the final triumph of the church and so contemptuous of facts that he would thus go through the settlements without charities with empty hands amid this army dying of hunger being a poor devil himself who looked upon suffering as the spur to salvation maheu continued his pacing and nothing was heard but his regular tramp which made the floor tremble 
there was the sound of a rust-eaten pulley old von mort was spitting into the cold grate then the rhythm of the feet began again azir weakened by fever was rambling in a low voice laughing thinking that it was warm and that she was playing in the sun good gracious muttered maheude after having touched her cheeks how she burns i don't expect that damn beast now the brigands must have stopped him from coming she meant the doctor and the company she uttered a joyous exclamation however when the door once more opened but her arms fell back and she remained standing still with gloomy face good evening whispered etienne when he had carefully closed the door he often came thus at night-time the mayhews learnt his retreat after the second day but they kept the secret and no one in the settlement knew exactly what had become of the young man a legend had grown up around him people still believed in him and mysterious rumours circulated he would reappear with an army and chests full of gold and there was always the religious expectation of a miracle the realised ideal a sudden entry into that city of justice which he had promised them some said that they had seen him lying back in a carriage with three other gentlemen on the marchiennes road others affirmed that he was in england for a few days at length however suspicions began to arise and jokers accused him of hiding in a cellar where moquette kept him warm for this relationship when known had done him harm there was a growing disaffection in the midst of his popularity a gradual increase of the despairing among the faithful and their number was certain little by little to grow what brutal weather he added and you nothing new always from bad to worse they tell me that little negrel has been to belgium to get barangs good god we are done for if that is true he shuddered as he entered this dark icy room where it was some time before his eyes were able to see the unfortunate people whose presence he guessed by the deepening of the shade he was experiencing the repugnance and discomfort of the workman who has risen above his class refined by study and stimulated by ambition what wretchedness and odours and the bodies in a heap and a terrible pity caught him by the throat the spectacle of this agony so overcame him that he tried to find words to advise submission but maheu came violently up to him shouting barains they won't dare the bloody fools let the barains go down then if they want us to destroy the pits with an air of constraint etienne explained that it was not possible to move that the soldiers who guarded the pits would protect the descent of the belgian workmen and maheu clenched his fists irritated especially as he said by having bayonets in his back then the colliers were no longer masters in their own place they were treated then like convicts forced to work by a loaded musket he loved his pit it was a great grief to him not to have been down for two months he was driven wild therefore at the idea of this insult these strangers whom they threatened to introduce then the recollection that his certificate had been given back to him struck him to the heart i don't know why i'm angry he muttered i don't belong to their shop any longer when they have hunted me away from here i may as well die on the road as to that said etienne if you like they'll take your certificate back to-morrow people don't send away good workmen he interrupted himself surprised to hear alzire who was laughing softly in the delirium of her fever so far he had only made out father bonnemort's stiff shadow and this gaiety of the sick child frightened him it was indeed too much if the little ones were going to die of it with trembling voice he made up his mind look here this can't go on we are done for we must give it up Mehud, who had been motionless and silent up to now suddenly broke out and treating him familiarly and swearing like a man she shouted in his face what's that you say it's you who say that by god he was about to give reasons but she would not let him speak don't repeat that by god or woman as i am i'll put my fist into your face then we have been dying for two months and i have sold my household and my little ones have fallen ill of it and there is to be nothing done and the injustice is to begin again ah do you know when i think of that my blood stands still no 
no i would burn everything i would kill everything rather than give up she pointed at maheu in the darkness with a vague threatening gesture listen to this if any man goes back to the pit he'll find me waiting for him on the road to spit in his face and cry coward etienne could not see her but he felt a heat like the breath of a barking animal he had drawn back astonished at this fury which was his work she was so changed that he could no longer recognize the woman who was once so sensible reproving his violent schemes saying that we ought not to wish any one dead and who was now refusing to listen to reason and talking of killing people it was not he now it was she who talked politics who dreamed of sweeping away the bourgeois at a stroke who demanded the republic and the guillotine to free the earth of these rich robbers who fattened on the labor of starvelings yes i could flay them with my fingers we've had enough of them our turn has come now you used to say so yourself when i think of the father the grandfather the grandfather's father what all of them who went before have suffered what we are suffering and that our sons and our sons sons will suffer it over again it makes me mad i could take a knife the other day we didn't do enough at monceau we ought to have pulled the bloody place to the ground down to the last brick and do you know i've only one regret that we didn't let the old man strangle the peeling girl hunger may strangle my little ones for all they care her words fell like the blows of an axe in the night the closed horizon would not open and the impossible ideal was turning to poison in the depths of the skull which had been crushed by grief you have misunderstood etienne was able to say at last beating a retreat we ought to come to an understanding with the company i know that the pits are suffering much so that it would probably consent to an arrangement no never she shouted just then lenore and henri came back with their hands empty a gentleman had certainly given them two sous but the girl kept kicking her little brother and the two sous fell into the snow and as jeanlin had joined in the search they had not been able to find them where is jeanlin he's gone away mother he said he had business etienne was listening with an aching heart once she had threatened to kill them if they ever held out their hands to beg now she sent them herself on to the roads and proposed that all of them the ten thousand colliers of monceau should take stick and wallet like beggars of old and scour the terrified country the anguish continued to increase in the black room the little urchins came back hungry they wanted to eat why could they not have something to eat and they crumbled flung themselves about and at last trod on the feet of their dying sister groaned the mother furiously boxed their ears in the darkness at random then as they cried still louder asking for bread she burst into tears and dropped on to the floor seizing them in one embrace with the little invalid then for a long time her tears fell in a nervous outbreak which left her limp and worn out stammering over and over again the same phrase calling for death oh god why do you not take us oh god in pity take us to have done with it the grandfather preserved his immobility like an old tree twisted by the rain and wind while the father continued walking between the fireplace and the cupboard without turning his head but the door opened and this time it was dr van der hagen the devil he said this light won't spoil your eyes look sharp i'm in a hurry as usual he scolded knocked up by work fortunately he had matches with him and the father had to strike six one by one and hold them while he examined the invalid unwound from her coverlet she shivered beneath this flickering light as lean as a bird dying in the snow so small that one only saw her hump but she smiled with the wandering smile of the dying and her eyes were very large while her poor hands contracted over her hollow breast and as the half-choked mother asked if it was right to take away from her the only child who helped in the household so intelligent and gentle the doctor grew vexed ah she is going dead of hunger your blessed child and not the only one either i've just seen another one over there 
you all send for me but i can't do anything it's meat that you want to cure you maheu with burnt fingers had dropped the match and the darkness closed over the little corpse which was still warm the doctor had gone away in a hurry etienne heard nothing more in the black room but maheu's sobs repeating her cry for death that melancholy and endless lamentation oh god it is my turn take me oh god take my man take the others out of pity to have done with it End of section thirty one